HRC, 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 HRC. Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, church. Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Kasafo, here with your brother Zakwa. He usually does the intro, but it's my turn today. I hope you all enjoy your day. Today we are going to have a nice discourse about the spirit of pride. It's going to be very edifying, informative, and hopefully helps get insight if it's something that you've been wondering about or trying to understand to help overcome it. You ready to ride, Zakwa? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Let's start off with seeing what happened in the beginning to the devil. Let's see how pride came into play. Can we read Ezekiel chapter 28? We're going to read verse 13, 14, then verse 12, and verse 15 and 17, please. All right. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the worksmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of Elohim. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Satan was an anointed cherub before he fell. Can you continue in chapter 28, verse 12, please? Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord Ahiah, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Satan was full of wisdom and had perfect beauty, as we heard in his description. Let's see what else he was perfect in. Can you continue in verse 15, please? Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created. He was righteous at first, full of wisdom, so he knew the law. Continue, please. Till iniquity was found in thee. Let's see what iniquity was found in him that took away from his perfect ways. Continue, please. Verse 17 of chapter 28. Okay. Ezekiel 28 and 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. He felt a pleasure in himself. Because of his appearance, his pleasure in himself corrupted his wisdom. He became self-righteous, and Elohim was no longer in all his thoughts by evidence of the glorying in himself and his appearance. This is a spirit of pride called vainglory coming into play. Can you read the definition of vainglory in G2755, please? Yes. Vainly glorying, that is self-conceited. The definition of self-conceited is the characteristic of false pride, having an exaggerated sense of self-importance. So this is vainly glorifying. And conceited means excessively proud of oneself, vain. The vain glorifying in himself lifted up his heart and made him haughty and proud in himself and in his sense of his own importance. The definition of haughty is arrogantly superior and disdainful so being into himself made him think he was superior and hateful to anyone not like him now proud being proud is having or showing a high or excessively high opinion of oneself or one's importance also a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction as a result of one's own achievements or qualities so with the devil his beauty was pleasing to him, which made him proud. 
And with that vain glorifying comes envy. Can you read Galatians chapter 5, verse 26, please? Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. As we will see, the devil did exactly what the scriptures show happens when vain glorying is in us. He ended up provoking others after he got envious through his pride. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 24, please? Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into the world. And thus we see vainglory in a false sense of self-importance and pride in oneself brings about envy. Can you read Simeon chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, please? For envy ruleth over the whole mind of a man. So through vainglory, the devil's mind was taken in envy. Continue, please. And suffereth him neither to eat nor to drink, nor to do any good thing. So the devil could do no good thing from that point on. Hence, he is who he is today. Continue, please. But it ever suggesteth to him to destroy him that he envieth. So, he know he envied Adam. Hence, his mind is ever set on destroying the children of men to this day. Continue, please. And so long as he that envieth flourisheth, he that envieth fadeth the way. We will see how this held true in regards to the devil in his feelings toward Adam, and it helps understand his feelings toward us when we're actually doing the right thing. Okay. We touched on envy in the last lesson for edification on that spirit for reference. So you can refer back to that lesson for some edification. We may get into it a bit later in this lesson for perspective on pride as it leads into that envy and is a symptom of pride. Now, envy is a very serious spirit to get involved with. Can you read Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4, please? Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? So what we discussed in the last lesson, those things are tough. <laughs> but envy, it's worse. Truly understand that this spirit of envy is rough. The devil himself was overcome by it. And it even overcomes angels, as we'll see. Yet understand it began with pride. Now we know envy causes anger and war in the mind from the anger lesson. So because the devil's pleasure in himself, he gave place to hatred of heart to be envious of the Most High, and envy caused anger to blind his mind with the net of deceit. And let's see what he did. Can you read Ezekiel 28 and 6, please? Therefore thus saith the Lord Ahiah, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of Elohim. Fain glory and envy, working in him, seeking to be as Elohim. He envied the Most High's glory as Allah Hayim above all, knowing all, being praised by all, and controlling all. So the devil was enticed through his own desire to be as such as we are all tempted by our own lust and enticed. Hence, he set his heart as the heart of Allah Hayim in his own peculiar vision of Allah Hayim through his feelings. Now, mind you, he is blinded by spiritual fornication and pride, hatred, envy, and anger. So he isn't seeing the heart of Allah Hayyam aright to truly set his heart as Allah Hayyam because all he can see is the things he envies about Allah Hayyam, like the praise he receives, the wisdom he has, and the power of controlling all things by just his thoughts and his commands. Yet, if anyone truly wanted to set their heart as Allah Hayyam, all we need to do is believe and obey his son to be as he is because he, speaking of the son, actually knows the father in truth and reveals him to whom he wills. Can you read Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, please? All things are delivered unto me of my father. And no man knoweth the son but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father save the son. And he to whomsoever the son will reveal him. Amen. So, Lord Yache, tell us of the Father in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, please. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. 
That's the heart of Allah Hayyam. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 11, verse 23, and then verse 25 and 26, please? Wisdom of Solomon 11 and 23. But thou hast had mercy upon all, for thou canst do all things, and winkest at the sins of men, because they should have men. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 11, verse 25. And how could anything have endured if it had not been thy will, or been mm -hmm. preserved, if not called by thee? But thou sparest all, for they are thine, O Lord, thou lover of souls. We see who Allah Hayyam truly is through his words. And notice in regards to power, he said, for thou canst do all things. And in his power, he actually winks at the sins of men because we should amend. So it helps us understand where power really lies or when we have power, how to exercise it in compassion, in mercy, being understanding and long-suffering. And we can confirm the heart of Ahai, Allah Hayyam is merciful by seeing what made David's heart as Allah Hayyam's in 1 Maccabees 2 and 57, where it says, David, for being merciful, possessed the throne. And Acts 13 and 22 confirmed Allah Hayyam said, David was a man after his own heart. And you can reference those verses for that. So for us who want the heart of our Allah Hayyam in truth, be merciful and attain to it. Yet mercy alone will not fulfill our purpose for the heart of Allah Hayyam. Let's see what else it takes. Can you read 1 Kings chapter 15 verse 5, please? Yes. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of Ahia, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So mercy and doing right in the eyes of Ahia to fulfill all his will and his commandments shall achieve that endeavor, even as David, who fell two times according to 1 Kings 15 and 5 in his growing process, but got back up and didn't add unto his sins, pressing towards perfection. Hope that helps for us want to have a heart that pleases Allah Hayyam, knowing that doing his will and being merciful will help attain unto that. So we have a true perspective of the heart of Allah Hayyam. Now going back to what happened with the devil, we know wrath and hatred with lying, and we see that lying working in the devil to think he knew Allah Hayyam's heart according to his own peculiar vision based on his feelings and desires. Let's see what else he thought in his heart. Can you read Isaiah chapter 14 verse 13 please? Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The devil thought the heart of Elohim was to have glory above all, be praised by all, know all, and control all. That's all he could see because that's how he felt in his heart would make him an Allah Hayyam, as he envied those things. Let's look at the account of what happened with the devil and his angels to get understanding of pride. We're going into the book of the lives of Adam and Eve in chapter 12, please. And with a heavy sigh, the devil spake, O oh Adam, all my hostility envy and sorrow is for thee since it is for thee that i have been expelled for my glory hold on so we see the devil's in his feelings because he didn't get what he wanted in his pride which gave place to hatred and anger and hostility then envy and wrath to go over into the spirit of sorrow thus the prideful struggle with depression or anxiety just as the devil because we want what we want, though it isn't right, according to Allah Hayyam, or it's not our portion, but we desire it anyway. And when we don't get it, we get upset, nonetheless, when Allah Hayyam doesn't give it to us, though we desire it according to our lust instead of his will. 
This war on the mind and fighting against Alahayim's will within starts from somewhere. Let's see. James chapter 4 verse 1, please. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Lust. Lust is another spirit we have to understand in this lesson. It's the cause of the resistance we have in our life from Allah Hayyam, And the war is weighing on our minds. And we see the resistance effect in our everyday life. Continue verse 2, please. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. So Allah Hayyam withstands us. Yet we think it's just carnal things or random mishaps that hinder us, not understanding everything comes from him. As it said in Wisdom of Solomon, he controls all. We set our own goals and we keep falling short. We have plans and they keep falling through. It's not by chance that it seems things always go wrong or don't pan out. Allah Hayim truly controls all in justice. He resists us with punishments from his just angels for our lustful works against his law. So we can come to repentance. As it said in wisdom, he winks so that we all shall amend. Can you read Hermas, parable 6, chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, please? This, saith he, is the angel of punishment. And he is one of the just angels and presides over punishment. So he receives those who wander away from Elohim and walk after the lusts and deceits of this life and punish them as they deserve with fearful and various punishments. See here how in our lusts that's making life so hard because they are leading us to wander from Elohim. It's our lust that's doing it. Now, we now know the truth that these punishments are good for us to bring awareness that we aren't doing right and we need to assess our lives and repent and put our hands to the plow. Yet, let's see how we would view it in our lust and the deceit when it comes with the pride and other spirits blinding our perception. Can you read chapter 3, verse 4, please? I would fain learn, sir, said I, of what sort of these various punishments Listen, saith he, the various tortures and punishments are tortures belonging to the present life. For some are punishments with losses. So some are punished with losses. Allah am destroying things from us, like Jehoshaphat's ships that were broken for not doing right. So you may have an unexpected car trouble or something comes up that took away from your funds or you lose something that you valued or you needed. Continue, please. And others with want. As James said, we desire and can't obtain. Wanting things, but it's for lust's sake, so Allah doesn't give it. Or we lack the necessary things to get what we want because our wants are for our desires. Continue, please. And others with diverse maladies. And Zachary, well, feel free to jump in if there be an understanding that you have or that is lacking, please. Oh, go ahead. A malady is a disease or ailment. So we also get illnesses or physical health complications for our humbling if we have pride or lack mercy or are being bitter. Remembering offenses or holding grudges or struggling to obey the commandments. Mind you, those aren't the only reasons we get sick. It can also be because of some sin our household is doing, or we as men are doing that is affecting our household. And in some cases, there are instances where we are given an ailment to keep us humble, like Paul, who was given an infirmity to help him from the pride and lack of compassion that play on Benjamites. If you're familiar with that tribe from the lesson on that tribe, what the patriarch Benjamin spake about his tribe, as these things are struggles that they deal with. We can also confirm our health issues are used to reward us for our works, to help us see our faults, to reconsider 
and examine ourselves to be sure we haven't sinned or confess our sin if we have and turn away from our sins. As Reuben, he was afflicted in his loins for his lust, for which he repented with his whole heart, <laughs> which for like seven years he was zealous to make sure he overcame that. Then you have Simeon. He had an injury of his hand for his envy and his wrath, which made him actually realize he sinned. And Gad had a liver issue for his hatred as well, which he understood when he came to repentance why it actually happened. And all the brethren of Zebulon were sick except him because Zebulon actually had mercy and compassion to help confirm what we do has an effect on our health. So if you're having health troubles, it's a great indicator to examine ourselves to see if pride, lack of mercy, or compassion has place in us, or if there be some loss at work leading us not to keep the commandments. Not to say that's the only way you can get sick. It's just one of the punishments for sins that Allah gives to bring us back to acknowledging our sin and repenting. Can you read Zebulon chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, please? The Testament of Zebulon chapter 5, verse 1. And now, my children, I bid you to keep the commands of the Lord and to show mercy to your neighbors and to have compassion towards all, not towards men only, but also towards beasts. For all this thing's sake, the Lord blessed me. And when all my brethren were sick, I escaped without sickness. For the Lord knoweth the purposes of each. Have therefore compassion in your hearts, my children, because even as a man doeth to his neighbor, so also will the Lord do to him. For the sons of my brethren were sickening and were dying on account of Joseph, because they showed not mercy in their hearts. But my sons were preserved without sickness, as ye know. So that gives us understanding to be mindful of what's going on in our hearts, even when we may not show it, but our heart, Allah Hayyam, he weighed the spirits, he's watching, and he rewards us according to our inclinations. Um, let's also see by precepts how pride itself. So we saw mercy, compassion, and lack of keeping the law affects our health and how we feel about it in our heart. And let's also see how pride affects us. Can you read Sirach or Ecclesiasticus chapter 18, verse 21, please? Humble thyself before thou be sick, and in the time of sins show repentance. So that's a simple indicator. You see sickness coming along, focus on humility and repent for whatever it is that you can at least see for yourself as to why. And if you can't see, pray about it. Get with your counselor, the one who keeps the commandments, and search it out and see. So you can acknowledge it and get past that. Can you read Sirach chapter 38, verse 9 and 10, please? Sirach 38 and 9. My son, in thy sickness be not negligent, but pray unto the Lord, and he will make thee whole. Leave off from sin, and order thy hands aright, and cleanse thy heart from all wickedness. So that's the simplicity of sickness is going on don't be negligent to think it's just happening there's nothing going on pray unto the lord for him to make you whole leave off from whatever it is that you know that you're doing and focus on ordering your ways aright and pay attention to what's in your heart to not let any wickedness continue to affect you all right we have to get these things out of our heart. So even if we put on a vain show to seem good to others, Allah Hayyam searches the heart and still rewards us according to it. So if you feel you're doing well, but your health is a struggle, pray about what the cause is and see what he shows in your dreams as he speaks in them, as we learned from the last lesson. And go speak with that one counselor who you know to keep the law and inquire of the interpretation as interpretations belong to Allah Hayyam, because lack of humility could be a struggle, not wanting to look bad or be vulnerable, and it could lead you to be wise in your own eyes, to have your own interpretation 
or not go seek the interpretation from Allah Hayyam through his ministers, both of which are to our own detriment because pride and lust gets us to stay right where we are in both scenarios. So let's repent for the evil works of our hearts and go unto the elders of the church to pray over us and anointing us with oil, with olive oil, to be exact. It needs to be olive oil. Can you read James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, please? Is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You have to be willing to confess your faults so you can be prayed for and healed by the effects of that righteous man's prayer. After that, focus on keeping the commandments to avoid the health issues. And don't get discouraged when a health issue comes along like, oh, I'm like you can't get it right. Take it as good. It's just opportunity to learn from whatever's going on and to show humility by being willing to confess your fault and turn unto the Lord. And that puts us right here where pride is. But if you go into sorrow, instead of being encouraged, then you're falling right into the pride. Right. As we see in the devil, he was just in his feelings and wouldn't repent. Can you read Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5, please? And Tobit chapter 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 8 and 5. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. Tobit chapter 12, verse 7. Do that which is good, and no evil shall touch you. You have confirmation. If you're doing right, things will be well. But if you're doing not right, Allah is going to help you by giving you something to get your attention so you'll turn unto him. As we discussed Job in the last lesson, we got to find out Job was perfect. He was sincere, but there was still more growing to do. And Allah gave him what was needful for him to help him see it and bring it out so that he can overcome it. All right. And remember, after you get past that, he's going to bless you again. So we keep rolling. <laughs> Take it and try it. All right. Let's continue seeing what other punishments we get when Allah is resisting us for our works. Can you continue We're going back into Hermas Parable 6, picking up where we left off, please? And others with every kind of unsettlement. Unsettle. It means cause to feel anxious or uneasy. Disturb. He said every kind of unsettlement. So things will be happening that cause anxiety, worry, disturbing our peace because things aren't going as we would have it. Continue, please. And others with insults from unworthy persons. So there'll be folks who may not be in the faith yet can see our iniquities and they'll call out our faults as well. Continue, please. And with suffering in many other respects. For many being unsettled in their plans, set their hands to many things and nothing ever goes forward with them. And then they say that they do not prosper in their doings. So every time I try to get something I want or desire going, it doesn't prosper in layman's terms. <laughs> Continue, please. And it doeth not enter into their hearts that they have done evil deeds, but they blame the Lord. Now, if I'm in pride and I can't see past myself and I just think like it can't be me, it's no way because Allah knows my heart. How am I going to see is because I did evil. We don't realize it's our deeds. That's the reason why the Lord resists us and things didn't prosper. But in our pride, we won't look at ourselves to take accountability for the struggle, but we'll say it just wasn't the Lord's will or he just did what was best. 
or straight up, we may just get in our feelings like, why is bad things always happening to me? I haven't done anything wrong. Blame it on him for things not going well. Yet the truth is that we wanted things according to our lust rather than his will, though we even would pray and hope for it to happen. This is when a lot of people start straying away from Elohim and they start going into luck and they start going into different things in those areas because it's not falling through for them. Things that they desire or for lust's sake or for their own desires don't fall through. So they go and find another avenue to blame it on because something has to take the blame. It can't be them. So something else has to take the blame. Whether they get upset with Alahayim and start resenting Alahayim or they start focusing on the world. They'll say the luck or they'll say um, the universe. They, they start going away from Alahayim. And that's when this actually starts. Thank you. Can you read James chapter 4, verse 3, please? Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Hence, our desires aren't fulfilled. Continue in verse 2, please. And desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Now, how are we fighting and warring, yet not prevailing? Because it's against Allah through our desires, instead of letting go of them to be led by his spirit. What does James mean by we ask not? How can we be in a fight and war and ask not for help? Because we're battling according to our own strength, trusting in ourselves. Now, what happens when we ask, though, on the other hand? Continue, please, in verse 3. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. So, we don't ask for the right things in the sight of Allah Hayyam, so we don't receive what we ask for, since the requests are based on our own desires, hoping things just work out for us. The pride of self-will and being grieved at not getting our desires, warring against Allah Hayyam unawares, is a great cause of depression in the world. By this spiritual fornication wherein we are being resisted for serving other spirits. For many of us, we don't ask what Allah Hayyam's will is for our life. We don't ask and say, hey, Allah Hayyam, what is it that you want from me? What is it that you want me to do? And being content with his answer that he gives you for your life or the purpose that he gives you for your life. That's why it says you ask and receive not because you're asking for things that aren't what he wants for you. So you don't receive it because you ask amiss because you're not actually asking Allah what is his will for your life. Right, you're looking for whatever desire it is or what you want, not actually looking for what he wants for you. So that's a major part of that. Thanks for the edification, putting things you know, in perspective. That takes humility, though. That's why we're sitting here in the pride lesson because it takes humility for you to say, Alahine, what do you want for my life? What do you want me to do? putting yourself aside so it's kind of opposite of literally it's a goal right now for a person dealing with pride it's a goal to get to amen so understanding how we're being resisted for serving other spirits can we read wisdom of solomon chapter 14 verse 12 verse 22 and verse 27, please. All right. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 12. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication, and the invention of them, the corruption of life. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 22. Moreover, this was not enough for them, that they erred in the knowledge of Elohim, 
But whereas they lived in the great war of ignorance, those so great plays called they peace. Hold on. He said the great war of ignorance. The world warring against Allah I am ignorantly. Not understanding what we're doing. But we're thinking we're actually having peace with all the punishments we're going through for what we're doing. Unfortunately, many of us are struggling mentally with the war in our minds through our ignorances because pride working in our desires hinders us from wanting to see what's going on or going on to those who understand to find out what's going on. So we would be going through plagues, getting various punishments for our deeds happening to us but when asked how we're doing or how things are going, we'll call it peace and say, I'm good. I'm fine. When well, we really aren't. Continue when you will, please. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 27. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. It's that simple. It's that's where it starts. And they're the ones that work. Carrying us over against our Elohim. Now, in regards to asking not, as James said, can we touch back to that in James chapter 4, verse 2, please? And desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Lust and pride work together in us, not making our requests unto Lahayim, as we're fighting and warring against him to continue doing what we want to do. Yet, we don't get ahead. Lust has us fighting and warring against Lahayim to fulfill our desires instead of his. And in those desires, we sometimes keep fighting on our own and don't ask for anything from him because we didn't get what we want anyway. Or it could be we judge ourselves as not being worthy to ask because we go into sorrow for our sins, unawares that it's an evil spirit of doubt in that, according to the angel of repentance. And then there's also another way we go into it because we can't fulfill our desires like Amnon and Ahab did when they couldn't get what they wanted. Neither of them made prayer unto Allah Hayyam. And then sometimes we're asking Allah for things in prayer, but he's not hearing us because our desires and intents for asking are still against him. So he saves us from ourselves, not letting us have our own way. It's like we're asking him to help us sin against him. And then also sometimes we want to turn a blind eye to our own works and thoughts so we can continue to do the wrong thing we're lusting for. Hence, it says that we may consume it upon our lust. All this that we're talking about, this is a spirit of pride at work. Can you read Sirach chapter 5 verse 2, please? Follow not thine own mind and thy strength to walk in the ways of thy heart. Now, if we have done that, there is an opportunity for repentance with understanding now. Can you read James chapter 4, verse 6, please? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, Allah resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. So understand, if I'm struggling to make my prayer unto Allah, pride and some lust of the flesh in my desires is at work, and I need to catch it. Also, if my prayers aren't being heard and I'm not receiving my petitions, I need to examine myself to see if my intents and my desires are upright and pure, or is there some lust I'm trying to fulfill by my request as to why I'm not receiving my request. Or there may be some transgression that I committed unawares. Okay? Mind you, it could also be an opportunity for growth and patience as he answers when he pleases, and it is unwise to give him a set time to answer, 
just as the judges of the Simeonites had done in the book of Judah. So after I get insight, I can humble myself and confess and ask for the right things because I know he gives grace to the humble. All right. And knowing that and even getting that edification on the right questions to ask, like, what is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? What does James encourage us to do in verse seven, please? Submit yourself, therefore, to Elohim. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It was the devil at play in lust and pride in us and depression, just as he himself fell to the same spirits and walks in the same ways. And now we're getting understanding of how to submit ourselves by asking the right questions. What is your will? Being on God to keep from our own wills. Continue first Peter five and six, please. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of Elohim, that he may exalt you in due time. That's the right route to take to have glory in truth in due time. Unlike the devil who exalted himself against the hand of Elohim and was cast down for it, yet he didn't humble himself, but got into his feelings just like Cain, who went unto wrath, and his countenance fell when he didn't get what he wanted. So we have a good dichotomy of whether it's pride or humility at work in us when things come up. And yet for us, we now know to stay out of our feelings. And how do we do that by humbling ourselves unto him? Let's find out in verse 7 and 8 of 1 Peter 5, please. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. If I know he cares for me, it takes away the anxiety of the world, wondering how am I going to take care of myself. And I can just let him know what's going on and wait for him to show me what to do. In the last lesson, Zach Quad touched on, if you're still thinking, worrying about, or anxious about things, you haven't actually cast all your cares upon Allah Hayim. So taking heed to these admonitions, what does Peter say in verse 8? Be sober, be vigilant. Stay out of our feelings and pay attention. And why so? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He envies that. He envies prosperity. He envies to see us sober-minded, patient, on guard, paying attention to what's going on around us and within us. Just as we learned in the anger lesson, how he plays on our emotions to get us not to take everything as good from Allah Hayyam, we have to be mindful to take everything as good from Allah Hayyam. Amen. Continue, please. In verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. The word steadfast. Steadfast, firm in belief, determination, or adherence. And the Greek definition in 4731 is stiff. That is solid, stable, steadfast, strong, sure. So we can know as the control of our emotions increase, it shows our growth in faith and stability in belief. Let's resist getting into our feelings and remember all is for the good from Allah Hayyam, and take it all in humility seeking what he wills for us to learn and grow from in each experience, knowing that our brethren in the world are in the same fight against the devil. There's no such thing as being alone in this walk in Yache Christ. And don't let the devil, we're going to touch on this later, it's the devil through pride that leads us to separate ourselves or to take things on on our own and not communicate and not seek the well-being of everybody and ourselves by communicating with a counselor and such. We're going to get into that a little later. 
Now let's go back to the story on the devil to get more understanding of pride and what befell him. If we can pick back up in Lives of Adam and Eve, chapter 12, please. And with the heavy side, the devil spake, O Adam, all my hostility, envy, and sorrow is for thee, since it is for thee that I have been expelled from my glory, which I possessed in the heavens in the midst of the angels, and for thee was I cast out in the earth. See, his lust lifted him up, and he was depressed for not getting what he wanted, though him not obeying Allah was the reason for his casting down. He was lifted up and envious, and he was not taking accountability for his own actions, blaming Adam for his own decisions. Pride doesn't suffer a person to take accountability for their actions, nor the results of their actions towards others. Consider how pride works. Was it really Adam's fault he fell from his glory and was cast out? No. As we will see what transpired, but pride is wrathful and hateful. So the lying is there, blinding a prideful person's perception of what actually happened with the net of deceit in any given event that involves them having to see their fault, confess their fault, or acknowledge they did anything wrong because all they can see is what they feel someone else did or how they didn't do wrong to justify what they had done because their anger justifies their actions after they commit some sin. It's honestly tough because the other person may not have actually even done anything wrong like Adam had done no wrong at the first. Or the person may just have made a simple mistake, but pride is hateful and makes small things great to amplify the mistake. Or, on the other hand, pride is wrathful, made with lying to deceive the prideful person to think some wrong was done to them when the person didn't actually do anything like in the case with the devil here, and as we know, with Cain, who hated his brother without a cause. And because he was actually doing right. Envy. Yes. Who us? We know in either case, stay out of our feelings or getting vexed to see things in truth. And if a fault was committed, receive it as good from Allah to help grow in that merciful heart and perfect our faith in long suffering without getting upset. You got to watch that prideful wrath because that vexation. Anger or sorrow can come from us knowing we did something wrong, but not want to be wrong, or we don't want to be corrected by another, or it can be that we just upset because we didn't get what we wanted, regardless if it's right or wrong, or we can be vexed with ourselves because we didn't want to look bad in front of others, especially someone we envy or compare ourselves onto, so we don't want to look bad in front of them, so we feel we have to find a scapegoat to blame or avoid the conversation to maintain our image in the sight of men. We'll get more into this stuff later in the lesson, Lord willing. For now, let's continue to see what else transpired with the devil. If you can continue in Lies of Adam, chapter 12, please. What do thou tell me? What have I done to thee? And what is my fault against thee? Seeing that thou hast received no harm or injury from us, why doest thou pursue us? The devil replied, Adam, what doest thou tell me? It is for thy sake I have been hurled from that place. You see how it can happen when dealing with a prideful person? You can be accused of something you don't have a clue about because you were just walking in your simplicity. But their view is based on their emotions. Look at how the devil reacts. He refuses to change his mind and gets offended when his own reality of what happened is questioned. Pride doesn't like to be challenged or questioned because it wants to stay right where it is in its feelings instead of being calm and having an honest conversation to see if the other person is even seeing things correctly and then finding peaceful solutions in either case. Because pride is hateful according to Sirach 10 and 7, so just as Gad spake about, a prideful person will struggle to confess a fault 
or be willing to admit they did something wrong. And you just have to let it go if they deny it and not try to force the issue, lest you sin yourself for getting into your own feelings. We will touch more on that later on as well. Let's continue seeing how the devil explains what happened in his pride and feelings. Please. I was formed. I was hurled out of the presence of Elohim and banished from the company of the angels. You see the lack of accountability pulling everything on Adam. He's saying, when you were formed, I was hurled. Let's see if his perception is accurate. Continue, please. When Elohim blew into thee the breath of life, and thy face and likeness was made in the image of Elohim, Michael also brought thee and made us worship thee in the sight of Elohim. And Elohim, the Lord spake, Heareth Adam, I have made thee in our image and likeness. Zachary well pointed out that that's Yache speaking. He is Elohim, the Lord, as Thomas said, My Lord and my Elohim, when he finally understood who he was. <laughs> Continue, please. And Michael went out and called all the angels, saying, Worship the image of Elohim as the Lord Elohim hath commanded. And Michael himself worshiped first. Then he called me and said, Worship the image of Elohim the Lord. And I answered, I have no need to worship Adam. His heart wasn't desirous of the simplicity of just obeying the voice of Elohim. Through his pride, because he looked at the situation as what was needful for himself, having his own opinion of what was needful for him, not considering that Allah knows what's needful for all of us. So doing what he says is always needful for us to do, as it's the best thing to do for all parties involved. Continue, please. And since Michael kept urging me to worship, I said to him, Why do without urge me? I will not worship an inferior and younger being than I. I am his senior in creation. Before he was made, I was already made. It is his duty to worship me. Pride is selfish and self-pleasing. All it can see is what others should do for it, even when it isn't even seeing things rightly, because the greater should be servant to the lesser by Christ's teaching and works in the earth in humility and lowness of heart. But pride just looks for the opportunity to have the glory of being praised or being held in honor or being seen as superior in the sights of men, even as the devil. Continue, please, in chapter 14. When the no, angels... Sorry. Sorry, chapter 15. When the angels who were under me heard this, they refused to worship him. Remember, vainglory provokes. The devil provoked those other angels to sin by his mindset. The angels felt a vainglory designed to be praised by men as they cleaved unto him, having the same covetousness and pride. Can you read Psalms chapter 10, verse 3, please? For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom Ahia abhorreth. So the scriptures hold true. These things happened from the beginning and it's still happening. <laughs> the devil boasted of his heart's desire and the other angels who are also prideful, they were with him. They were in agreement with that. The prideful boast in what they desire as the devil was not ashamed to say what he felt in his heart's desire. And others who have that same pride agree with covetousness as they have the same pride as well. Hence, those in pride usually surround themselves with folks of like pride, or they admire folks that also have pride like them, or praise folks that are glorying in the pride they admire. If you find your circle is full of people that walk in a certain spirit, or you delight in people that walk in a certain spirit, then examine ourselves to see if that spirit has place in us, too, just in case we have a fault in us unawares. And put the work in to overcome it, to let the light of Christ shine for others to come out of their struggles as well. Let's continue in the lives of Adam chapter 15, please. And Michael saith, Worship the image of Elohim. 
But if thou would not worship him, the Lord Elohim will be wroth with thee. Okay. We know vainglory provokes. The devil is provoking the Lord himself to be wroth by not obeying him, just as anyone in pride provokes Elohim by not obeying him, for reasons we will touch on in this lesson. Continue, please. And I said, if he be wroth with me, I will set my seat above the stars of heaven and will be like the highest. The devil's response is to exalt himself above the Lord himself, to be as the highest, the Holy Father. This shows what he really desired in the first place was to be as the Most High. Hence, here in the end of this world, he's going to set his seat above the stars and send his own son down to the earth, just as the Father would send Christ back. Yet not in the same manner because the devil isn't truly Elohim, of course, but envy is leading him to mimic him according to his own perception. You know what's interesting, Casa? Go ahead. Uh, the devil already knew what he desired from the beginning, though he never spoke on it. But as soon as he got the opportunity, it comes out. Mm. Yes, it did. So you can see how that pride works by not refuting or humbling yourself to the will of Elohim and staying and keeping that mindset of what you want, though not acting upon it, it eventually is going to escalate itself and it's going to come out and you're going to operate to get what you want eventually if you don't actually correct it. So that's very interesting. It puts in perspective why he comes with so many distractions of the world. In this life, there's so much going on. Who takes the time to stop and actually assess, like, hey, what was that? Like, right. why did my countenance just change? You know, why did I feel like that a while ago? you know, to actually see and catch it before it, the fruit, the full fruition comes down the line. Or if you want something, you're like, this is what I want. Though you may be struggling to keep that or to be in humility, you know what you want. You're like, this is what I want. That's the pride. It's like, this is what I want. Though that may not be what Elohim wants for me. And instead of correcting it and saying, okay, let me cast that far from me so that I can do what Elohim wants me to do. It stays there and it lingers. And then you keep going forward, still battling between the pride and humility, trying to stay on the course with what Elohim wants, which you know is right. But eventually, if you don't ever cast whatever your own desire was away from you, it comes. It comes in the opportune moment Usually when pride is at its peak, when pride overtakes the humility, then it comes out. And you can see right here, even with the devil, when he got to that point where he couldn't take it no more, it came out. It was like, oh, you want me to worship Adam? Now my desire is going to come out. My true desire that I had from a long time ago is finally coming out and I'm finally speaking it. Because I'm fed up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to present something to you to see. It was in him before that event even came up. Right. And once asked what was in his heart, showed right away. Right. Hence, it's good you're talking about dealing with that thing as soon as you see it's an issue and now if you haven't dealt with it you can know what's actually going on within you when situations come up how you react right even though you may not say it because our eyes looking at our heart you everyone knows well lord willing we actually are paying attention and examine ourselves to know what's in our heart how are you willing to get to that place if we're not there? 
Yeah. And when you see it, you know what just happened. Go deal with that. Like that's something I need to cast off. Right. That initial reaction was not the right reaction. Or maybe you actually did it. What I just did was not right. Go you did what you did according to your desire, your true desire. Yeah. And that's where it really, like, you may have reacted like that. Let's say that you're with the person, like your spouse, and you reacted a way that was way far beyond what a normal reaction would be to a situation or whatever the case is. It's because you desire something else or you want something that you didn't get. So you acted out in the scenario because you didn't get what you want. And maybe it may not have reached its fullness at that point for you to come out and say it, but you're still acting and operating based off of your desire that you're not getting and you're getting upset about it. And that's where it gives place to other things, other spirits, because you're not actually dealing with the thing that is causing you to not be at peace. I'm dealing with that desire that's resisting. Right. But for perspective, we're going to get into this stuff a bit more. All right. So we've seen the devil's heart. He, he finally spake on what he really felt and what he really wanted. Soon as the environment was there for it, for the mm -hmm. lust to be fulfilled or to be declared to boast of the heart's desire. Let's see what happened after that in Chapter 16 of the Lives of Adam and Eve, please. And Allah, I am the Lord, was wroth with me and banished me and my angels from our glory. And on thy account were we expelled from our abodes into this world and hurled on the earth. Did you notice he's still telling the story and can't see that he was banished for his decision? The pride didn't leave. All right. This is because punishing a proud person has no remedy because the root of lust is in the proud and we can't see past our own desires of what we want and have already justified our actions and found something or someone outside of ourselves to be the reason things didn't go as we desired. Not understanding Allah Hayyam is resisting us because he resists the proud. Can you read Sirach chapter 3 verse 28 please? In the punishment of the proud, there is no remedy. For the plan of wickedness hath taken root in him. The root of the plant of wickedness is lust. Can you read Apocalypse of Moses, please? I forgot. He went and poured upon the fruit the poison of his wickedness. Remember, the iniquity that was found in him was being uplifted in his heart. And that's where his wickedness started. So now we can find out what the poison of pride is. Continue, please. Which is lust, the root and beginning of every sin. As we know from James, lust, when it is conceived, it brings forth sin and evidently grows into a plant of wickedness with a stinky, smelly root by the preaching of David. Let's continue to see how pride works in a man overcome by his lust and sorrow in his sins because he didn't accomplish his own desire. Let's see what the devil did. Chapter 16 of Lives of Adam and Eve, please. And straightway we were overcome with grief since we have been spoiled of so great glory. As we learn, the pride are covetous and can only see what they want as the devil and his angels were grieved for the loss of their glory, which they covet. So a symptom of pride is once we don't get what we want, we go into sorrow or some type of vexation because our desire wasn't fulfilled and we avoid accountability by making someone or something else the reason we lost or didn't get what we wanted. That's another interesting thing. He had the glory. He just didn't have the other thing that he wanted. So because he didn't get everything that he wanted, it was a problem. You see that? I do. Like he had the glory. If he would have just been humble and took the glory, it would have been okay and content. But through the pride and the lust, he wanted more. And 
he ended up losing everything. Yeah. Brian likes to be superior. He wants to be above all. Then Alahayim doesn't walk in it, and he is above all. Like, right. And we were grieved come. when we saw thee in such joy and luxury. Pride doesn't leave off from his works to just be grieved because we didn't get what we wanted, but it also causes us to be envious and jealous of others who are blessed for doing what's right instead of praising that person's blessing and good works and turning unto good works ourselves. Sadly, the devil wanted the glory in heaven, but didn't want to do the work of humbling himself to keep the glory he had because he wasn't content with it, as Zachwa just pointed out. He inspires the proud in this world not to humble ourselves, to do the work to be glorified by Allah Hayyam, by obeying his voice nor to be content with whatever Allah gives us, but rather to lift ourselves up to get the praise of men just as he desired the praise of men himself. So if you find your desire to be liked, admired, or seen in high regard, or trying to look righteous to men who don't really know you, but are a different person within or in private or with those who really know you, vain glories at work. And it's the devil performing his own law in us because that's hypocrisy. We're going to touch on hypocrisy more in this lesson, Lord willing. Now, continuing looking at the pride of the devil, he's grieved he didn't get what he wanted and envious seeing others who have done right and have peace. So now here comes the provocation of another in his vain glory. Can you continue... Adam, chapter 16, please. And with guile, I cheated thy wife and caused thee to be expelled through her doing from thy joy and luxury, as I have been driven out of my glory. He's tough. He set up to do that, but he said it like it was her doing. There's no accountability for anything with pride. And Yes, she's accountable for herself. She shouldn't have done what she did. But just seeing how pride can do no wrong. Pride and envy. Yeah. So there's the crab in a bucket mentality. I'm down, so I need to take you down with me. Right. A prideful person rather look to see you fall or try set you up to fall so you can be down like them or struggle as they struggle, then see you prosper, praise your growth, and be a help by praying for you to continue to grow out of envy. One may not see it as envy, though, and just desire to be better than others, so that arrogance is loved by the spirit of hatred to be envious in the heart, but the person may just not see it. Yet it's easily seen in comparing ourselves to others Delighting in seeing when others struggle as it makes us feel better about where we are or some vexation when we see someone else prospering. So those are some things to help catch it if you're unaware. And when it says delighting in seeing others struggle, that's where it makes me feel better to know somebody else is struggling too. Because it's like, all right, I'm not the only one. Because remember, pride desires to be superior. So he's not content knowing that, hey, I have my own problems to focus on, not be looking at what anybody else has going on. Okay. Can you read Sirach chapter 11, verse 30, please? Like as the postage taken and kept in a cage, so is the heart of the proud. A proud heart can't contain itself. It will show itself when you understand the law, because the law is a boundary from death, showing what mischief looks like to avoid it. For the humble, but not for the proud, because for the proud, it's a cage withstanding us from our own desires, 
and we want to escape it as a bird looking for freedom to do our own will and or to justify our own feelings. Continue, please. And like as a spy, watcheth he for thy fall. As the devil, a proud person doesn't look at another with good intent to see them prosper, but he's attentive to others to see them make a mistake for different reasons. Either to feel better about their own fault by looking at what someone else does so we don't have to pay attention to our own faults or to feel better because others are struggling, not just us. A prideful person also watches for another's fall to feel better about ourselves with the sentiments like, see, no one is perfect. Or see, you mess up too, so don't say anything to me. Or why are you saying anything to me when you got faults too? Or... I know you wasn't doing everything right. Or they watch another just to see you fall because pride envies your prosperity and rather see you in a low state like they are to feel better. Either because they believe they can't come out of their iniquity or your prosperity bothers them because it's a witness against them that change is possible. Or a person could be upset about their own struggles with their iniquity, so it makes them feel better to see you fall as well, since they really rather be doing better than others than to see others doing better than themselves. So that's when the sorrow comes in. Vexation yeah. of not getting what we want, or being in a position we want, or looking how we want. We see the works of the devil through his own pride, not being content with his lot, to fall into envy against the Most High. He uses the same thing that got him to fall upon us. That is, this is the, the core of it. <laughs> the enticement of lust to be as Allah Hayyam, making our own decisions rather than submitting to the humility in the decisions of Allah Hayyam. Both Adam and Eve were tempted to be a Allah Hayyam, making decisions and knowing all for themselves to help understand the enticement of lust. Let's look at it. In chapter 18 of the Apocalypse of Moses, please. Then the serpent saith to me, May Allah Hayyam live. But I am grieved on your account, for I would not have you ignorant. Temptation that we as men obeying Allah Hayyam's commands in simplicity is just ignorant hence we do so continue please but arise come hither hearken to me and eat and mind the value of that tree there you have the lust of the eyes looking at things according to our own perception rather than in uprightness according to the word of Allah Hayyam and singleness of heart continue please but I said to him I fear at least Allah Hayyam be wroth with me as he told us then comes vexation, because the desire has place to tempt us to want the pleasure or advantage we think we can get. And once in these feelings or passions, talking about it in our minds or considering the acts in our minds, we know lying comes with it to lead us unto the law of the devil. Continue, please. And he saith to me, Fear not, for as soon as thou eatest of it, ye too shall be as Allah I am, in that ye shall know good and evil. The devil comes right when he gets us in our feelings, doubting whether to obey Allah I am, and tempting us to be like Allah I am as our own controller, and knowing what's right for ourselves to make our own decisions instead of being ignorant to evil, to walk in the simplicity of obeying Allah I am's voice. We have to watch the devil. Because he speaks some things true to entice us. Hence, he said the truth that she would know good and evil like Allah Hayyam, but lie to her that she ought not to fear. Which was a major lie because the fear of Allah Hayyam keeps us in humility to obey his voice. Right. Now, at this point, Eve is unstable in faith. As she is in her emotions and her desires through the lust of the eyes and the desire for knowledge, 
are lifting her up against Alahayim to listen to the devil, and here comes envy to take over her mind. Continue, please. But Alahayim perceived this, that ye would be like him. So he envied you and said, ye shall not eat of it. The spirit of lion working to give her a false perception of Allah Hayyam and his purpose for his commands to be through envy in order to cause her to fall to envy herself, which doesn't suffer prudence to act in a person when it has place. Truly, the devil knew the commandment was for our good, but he's a liar and the father of it. Can you read John chapter 8 verse 44, please? Ye are your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye would do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He told us his view, as he is who truly had all these feelings, thinking that Allah envied him, but lied to us to make us feel that's how Allah felt about us too. By the end of this lesson, we will look at the truth of this matter to know how Allah really felt about us. But let's see what else transpired here. The devil tempted Eve with the desire to be as Allah Hayyam, lying saying Allah Hayyam was envious so that she would be like him and discouraged her from the fear of the Lord to give into the desire. We know the devil caused her to fall, and lust came into her by eating the fruit. Let's see how that happened. Chapter 19 of the Apocalypse of Moses, please. And when he had received the oath from me, he went and poured upon the fruit the poison of his wickedness, which is lust, the root and beginning of every sin. And he bent the branch on the earth, and I took of the fruit, and I ate. Lust of the flesh is now in her after the lust of the eyes was used to allure her. She now lusts to fulfill her heart's desires, not the desires of her Lord Allah Hayyam, just as the devil's lust to fulfill his heart's desires, not the Lord's. The Lord had mercy on her to give her the simple remedy to overcoming the devil, making her desires unto her husband and submitting herself in everything to him so that he may rule over her and not give place to the devil by precepts in Genesis 3.16 and Ephesians 5 and 24. Hence, a wife's command is simple to overcome the devil, as is a daughter to cleave unto her father, or a believing woman who doesn't have a believing head over her to cleave unto the Lord's command, submit herself to his ministers, as we saw Magdonia was unto Thomas, if you haven't read the book of the Acts of Thomas. And also for the unmarried to do likewise, as was the case with Judith, unto the elders of the city, not doing anything without consulting them first, as you can see in the book of Clement. A woman not keeping out of her feelings and submitting to the desire of her Lord has caused good women to fall, like Rachel speaking in her feelings to provoke Jacob, and Sarah, whose death was caused by the devil provoking her into her emotions. So sisters, you have the women's series and the unmarried women's series and the website tabs for edification and simplicity of the gospel, the anger lesson, this lesson, and having a simple focus of controlling our emotions, seeing that that's the starting point, getting into feelings, and then there comes the pride and other spirits at work. Now, continuing the story, we know the lust is the poison of the devil in wickedness of mankind. Now, let's see if the devil used the same lust against Adam and tactic to make him forsake the word of Allah Hayyam through his wife. Let's jump into the story after Eve fell, wherein she was in her feelings further after she had fallen. Can you read chapter 3? 21 of the lives of Adam and Eve, please. And I cried out in that very hour, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Rise up, and I will show thee a great secret. So now, 
we see the fruits of the devil's law come forth in Eve as she tempts Adam with a knowledge above the simplicity of obedience through her deceit. Continuing, please. But when your father came, I spoke to him words of transgression, which have brought us down from our great glory. For when he came, I opened my mouth and the devil was speaking. And I began to exhort him and said, Come hither, my lord Adam. Hearken to me and eat of the fruit of the tree of which Elohim told us not to eat of it, and thou shalt be as Elohim. Confirmation of the intent of lust. The poison of the devil's wickedness is to be as a Elohim, making our own decisions, walking according to our own mind, deciding good and evil for ourselves, and not having to obey the law of Elohim. So lust's great purpose has been offered to Adam here to draw him away and lift himself up. Let's see what comes next. Continue, please. It was it was amazing. Mm -hmm. She said, hearken to me and eat of the fruit of the tree, which Elohim told us not to eat of it. Like, she literally told him to break the commandment and that she was going to be his Elohim. Yes, she did end up saying, I will secure you before Allah am. What, or make you secure. Before which Allah was am. the devil speaking. So you can see it wasn't it wasn't Eve. It was actually the devil speaking. Right? Yeah. So it just further confirms the devil's purpose for us when hearkening to him. Come do what Allah am told you not to do. Right. It's the devil every time. Right. <laughs> it ain't hard. <laughs> the last lesson we talked about it. There's only two laws. <laughs> it ain't no variation. It's one or the other. It's one Good or the thing. other. It's it's black or white. There's no gray area. Right. Straight perspective. <laughs> and your father answered and said, I fear at least Allah and be wroth with me. And I said to him, Fear not, for as soon as thou hast eaten, thou shalt know good and evil. Didn't Eve say the same thing? I fear lest Allah and be wroth with me. Yes, she did. It's the same doubt. Yes, sir. Because the doubt was already there. Instead of being full in faith and saying, no, Allah told us not to eat of that tree. It's I fear at least Allah be wroth with me. I want to do it, but I don't want to do it because Allah told me not to. There was not enough conviction in themselves so that Allah was telling them was true and good for them. Right. We have to be convinced in ourselves that what Allah is saying is true and good and his law is good for us, for us to be able to keep it. If we have any doubt that something's better for us, which, Kazi, you're going to get to in the lesson, then we can't sustain. I'm not going to go too much further into that because I know you're going you're gonna to cover it. <laughs> All right. So, Adam was enticed by desire. And vexation entered in to be anxious to do the act because it had place in him, as Zachwa mentioned. <laughs> You've got to catch that vexation. That's That anger lesson wasn't before this lesson for no reason. We have to catch the vexation. We have to catch our feelings, our thoughts, the, the, the wandering off like, well, maybe uh, I'm thinking about it. We have to catch that. Because it's out of the desire to do the act that that vexation is there. Okay. We have to catch it and rather keep a sound mind. Breathe. Come back to temperance. Pray. And stay temperate to get out of that anxiety knowing it's not a desire of righteousness that's causing it. 
don't let the vexation like come and then you're like man that ain't right that ain't right you're in vexation it's just it, the, it's still playing <laughs> yes, i've been are. there man <laughs> learning this thing man <laughs> that ain't i don't want that nah like yeah you do that's man. why you're telling yourself you don't want it like you... <laughs> lying to myself man deceit man you're right that's the only way man the spirit of deceit comes in if if you don't nip it in the butt the spirit of deceit comes Bye. like the real deal when you say nip, like you gotta. Oh no, no, no! Right. Exactly what that is. That's not right. Straight, right. like ain't no getting in. Oh man, this here it is again. That thought came back. That's all vexation, right? You you when we're talking about staying temperate, it's legit. You got to stay temperate, right? And not get into the passion because the thoughts gonna linger. They playing in it. See that stuff what it is, man. I am prosperous. So. Right. And I said to him, Fear not, for as soon as thou hast eaten, thou shalt know good and evil. Mm. It's interesting that she said, For as soon as thou hast eaten, thou shalt know good and evil. But good and evil was before him before he even ate it. Okay. Like, he had the cognitive ability to know what was right and wrong before he even ate the fruit. Because he knew to keep Alaheim law, he said, I fear at least he'd be rough with me. Mm. He knew what was good, and he knew what was bad with the eating of the fruit. Yes. What good and evil is the devil actually talking about? Do tell. Hmm? What's the good and evil? Since by his emotions, he already showed he knew there was a consequence to come if he would have done right. it. For me, when I read this, I see that he was going to understand the difference between good and evil inside himself. Because externally, he knew what good and evil was. The only thing that he was struggling with and Eve before they actually ate the fruit was understanding good and evil within themselves. Like Eve didn't understand that she was doubting. Adam didn't understand that he was doubting. They both did the exact same thing. They didn't understand themselves. Serpent did get in trouble for deceiving the simple. They were ignorant to it. Right. So when the devil came, it was easy. If I can get them to fall into a spirit that they're unaware of, I got them. If they don't just stand for Allah and simplicity, I got them. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Go ahead and read it. So this is why today we have the ability to see good and evil within ourselves and around us. Being as Allah Hayyam, yet not having the heart of Allah Hayyam to abide in the good and losing the innocence of our perspective towards ourselves and others by the lust of our hearts to do what pleases us. Where, Zach, where she said, Fear not, for as soon as thou eatest, thou shalt know good and evil. I thought, is she tempting him to decide for himself? Like, yeah, you think Allah is going to be wroth, but eat this so you can discern good and evil for yourself. Right. It's two things. That's why when it says, um, 
this is why today we have the ability to see good and evil within ourselves and around us. Like we actually have the perception of what is good to us. So this is why it, it was given room for pride and all the other spirits that that works. This is why Allah told us not to eat it. Because now we lost the perception and the simplicity of Allah And now all these other factors are included. So now they couldn't see the good and evil within themselves. And now they can after they ate the fruit. And they also couldn't perceive the good and evil. So now we can go into the mindset that what I'm doing is right and good because we're blinded by a spirit. Whereas before Adam and Eve weren't blinded by a spirit. Yeah. You it see what I mean? Was right. Yeah. Before it was just what was right to Allah and that was the right. only direction to go. Now we have our own perception. I can choose for myself or I can choose to do Allah Hayam's will. Or that's not the way I see it. Or I have my own perception. Yeah. So you see how we got to the place of where we are now from that. Yeah. Hence, we're doing a pride lesson. <laughs> Man, praise Allah for perspective and insight. Amen. <sighs> So, Adam is now vexed in anxiety with the desire to be as a Alahayim, knowing good and evil for himself, to be his own controller, deciding what's right or wrong for himself, and he's in doubt whether to fear Alahayim and to keep his law or not by evidence of the vexation at play. Let's see what the devil uses to get him to give over to the desire of his own will. Continue in chapter 23, please. Then Adam called to mind the word which I spake to him, saying, I will make thee secure before Allah I am. Her words to be a Allah I am, and that she would make him secure before Allah I am, lead him astray to the desire of lust. Continue in chapter 21, please. Which was really the devil's talking. All yeah. right. The very key and, and speedily the i Thank persuaded him sorry we have to because yes. when a woman is overtaken in her emotions who is speaking it's the devil so we, we have to look at it that way right we wrestle not against flesh and blood thank you and speedily i persuaded him and she yeah. she's she know it's interesting that she said it was the devil that was speaking through her but even in her account, after she acknowledges that it was the devil, it starts becoming her. And that, that I don't take that lightly. And speedily, I persuaded him and he ate and straightway his eyes were open and he too knew his nakedness. Yeah, pride, pride doesn't want someone else to be prospering. She wanted it too, unfortunately, at that time. And at least she, you, we can see her repentance, though. You can see she got to humility because she's taking account for herself. Amen. So we can know, even in falling, our mother turned onto the right way before she was gone. She didn't blame somebody else. She spake on what she did candidly. Amen. Good testimony for us there, Mama. From what we just saw transpire in both Adam and Eve, the desire for freedom to do as we please and decide what is right or wrong for ourselves without fear of punishment for it is the devil's offer through our lust from the beginning. It speedily persuades us, even as it speedily persuaded Adam. It speedily persuades us when we have no fear of being hurt for what we do. The devil tempts us all by making our own law of right and wrong, knowing good and evil for ourselves, and to do as we like without fear before Allah Hayyam, 
because someone else will make us secure before Allah Hayyam to be safe and free from fear, though we haven't done right according to his law. This is the devil's temptation for all mankind to this day out of his hostility, envy, and sorrow towards us. Hence Christ showed us his love by keeping all the law and having it in his heart, teaching us to keep his commandments if we love him. And if we name his name, Paul said to depart from iniquity in 2 Timothy 2 and 19. And Paul also said, awake unto righteousness and sin not in 1 Corinthians 15 and 34, so that we don't fall to the same lie anymore to our hurt. Continue in the book of Adam, please. And to me, he saith, O wicked woman, what have I done to thee that thou hast deprived me of the glory of Allah? Pride works in lust, so he now has place in him too, not to take accountability for his actions in his grief. Yet he humbled himself after his fall and sinned no more for a testimony of true repentance to know we can come out of pride and lust as well. And when they had also, if you read the whole book, when it came time to tell the children what happened, he acknowledged his part. He wasn't just blaming his wife. They both had to spiritualize, to take accountability, and call things out as they were. Spiritual eyes of the law. So we're going to get to those spiritual eyes of the law in this lesson. Because the law is spiritual. As you know, whomever had read the account, Eve also eventually cleaved unto the desire of her husband to rule over her for her salvation as well in childbearing, continuing in faith, charity, and holiness with sobriety. Now, we see what happened with the devil and lust that he uses to entice all men. Let's see the effect it has on the world. Transition into the understanding the world view. First John chapter 2, verse 16, please. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. Those three things encompass all that lead us into the laws of the devil, as they are not of the Father. And scriptures confirm this world is not of the Father, so we can know when we walk in his ways, who we are actually walking in. Can you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, please? Wherein in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This prince of the power of the air behind this world's works are shown in us by disobedient to the law of the father and the fruits of his Holy Spirit. Can you read verse three, please? Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Affirmation of what we were understanding. It's our lust. It's our lust that lead to disobedience. Hence, we have to be examining ourselves to understand how, what pleasure is it that I'm being enticed by to get me to do this thing. Now, here we see it says, we are by nature children of wrath, Remember, wrath is passions. The definition being G3709, properly desire as a reaching forth or excitement of the mind. That is, by analogy, violent passion. Also, it means movement or agitation of the soul, impulse, desire, any violent emotion, but especially anger. So it can range. This world is in passions feelings, desires, and emotions, and its ways make us children of the spirit of wrath. 
the very spirit that uses our emotions to carry us into the desires of our flesh and minds instead of the law of Allah Hayyam. Unfortunately, many of us have experiences walking in our lusts and desires based on our feelings in the pride of this life. There are spirits at work in this world to lead us astray, according to precept. Can you read Ephesians 6 and 12, please? Well, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So by scripture, there are spiritual beings at work in our midst. The war isn't against men. Yet, we really need the spiritual mindset of Allah Hayyam to see the war we are in in this world. We flesh and blood people are vessels either for the darkness of this world or the light of Christ. As we've seen, it was the devil speaking to cause our fall from the beginning, whether through the creature or whether through a person, or even in our own mind, there are spirits at work. And we now have understanding of it because that tree, that fruit has been eaten. We have knowledge of the good and evil. We have choice. We just now have to make that right choice and want to see it, to be able to catch it. The law is spiritual, so it's the dividing sword to show us what side we are on in thought, in inclination, in speech and action. Can you read Romans chapter 7, verse 14, please? Well, we know that the law is spiritual. That's right. It came from the spirit. The father of spirits, actually. It's spiritual because it's the truth, according to Psalms 119, verse 142. And this truth has power because it emanates from the source of light and life embodied for us in Yahche Christ the word of life and the light. Can you read Hebrews 4 and 12, please? For the word of Allah is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. If we find any spiritual wickedness within us, the laws and testimonies found in the word of Allah can divide our souls asunder from these familiar spirits to see them for what they are, not being blinded by our feelings. And he said the word is quick. I want to get the definition for that word quick. The word quick means to live, figure, literally or figuratively, life, lively, quick. So confirming that the law is spiritual, the law is alive. It's a quickening spirit. Yes. It's Yache. He is the word. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's living. It's spiritual to war against the spirits within our minds. It has effect. But we, you mentioned how we actually have to trust it and believe it. Hmm. Can't believe in him without believing in the word as he is the word. All right. You actually have to believe on the law to believe on him. Because he's the one that gave the law. Yeah. <laughs> he said, if any man do his will, the father's will, he shall know the doctrine. We need to do the commandments. Investigate the truth concerning the deity. Right. Put it into practice. And our faith will increase, our belief will increase, because the living law will bring us to life again, bring us back to our maker. Instead of being dead in our sins. Okay. Let's continue seeing what the word of Allah does, please. And continue in Hebrews 4 and 12. And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
The word also helps discern our thoughts and intents of our heart to see if any spiritual wickedness has place in them, not being blinded by passions to give them place. So we, we all know from the past lesson in here, a lot of harping on getting out of passion, getting out of emotions. We need something that's alive and able to help us get to life. We need the law to keep us balanced knowing that, okay, this is the way. There's no other way besides this way. We can't turn to the right hand or the left. Then we'll be able to come out of the darkness from the beginning. Elohim literally discerns our thoughts and intents by his own words. So the more we do so ourselves, seeking out his judgments, the more spiritually connected with him we become. As he said, he has respect unto the lowly, as submitting to the law makes us humble. And we will be drawn away from the rulers of darkness and the spiritual wickedness unto disobedience in this world if we do so. Today we are getting more understanding of this spiritual warfare we're in, and thankfully so, as the world, the spirits of it, and its ways are blinding us from finding the kingdom of Christ. Can you read the Gospel of Thomas, chapter 27, please? Verse 1. Yache said, If ye do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. This means to find the kingdom, a righteous fast, by not giving place to any of the spirits of the world to purge our souls is needed. But why does it take all that to find it? Can you read Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, please? And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of Elohim should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of Elohim cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of Elohim is within you. The kingdom won't come by observing the world, observing everyone else and what they're doing and what's going on in the world. It actually takes us all putting in our hands to the plow to overcome ourselves. Because it's actually within ourselves that we have to examine ourselves with spiritual eyes of the truth in the law to see the spirits that are not good for us at work in us and fast from them by not doing their works, so the kingdom of Christ can come. The Lord explains an acceptable fast, so we can fast from the world. In Hermas Parable 5, chapter 1, verse 3, 4, and 5, please. I would teach thee what is a complete fast and acceptable to the Lord. Listen, saith he. Elohim desireth not such a vain fast, for by so fasting unto Elohim thou shalt do nothing for righteousness. He doesn't desire us not to eat or drink unless it's the day of atonement wherein it's righteous to do so. Continue, please. But fast thou unto Elohim such a fast as this. Do no wickedness in thy life. And serve the Lord with a pure heart. Observe his commandments and walk in his ordinances. And let no evil desire rise up in thy heart. But believe Elohim. That encompasses believing in him for a reference of examining our faith by our works. And remember from the last lesson where Zachwab talked about we have to catch it in our mind. We got to be attentive to our mind to make sure it doesn't come into our heart i don't know about you all but that takes focus and temperance and really paying attention okay. continue please then if thou shalt do these things and fear him and control thyself from every evil deed thou shalt live unto Elohim. man as Zach will mention in the last lesson, it takes attention to self and the energy we are in. 
not being caught up in what others have going on or judging others to look at what they have going on or being focused on what they're doing, but really self-aware, being very self-aware and honest. Because to be self-aware, I can know how I feel, but I can still not be honest about how I'm feeling. Like this isn't right as a right. calling it out for what it is instead of justifying it. Like, yeah, I feel upset, but yeah, they're doing this or something like that. Continue, please. Then if thou shalt do these things and fear him and control thyself from every evil deed, thou shalt live unto him. So we have the first part. We got the perspective on believing him to make sure what believing him actually is doing no wickedness in our lives, serving him with a pure heart, observe his commandments, walk in his ordinance and let no evil desire arise in our heart. Here we also get perspective of actually fearing him. We actually have to do those things and be attentive. So faith and fear are in those works and it's show our fear is shown by our self-control. The more you see you're growing in control of your emotions and paying attention to your thoughts and getting out of them and being temperate, focusing on the law, you have your your barometer to know, okay, faith is going the right way, fear is going the right way, okay? The anger lesson is a great resource to help understand how controlling ourselves from getting into our feelings and getting into any evil deed is essential. Continue, please. And if thou do these things, thou shalt accomplish a great fast, and one acceptable to Allah. Hayyam. So let's fast from the wickedness of the world and from the world within ourselves, according to the Lord's command, so that we can find the kingdom. <sighs> We now have understanding on finding the kingdom. Let's understand the world some more. Unfortunately, the pride of life in the world is not about looking within, but rather acting like we're better in a sense of superiority or self-importance, observing others to uplift ourselves rather than humbling ourselves to look within ourselves by the law. This pride is prophesied to be at work in these times. Can you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, please? This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. Notice all those things had to do with pride. <laughs> right. The definition for proud is 5244, appearing above others conspicuous, that is, figuratively, haughty, proud. Conspicuous is standing out as to be clearly visible. We can see what pride desires to be set apart, to be above, to be different from everyone else. To be seen. Yes, sir. It's not Always bashful. feeling like you're... Like always feeling like you, you need to be seen or you need to be heard. Yeah. Got to catch that thing, man. It's a work in like whether being loud and trying to have all the jokes and be funny and be the, you know, the life of the party or seem to have all the understanding. You know, if somebody says something to have to have something else to go with it or to one up it, a one upper. Wow. These things got to watch them. You can see it in the clothes that you pick out. Just that simple. Some of the clothes you pick out may stand out so much that you can see the concupiscence. Yeah. It's very evident once you understand pride. It's flamboyant. Why is she? <laughs> Their definition, showing oneself above others, overtopping, conspicuous above others, preeminent, with an overweening estimate of one's own means or merits, 
despising others or even treating them with contempt. So there's the hatred at work in pride as the devil's heart being lifted up led to hostility. We will touch on it in this lesson eventually. So in pride, the excessive confidence of my own ability or good qualities or deeds I've done is pride. And it lifts me up against Allah and men to hate them both in word and deed in how I treat both. All this makes me haughty. Haughty means to be arrogantly superior and disdainful. And disdain means showing contempt or lack of respect. So I can't show respect unto Allah and man in the spirits of pride. Contempt is an attitude towards others that brings to mind a sense of superiority and the right to judge amid feelings of disgust and anger. Disgust is a feeling of revulsion or strong disapproval aroused by something unpleasant or offensive. Okay. We got all the big words out now in layman's terms. So pride, when it's in play to get me haughty, it brings to mind a sense of being better than others through my feelings of being vexed at something they're doing unto some vexation that leads either unto hatred or anger for something I don't find pleasing or it's offensive to me, like I am a Allah am to judge such things. And in my emotion, the pride gives me the sense of the right to judge them, censoring their life harshly. And pride knows what it's doing as all that just makes me feel superior to them, not having respect for them, which will be shown in how I interact with them or my lack of interaction with them. And it keeps me from looking at myself to find the kingdom by seeing my own weaknesses and opens me up to the very spirits I didn't have compassion on another for, like it befell Judah, the patriarch who was attacked by jealousy and fornication for not having compassion on his own brother's fall to those spirits. So pride is tough, leading to self-exaltation as if I am Allah am to judge others with the intent of getting me entangled in other spirits through the lack of compassion because my heart isn't truly as Allah am's in mercy, though I've taken it upon myself to critique the life of another insensitively not being long-suffering and understanding because that takes humility. Thankfully, in the mind where it all started, the law of Christ helps me to withstand the evil, remembering, judge not that I be not judged, and be merciful as my Father is merciful. When I can stay out of my feelings to hear the words of righteousness and not be led astray, I can actually stand in the faith. I have to be attentive to what I give heed to as it sows into me and I see the fruits of whatever I'm entertaining in my life. Can you read Levi chapter 13, verse 6 and 7, please? And sow good things in your souls that ye may find them in your life. Is that simple in this life? Continue, please. But if ye sow evil things, you shall reap every trouble and affliction. That's the dichotomy of being in pride or humility. And our lives show what we have going on. Continue, please. Get wisdom in the fear of Allah with diligence. The wisdom of the wise not can take away. Focusing on that one good thing through keeping the law can't be taken away. Continue, please. Save the blindness of unholiness and the callousness that cometh of sin. My own blindness hearkening to idols in my mind and fulfilling the sins of my lust makes me unable to see people in love, esteem them better than me, and be sensitive to their struggles out of the callousness that my own sins have aroused in me to cause me by pride to feel superior 
And if I'm sinning, the only way it can continue to keep me feeling superior instead of seeing my own issues is to look at everyone else insensitively so I can feel more righteous than them. Much like the Pharisee who made his prayer justifying himself. Do you mind if we read that? Not the Pharisee? Um, Not at all. It is in here. So pride is into itself to see everything as about myself, justify myself, even when it comes to the gospel. So that means if I did something wrong in pride, I'm going to go look at what somebody else is doing to feel better about it or to ignore what I'm doing just to look at what they're doing, whether I'm lying to myself to act like I really care about what they're doing and I want to help or to look down upon them. It's all a distraction from my own iniquity to deal with what I have going on. And I'm lifted up in it as the Pharisee here in Luke 18 and 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. Allah, I I thank thee that I am not as other men are. You see the lifting up already. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, Allah, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell thee, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So you can see the Pharisee's prayer. It was all about what everyone else is doing wrong and what he's doing right. There's no, like, let me just focus on all I'm doing. In pride, the good that I'm doing, I'm going to take it in itself, please. And remember, there's a deep pleasure in my own merits and means and my abilities. So, like, yeah, I'm doing that right. But the things I do wrong, I'm not going to pay attention to that. Oh, I'll know it's there, but I'm going to avoid having to actually deal with that because then that takes humility. And it's easier to get distracted from doing that by seeing what everybody else is doing. You have one man, if I'm not mistaken, so he's praying within himself. This is inner thoughts, and he's glorying in himself. Whereas the other man, the publican, he's down considering his own deeds and speaking on himself, not even paying heed to what's going on around him. And he was actually justified. Was there anything you wanted to? Okay. And for us to know why we're on it, our glory isn't supposed to be in ourselves. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, it says, Thus saith Ahiah, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. So Allah gives understanding. It's not for me to take as it's something about me. We're going to get to how pride is. It's conceited. It's selfish. Everything turns into being like, man, man, why me? Like, it's always something to make it me. And I'm so important. Allah must really love me. Da, 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 da. Just to make it self-absorbed. It's self-centered. Yes. Sir. Like, it's self-centered. Everything is, it's about you. If you do something well for somebody, you did it for you. You didn't do it just to do it for them. You did it because of the merit that you received from doing it. Right. Like everything is for you. That's why the pride, it takes you away from Malahayim because everything is for your glory and not the glory of Malahayim. Are you finished? Yes. Okay, thanks.
Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. So there again, ability. Glorying in it. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. We know covetousness, the love of money is in lust. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am Ahaya, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. In these things I delight, say the Haya. So I'm an unprofitable servant doing that which was my duty to do. The joy is just, hey, I know Allah I am. I know Everything he's merciful. From him. Everything coming from him. Yeah. Like. Everything is for his glory. Everything that he does for us, it's for his glory. Everything that he gives us is so that we're able to do what we need to do for him. If we have that mindset that everything is for us, then we're walking in the law of the devil. I see if I'm seeing it here to glory that I know him, that he exercises loving kindness. I can't know that unless I know what I've been in and what he's brought me out of. If I'm still, this brings the opportunity to discuss the briars. <laughs> if the briars is my iniquity. When I'm in it, I'm comfortable. I'm sitting in briars. I'm getting pricked, but I've been here so long. It's life. It's peace. I'm being played, but it's peace to me. This is what I'm used to. You're surrounded by briars so that everybody can understand what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. Okay. So it's a person that's surrounded by briars, and they're inside of the briars. So everybody can get a picture of what Kato was talking about. Thank you. For me to be able to see that Ahaya exercises loving kindness, I actually have to come out of the briars to see clearly what he brought me out of, to see like that really was loving kindness. That was mercy to bring me out from that. If I'm, and I, because I, I can't get out briars on my own. If I'm trying to get out on my own, I can't see. I've been in here for so long. Where do I go? How do I get out when I'm covered in it? I need a guide. I need help. Well, you didn't you didn't understand you were in the briars until you actually realized it and tried to move and got pricked. Yeah. It wasn't until you actually got pricked that you knew something was wrong with where you were. Yeah. I try to move. Ah, I'm getting hit. This hurts. You the 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 pricks of the briars are my iniquities being shown to me. I'm seeing them. Ow. This is who I really am. I have a choice to sit right back down in the briars and not deal with it because I don't want these things to be. I didn't want to be this person that I am. I thought I was somebody else because I've been in my own perception. Now, if I don't want to be this person, I, I try to break through these briars myself. These things are tearing me up. It's weighing me down. The guilty conscience weighing on me, wearing me. I can't do it. I start doubting. I start thinking it's difficult. I start thinking no man can do it. I'm by myself. In my mind. But we have Yache. But the word. A, a dividing sword. I have to actually trust that this man can get me out of it. 
as the a sword cuts, he's going to cut the briars. When he exposes them, he cuts them. He's opening a path for me. I, I got pricked. Hey, his briars there. He cuts it. Shows this is the dividing sword. This is the word of the Lord to get past this. I have to trust that. To go through that process. Or else if I trust in myself and don't want a fault to be revealed, as soon as I get cut, I'm going to get out of the way. Like, no, I'm going back where I was. But if I trust, like, hey, you're guiding me, I trust you're going to get me out of this. I can take the cuts. My hand is being held. I'm being protected. Well, the interesting part, too, piggybacking off what you said, Yachi is the dividing sword. He cuts a path, all right? He cuts a path for you to get through. So that's just the same as him telling you what you need to do in order to come out of something. And your responsibility is actually implementing or doing what he said to do to come out of it. And that keeps you on the straight and narrow path so that, A, you don't go to the left or right and get cut again or get cut by the pricks, and B, you don't fall backwards, back into your iniquity to have to start over again. All right? So that's the only way we get cut is if when he cuts that way and he shows us our iniquity and he says, hey, this is what you need to do. You need to do this, 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 and this to come out of it. The only way we get cut after that it's because we're not doing what he commanded us to do. Right. If I go any other direction other than the path that he showed me, I'm going to get injured. Right. <laughs> that puts it in perspective how I can get cut again. Mm -hmm. And it takes faith to keep going after a cut and honesty like hey i'm sorry i went out of the way i right. apologize in truth yeah i apologize i went out of the path that's why cut. that's why david was did so well because david straightway repented when he did something wrong he didn't justify it he didn't make an excuse he said as soon as it was revealed to him i'm sorry Allah, i am i sinned and he turned from his sin and didn't continue in it or go into sorrow. Like that's what really made David walk so well because he didn't, he didn't just give off into it. Right. While we on that perspective, I want to catch it while it's hot and find this thing. Well, it's that's interesting because right. what you got right here, it says in 2 Peter 2 and 10, it says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. That's what will make you keep getting pricked. Even after Elohim shows you the way to come out of it. It's that pride that actually makes you keep getting pricked. Yes. Why isn't of its lust is the only way to depart? It's the root of all evils. And I have to be honest about that. If I avoid accountability, I can't get back on a path. Right. If you avoid accountability, you're falling backwards. And you're going back into that comfortable place of where you were. Yeah. Although, and then that, that just shows you more where you are because once a path gets cut, it's cut for some time. It takes a while for the bush to grow back together. So if you fall back, that path is still there. You're just choosing not to go through it. So then it becomes a choice. 
because you know you learn the difference between right and wrong good and evil you know what you need to do he told you what you need to do so that you can follow the path but if you fall back and start making excuses or justifying what you did and you sit back in that iniquity then you're making a choice not to go forward and that's how you end up falling into presumptuous sin yes sir and then when alahayam when that time passes and that bush comes back together and you're right back where you started he gives you over to it you become presumptuous A lot of emotions. I found in examining my whole life and experiences, if I get pricked once and I fall back and don't keep going forward, it showed that my heart wasn't all the way in it in the first place. Because I didn't want to go through anything. I didn't want to feel anything in the process. I just wanted it to just, you cut that path, let me just slide on through and keep everything out of my way. Let there be no challenges so that I can just feel like I did it. I'm here. As opposed to being willing, like, I'm going to go through whatever it takes to attain unto this. Well, the prideful person would want a miracle so that they don't have to put in any work. That's what I did. It definitely worked in me. I just wanted it to happen. Right. But fair of how I looked at that, because pride doesn't like to look bad or look like it's it's not above or not better than others. It's a vain show. Or being vulnerable. But pride likes to seem like we got it all together. Great precept for confirmation of the process we have to go through of coming out these thorns, which are coming out of our transgressions. In Barnabas chapter 7, shout out Brother Michael Alheim, praise him for giving you this precept for this lesson today. Barnabas 7 and 11, but what meaneth it that they place the wool in the midst of thorns it is a type of Yache set forth for the church. So this is speaking of what happens on the Day of Atonement with the goat and all that, the two goats, they take no hyssop and they put it in thorns. And it's explaining what Barnabas is telling here. It is a type of Yache set forth for the church. Since whoever should desire to take away the scarlet wool, it behooved him to suffer many things owing to the terrible nature of the thorn and through affliction to win the mastery over it. If it could help me if I'm mistaken, Zach, he actually is showing through what he had them do that, yes, he opens the way, he cuts the path, but we're coming out of our weaknesses, so it's a part of the process that they're going to be learning experiences, and I have to be willing to go through that affliction to get it right, to end up walking straightly in his path without being afflicted anymore once I overcome the weaknesses I had that were deterring me from staying right on and straight on. That's what's making you go to the left and the right, but it's your own desires that cause you to go off. So that's the weaknesses. And showing his compassion. Thus he saith, they that desire to see me and to attain unto my kingdom must lay hold on me through tribulation and affliction. So there's no other way. We have to go through it. And we have to have the humility to go through it. And in light of that, knowing that getting pricked by the thorn is from me doing something according to my own will, some pleasure that gave pride place to lead me out of the way of that Yache paid for me through his word. 
there's the right way to keep going forward in that affliction rather than getting pricked and sitting still and staying where I'm at or getting pricked and falling back and going all the way backwards to the point where I sit where I'm at to the point where the cold closes up because I didn't keep pressing. What to do as we fall in this plowing? Yeah. To go through the way that's cut, a proud person can't go through that because a proud person can't take that they made a mistake or can't take that they make mistakes. So to go through the way that's cut, a proud person will have a hard time getting through it because they can't go to the left and the right. Because when you go to the left and the right, you have to admit that you made a mistake. Yeah. That's the only way you can get back on the path. So it makes it very hard for walking in pride and trying to walk in that straight and narrow way when you don't want to accept your faults in the first place. And if I want some lead room to fulfill my desires. So you can see, you can see the dichotomy that it actually takes humility to get through the process, to get through it. Whereas the, the spirit of pride doesn't give le leeway for you to get through a process. Like you actually have to go through the process of humbling yourself in order to make it out of it. Well, the humble mindset, how does the humble approach this process? In Asher chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Therefore, if the soul take pleasure in the good inclination, all its actions are in righteousness. And if it sin, it straightway repenteth. For having its thoughts set upon righteousness, and casting away wickedness, it straightway overthroweth the evil and uprooteth the sin. So the quicker we can come to repentance for error, you know you're growing in righteousness and humility. When there's no entertaining, uh, trying to get out of it, trying to justify it, trying to avoid it, but calling the spade a spade, like I did that, cast that wickedness away by calling it out and keep pressing forward because our thoughts actually set up on righteousness. Now, if that evil inclination is still with us, the spiritual fornication blinding our inclination from actually going to the good inclination, we would be as this, in verse 8, it says, But if it incline to the evil inclination, all its actions are in wickedness. So this is where pride, remember pride is said is as a bird in a cage. It's just fighting to get free. Instead of walking straight through that path that Yache made, pride is hitting every bride there is because it does not want to be in any constriction. It wants freedom to live in luxury pleasure so all its actions are in wickedness and it driveth away the good and cleaveth to the evil and is ruled by Belier and Jack will chime in if you will on the other spectrum if you're driving away the good by resisting seeing your faults because you don't want it to be or you're unwilling to assess what you did, being hasty to cast off the thought about whether it was right or not. So you don't have to deal with yourself. Or you're looking for every reason why you did what you did and it was right in your own thoughts. But won't look in the law to assess objectively or speak with your counselor that keep the commandments to help assess it objectively. It's a sign that Belia is ruling us by an evil spirit to stay in wicked actions 
and to keep from the good works of confessing our faults and taking accountability to forsake the error. It goes on to say, even though it work what is good, it perverteth it to evil. If you don't deal with the first error to speak truth, you'll go on with your day, but eventually you will turn your action into evil because you didn't cast out that evil spirit by confessing your fault and taking accountability to destroy the evil work. So eventually you'll catch up. And then pride is lustful. So we'll turn the good into our evil for ourselves because we'll try to get some out of it for ourselves. It goes on to say, for whenever it beginneth, oh, why didn't I let the scripture finish? <laughs> it says, for whenever it beginneth to do good, he forceth the issue of the action into evil for him. You see exactly what spirits at work, self-will and self-pleasing and arrogance to force things to be as we want them to be. It goes on to say, seeing that the treasure of the inclination is filled with an evil spirit. Thus, we have a spirit of pride leading us in our inclination to sin. And now we have a dichotomy of righteousness to self-assess and be attentive and quick to repent or self-will and arrogance to stay where we are or ignore dealing with where we are or avoiding being accountable for where we are to continue in our sins. You got anything, Zach, well, before we... No, I'm good. Okay. Getting back to despising a government. To be proud. The English definition is having or showing a high or excessively high opinion of oneself or one's own importance. This sense of superiority isn't only against our fellow man, unfortunately. We are going to see it's also against our maker and his order. Can you read Second Peter chapter 2, verse 10, please? But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, and despise government. Understand, walking in the lust of the flesh shows a despising of Alahayim's government. Continue, please. Presumptuous are they. Presumptuous is G5113. It means a daring man or a audacious man. Presumptuous. Audacious means showing an impudent lack of respect. So there we see lack of respect for Allah Hayyam and his law. Audacious also means showing a willingness to take surprisingly bold risk. So that's willing to take bold risks against Allah Hayyam and his law to fulfill a desire of our own. It's surprisingly bold when we consider the severity of the action because death is the reward. Yet, the devil has made us to feel secure from Allah Hayyam's judgment in the beginning, as we saw what he spake through Eve. And he continues to teach us such things to this day to help us take bold risks against Allah Hayyam by sinning. Now, the definition of presumptuous is of a person or their behavior. It's failing to observe the limits of what is permitted or appropriate. Now, why would a person fail to observe the limits of what is permitted and appropriate to Allah Hayyam in his law, aside from the doctrine of the devil to think we are secure? What could cause us to do that? Can you continue reading, please? Self-willed. I know it was small. I know it. <laughs> Self-willed. That's the spirit that enables us to walk after our desires without fear and helps us fail to observe the limits of what is permitted and appropriate to Allah Hayyam in his law. 
So we got to understand this spirit. G829, it means self-pleasing, that is arrogant, self-willed. The definition of arrogant is having or revealing an exaggerated sense of one's own importance or abilities. And the definition of self-willed is obstinately doing what one wants in spite of the wishes or orders of others. So, understand that if I'm focused on pleasing myself instead of Allah Hayyam, I'm arrogant because I have an exaggerated sense of my own importance in that vain glory in myself to do what pleases me over pleasing him. And I'm going to do what I want to do in spite of Allah Hayyam's wishes or orders to keep his commands. The evidence of my self-will toward Allah Hayyam is shown in my self-will toward those who believe in him and keep his commandments as well, wherein I won't listen to them or take heed to words of holiness unless it pleases me or is in line with what I want, just as Israel did unto Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. This is an easy spirit to fall into because... It can get us to serve his will in different ways, as it is self-pleasing. It can be either by thinking, I'm so important to Allah Hayyam, he'll have mercy on me no matter what I do. So when I do what pleases me, he will understand because he knows my heart and that I still love him though I'm doing what I want to do. Or, I am not putting in the work to overcome my desire and or the pleasure in my sin, but it's okay because he knows my heart and will have compassion on me because it's just something I'm weak in. Then there's the exaggerated sense of ability, wherein I think or my actions show that I feel that I am able to govern my own life and I have everything I need in me to be a good person and I understand what a good person is for myself as the Lord gave us all the ability to know right from wrong. So I know right from wrong, and I can tell by how I feel in my heart, because he knows my heart. So we can get overtaken in different ways through the subtlety of the angel of self-indulgence and deceit. But all in all, to simplify it, if I find I'm doing what's pleasing to me, but it's not lawful according to the law and the fruits of the spirit that come from the law, Self-will is at work making me arrogant against Allah Hayyam, wherein fornication is the teacher of that arrogance. And the spirit of hatred makes me love the arrogance to stay right in the pleasure of my desires, hating Allah Hayyam and his law, fornicating in spirit against him by the idols I'm serving to do what pleases me. So, if you find you struggle to keep the law and the fruits of the spirit, start searching out yourself and get counsel for insight to know how self-will through your pleasures unknowingly is causing you to be arrogant against Allah Hayyam. May we all take these things into consideration and examine ourselves. Let's see what else self-will does. Please, Zach. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So, if I'm into what pleases me, whether I don't believe there is an Allah Hayyam, I should obey, or I believe in him but feel he thinks so much of me, he just understands how I feel and will be at peace with what I feel because he loves me that much. Or I believe in him that he has given me the ability to know right for myself and knows my heart that when I do something wrong, it wasn't what I meant to do in my heart, because my heart is actually good, though I did the wrong thing. It's easy for me not to be afraid to speak evil of his authority and government outlined in his commandments, since I have an exaggerated sense of importance or ability to think I'm not doing anything wrong. This thought process is wrong. Can you read Sirach at the 4 verse 25 and 26, please? In no wise speak against the truth, 
but be abashed of the error of thine ignorance. Be not ashamed to confess thy sins, and force not the course of the river. I have seen my error through my pleasures, and confess I have done foolishly, lest I continue to go through the punishments I have had all my life. I had to come out of the vain glory to esteem Allah better than me, and his law righteous, not my heart, and how I feel as my feelings led to what pleases me, not him. Can you read Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, please? Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. In humility, when I can stay out of my feelings to be in humility, I see he, Yache, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Virgins are better than me, and my own righteousness developed through what pleases me. Vainglory is self-conceit, which is excessive pride in oneself. And being self-centered like this thinking I'm superior to others keeps me from having unity in the same mind with Yache himself and those in the faith of Yache because I want to be better than others and want him to give me what I want, just like the devil thinking I'm better than others. But in humility, staying out of my feelings and desires, I'm not eager or hasty to covet, and I can see others as better than me to avoid the desire and sense of superiority. And I'll see Yache's ways as better than my own ways to stop provoking him by turning from him in his law and his admonitions. Can you read Romans chapter 12, verse 16, please? Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. To be like-minded, we have to have humility because only by pride comes contention to keep us from being in agreement with each other, as Proverbs 13 and 10 shows. Continue, please. Be not wise in your own conceits. Okay. If the law, testimonies, and fruits of the Spirit cannot bring us into the same mind to agree, only by pride is that contention. And we know pride is evident by us getting in our feelings, which clouds us from the ability to draw near to Allah Hayyam and his law by the spiritual fornication and lust that comes into play when vexation arises in our hearts. So a sign of the need for growth in humility and temperance in emotions to be of the same mind is walking according to our own thoughts as wisdom. If we catch ourselves in vexation, are caught up in our mind, thinking for ourselves, disputing in our minds, remembering this admonition here, not to be wise in our own conceits, but to condescend to men of low estate and to seek the judgments of the Lord in his law and testimonies to keep our soul from the darkness of this world, to give our minds peace, to be at rest with no pride, to bring contention between us or with Allah Hayyam, is helpful for us. Unfortunately, many did not overcome their own thoughts from the spirits of the world and have died in their pride through lust and regret it. Let's see what Paul saw in the spirit world concerning the dead to get their perspective on the pride of this life in this world we live in. Can you read the Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 45, please? And after these things... I saw the son of Elohim descending from heaven, and a diadem was on his head. And seeing him, those who were placed in punishment exclaimed all with one voice, saying, Have pity, son of the high Elohim. Thou art he who showeth refreshment for all in heavens and on earth, and on us likewise have pity. For since we have seen thee, we have refreshment. And a voice went out from the son of Elohim, through all the punishment, saying, And what work have ye done that ye demand refreshment from me? Even in the afterlife, our works are required of us, as faith without works is dead, like the apostles teach. 
Hence, we truly have to believe, Allah Hayyam, by our actions in that righteous fast we spoke about. Continue, please. My blood was poured out for your sakes, and not even so did ye repent. For your sakes, I wore the crown of thorns on my head. For you, I received buffets on my cheeks, and not even so did ye repent. I asked water when hanging on the cross, and they gave me vinegar mixed with gall. With a spear, they opened my right side. For my name's sake, they slew my prophets and just men. And in all things, I gave you a place of repentance, and you were not. Now, however, for the sake of Michael, the archangel of my covenant, and the angels who are with him, and because of Paul, the well-beloved, whom I would not vex, for the sake of your brethren who are in the world and offer oblations, and for the sake of your sons, because my precepts are in them. The son of Allah Hayyam appreciates those who keep his precepts. Continue, please. And more for the sake of my own kindness. On the day on which I rose from the dead, I gave to you all who are in punishment a night and a day of refreshment forever. And they all cried out and said, We bless thee, son of Allah Hayyam. That thou hast given us a night and a day to respite. For better to us is the refreshment of one day above all the time of our life which we were on earth. And if we had plainly known that this was intended for those who sin, we would have worked no other work. We would have done no business. And we would have done no iniquity. You can see the lack of plainly believing punishments to come as the devil used that thing from the beginning that we would be secure from Allah I think there's no punishment to come for what we do when we plainly believe the testimonies and know what will be and strengthen us in that fear of Allah I to do no business contrary to Allah I'm's business and no iniquity Notice he said no business. You remember the angel of repentance spake of the different business affairs or the different business we get into, the worldly cares. And these worldly cares distracted these people that died from focusing and observing the law as we talked about in the last lesson. Yet also, what spirit hindered them from plainly understanding and staying away from iniquity? Can you continue, please? What need had we for pride in the world? So now we confirm pride of life was the source of it all, just as we formerly learned the self-will and arrogance that played into getting into anger and sorrow to distract us from faith and the law in the prior lesson. Can you read Second Baruch chapter 48, verse 40, please? Because each of the inhabitants of the earth knew when he was transgressing. But my law they knew not by reason of their pride. Precepts give us understanding. Pride is that serious of a spirit that is the reason we don't know the law. Though we know we are transgressing. Pride keeps us from knowing the law because in the commandments is humility and long suffering. And nothing about pride. Nonetheless, when we sin, we know in our conscience that we aren't doing right, as a higher witness that we know when we're transgressing. So though a man may not tell others, our hearts weigh on us. And in some cases, Allah shows us our faults in our dreams to turn us from our own purposes and pride as we talked about in the last lesson. And also, we'll see it by the punishments we're experiencing though we are portraying to men like everything as well. The conscience knows the law, though we don't search it out ourselves, and it presses down upon us because our works are written upon our hearts, making us feel the guilt when we aren't doing right. Can you read Judah chapter 19, verse 1 to 4, it looks like? Or 1 to 5, actually. Sorry. 
I'm talking about that. Testament of Judah 19 and 1. Know therefore, my children, that two spirits wait upon man, the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. And in the midst is the spirit of understanding of the mind, to which it belongeth to turn whithersoever it will. So we have the mind to choose what we do in everything. The power of choice is ours, starting in our mind. I hope everything from the last session is really bringing it together. Because remember, Zach, I talked about we got to catch it in our mind. Our minds is where the, the, like the playing field to catch it before it turns into a problem. Okay. Continue, please. And the works of truth and the works of deceit are written upon the hearts of men. So whatever we give into in our mind is written for a record on our heart of what we choose to do daily. It enters into your heart. Yeah. And each one of them the Lord knoweth. And there is no time at which the works of men can be hid. For on the heart itself have they been written down before the Lord. Even John, another Judah, he talks about that. If our heart condemn us not, what is it, conscience? First John. Mm -hmm. John 3 and 20. But if our heart condemn us, Allah is greater than our heart. And knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward Allah. Hayyam. So let's not ignore those sensations. If we know we feel, well, I know I don't feel right, that didn't feel right. When you feel that burning accusation, take the time and find out what it was if you don't know what it was and acknowledge it. So that you can hopefully get that blotted out by confession and forsaking it. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward Allah Hayyam. So we got Allah Hayyam right there all day long, <laughs> right in the heart, letting us know <laughs> he sees everything. All right. So thus is better for us to have the Lord in mind at all times, seeing as though nothing of our heart is hid from him nonetheless. Can you continue verse 5, please? And the spirit of truth testify of all things and accuse of all. So it's the spirit of truth right there accusing us, seeing our works on our heart. Continue, please. And the sinner is burnt up by his own heart and cannot raise his face to the judge. Okay. If any one of you have been doing self-assessment, you know this feeling. The guilty conscience pressing down upon us in sorrow and the pride of not stopping to come to know the law has caused the death of many. And unfortunately, some only realize after death that the pride of the world held no power in the spirit world to have overcome it beforehand. Can you read Apocalypse of Paul back in 45, please? What need had we for pride in the world? For here our pride is crushed, which ascended from our mouth against our neighbor. Our plagues and excessive straightness and the tears and the worms which are under us. These are much worse to us than the pains which we have left behind us. So I had the opportunity in life when our heart was burning us up to take accountability and confess the fault instead of going into sorrow and not wanting it to be. But instead, in our pride, it said, Here our pride is crushed, which ascended from our mouth against our neighbor. In our pride, we wouldn't take accountability for anything. It was somebody else's fault. 
We're casting the blame on them. Yet, it had no place in the afterlife. No one is the excuse for why we sin in the afterlife. We're accountable for what we do. As we have choice, we have the power to choose, and we have our mind in the midst of the spirit of deceit and truth to choose what we're inclined unto. And we get the example from these people that had already died, seeing that that pride of not taking accountability did nothing for them. Even though they weren't taking accountability, they were still going through it in their life for their sins. Because he said, the pains and the torments that they were dealing with in the afterlife, it says, these are much worse to us than the pains which we have left behind us. So life wasn't great for them either. See that pride in life also caused pain in their life while they lived, and yet they did not leave off from it. Hence, some folks have really tough lives, but pride doesn't give a person place to seek the only way out in Christ, to leave off from the works that's causing the pains. The pains of spiritual fornication in this life are such as these. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 verse 22, please? Moreover, this was not enough for them, that they erred in the knowledge of Allah but whereas they lived in the great war of ignorance. That's the war of the mind against Allah and his law through our feelings and emotions that stir up confusion within us to the point of sinning ignorantly because we are in darkness walking in the day because of the spiritual fornication in spirits like envy and hatred vexation unto wrath, lying, and anger to blind our minds, our inclinations, and our understanding. Continue, please. Those so great plagues called they peace. That's where people are struggling within, plagued with spiritual warfare in the mind and in our surroundings, but are ignorant of the war going on in this life. So we see things as peaceful as is the norm here. But, we have to consider, do we truly have peace within? What's keeping us from being honest with ourselves? We're vexed, we're anxious, we're frustrated about things. And once we get into those feelings, wrath with lying causes us not to be honest. And if we are honest, the confusion of it all hinders us from seeing the light of Christ as the true only way out. We have to see that he's the only way. There's even some of the believers in Hermas. It talks about how they the double mind. I think, Zach, why well, are you going to talk about that at some point, right? Thinking there's another way? You're going to talk about it. Okay. Well, we will revisit <laughs> that. We will come back to this later where the pride leads us to think that has, there's another way. Because the way of Yache seems hard when in pride. And Zach, well, spake on how... Pride can't come out of the thorns. It takes humility. Okay. Let's see what this great ignorance and untrue sense of peace in this world through serving other spirits besides the true Allah looks like in everyday life from ancient times unto this day. Can you pick up in Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14 verse 23? We're going to go up to verse... Twenty nine. Right. Wisdom of Solomon chapter fourteen verse twenty three. For while as they slew their children in sacrifices, or used secret ceremonies, or made revelings of strange rites. That right there is. Outright devil worship that's happening to this day in secret. Continue, please. I don't want to call it secret anymore. Is it really out? out? Yeah, it's coming out. Oh, wow. Things must come to pass. They kept neither lives nor marriages any longer undefiled, but either one slew another traitorously. Killing is still going on with ill intent. Continue, please. Or grieved him by adultery. 
adultery of the eyes looking at others' wives to lust after them, or a woman looking at a man that's not her husband to lust after him, and people actually in adultery in the flesh to sleep with someone else that's not their spouse is still common today. Continue, please. So that there reigned in all men without exception. Let's see what everyone has been experiencing from old time up to this day, serving idols. Continue, please. Blood, manslaughter, theft, and dissimulation. Dissimulation is the concealment of one's thoughts, feelings, or character. This is commonly known today that many people are not honest in how they feel, what they think, or are not operating in their true character when around others. Continue, please. Corruption. Corrupt governments being dishonest with the people and taking briberies for their own gain. Unfaithfulness. Whether in friendships, relationships, or even business partnerships, faithfulness and loyalty is not common in the world today, just as it was back then. All right? Tumults. Uprising of people in mass groups of protests. That's happening around the world. Perjury. There is dishonesty lying under oath, whether in court or in everyday life, where people say, I swear, or I promise, such and such, when they're saying it to convince a person to believe them, instead of just being honest, conveying the truth. All right. Yeah, that's huge here in Arab countries. Yeah. Disquieting of good men. When a person who lives right comes and speaks to correct a person doing wrong, they're met with reproach and shunned. Okay. Forgetfulness of good turns. So someone would do good towards someone, but then the person will forget what was done for them or to them and not remember the good deeds. Okay. The fouling of souls. The fouling of souls can be laying with your neighbor's wife that defiles your soul in Leviticus 18 and 20. Zachwab pointed these things out. Laying with beasts defiles the soul. Giving your seed to Moloch defiles the soul. That's um for the believers giving their children in marriage to unbelievers. And people literally sacrificing their children. All right. Changing of kind. Interestingly, the desire to change one's gender is an ancient spirit at work that is still prevalent today. Right? Disorder in marriages. Today's marriages in general is out of order according to the admonitions of the scriptures. Like husbands being bitter with their wives and not loving them or taking care of their own household. And women are the rulers of the men instead of their desires being unto their husbands to rule over them. Right? Adultery. Whether literally or spiritually, lusting after someone else who is not one's spouse or sleeping with them. All right? And shameless uncleanness. That's open marriages, fornication, and etc. As we know, if you're familiar with America, there's a lot of things going on out here as such. Continue, please. But either they are mad when they be married, or prophesy lies, or live unjustly, or else lightly forswear themselves. For in so much as their trust is in idols, which have no life, Though they swear falsely, yet they look not to be hurt. You see, when serving the devil and his law and his doctrine that we'll be secure before Allah Hayyam to do what we will, we wouldn't look to be hurt for doing what we want. We can live unjustly. We can prophesy lies, lightly forswear ourselves, knowing that nothing will happen to us. This is the doctrine of the devil. 
and his idols. The lack of reverence or fear of Allah Hayim is prevalent to speak without accountability. And from everything we discuss, has not everyone experienced at least one of these things or done some act akin to these things? Mm -hmm. Man, these are the fruits of the lust of pride in this life, hearkening to evil spirits. Continue in verse 27, please. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's truly spiritual warfare and powers of darkness out here, spiritual wickedness causing these things. If any of these works are found in us, we still have perfecting to do so that we can come out of idolatry to worship the true Allah. I am. Understand that it's spirits at work out here is not just flesh and blood doing things, but we are led by spirits to act in this world. Pride has no profit to us in this world to come as the dead witness. And it's true because there's nothing in the commandments concerning pride as well. Can we look at Hermas parable eight? Chapter seven, verse six, please. Life is for all those that keep the commandments of the Lord. Keep that in mind for focus, right? But in the commandments, there is nothing about first places or about glory of any kind. So no spirits of pride or desires of pride or works of pride are in the commandments. Hence, pride doesn't suffer us to know the law. And we need to come out of the works of pride in order to keep the law. Because the law is about, but about long suffering and humility in man. And such men, therefore, is the life of the Lord. The focus for any of us wanting to overcome pride is humility and long suffering, which will keep us from all the anger, wrath, lying, envy, hatred, and fornication, as well as we learned about in the prior lesson. Humility leads us to keep the commandments and long suffering is perfection of our faith as we learned in the last lesson. All right, continue, please. But in factious and lawless men is death. These types of men cause division, whether by thinking themselves better than others to stand apart or by contention in their pride when things aren't as they believe it should be in their own perspective. Then the lawless men are self-willed or self-pleasing, walking according to their own mind or own standard of righteousness because pride hinders them from knowing the law since it's humility and long-suffering contained in the commandments. So, touching on the factious men and women through pride unto death. Can you read Proverbs 13 and 10, please? Only by pride cometh contention. If you find you often get into conflict with folks or strife of some kind or contention or debate, even in common conversation, beware as pride is in the midst, though it may not be you per se. Yet examine yourself to be sure it's not at work in you because pride is the cause of contention in someone or both parties involved in the conflict. Right? Now, the lawless man unto death or woman. Can you read Matthew chapter 13 verse 19, please? When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. And catcheth the way that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. The devil used pride to catch away what was sown because humility wasn't there to take the time to understand it in an honest and good heart with patience, searching out the scriptures or asking for help objectively to ensure I have heard the whole matter out of a desire to know the truth. So this is where somebody says something, but I'm prideful. If it don't sound right to me, or it ain't what I already thought, 
I'm not going to understand it because it has to come from me. There's that sense of superiority or that sense of importance. Like I even would force that sense of importance onto Allah to think, nah, Allah will show it to me if that was the case. It has to be shown unto me, not understanding that the person's right there talking. <laughs> Allah is showing it unto me, but I can't see past myself. So the world will come, but I'm not going to understand it because why is it given to you and not me? Why didn't I understand not it? Not receive it. Right. Come back, come back. Say it again. You say, I, I'm not going to understand it. I said, no, receive it. Right. That's pride. It's, it's pride is all about the pride is like a mirror. <laughs> it's that's all it sees itself. So I wouldn't understand it. And then the devil's right there. He's going to catch it away. My mind is going to go off somewhere else. I'm going to remember, I'm going to be haughty and arrogant. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to be, that word is going to be contemptible to me. I'm going to resent it. I'm going to cast it off like, nah, that ain't it. Allah would have showed it to me if that was the case. That ain't what I understood when I studied. So nah, that can't be it. And then that's when the contention comes in. Yeah. Once they're not in agreement, the contention comes because that's when pride entered into their heart. They didn't cast forth the vexation. Yes, sir. Good thing you mentioned the vexation because it is vexing that in my superiority, like it's vexing. Why didn't I get it? Because I want to be the one that gives the information. Why wasn't it shown to me? That's the vexation process that leadeth to the pride. Yeah. It's tough. Even if I don't say something right there, you might not hear from me again because you said something I didn't want to hear. The devil took it away and I'm not coming back because you're against. <laughs> it's the words of holiness. So that's against where pride wants me to be. I got to keep away from you. You're trying to correct me. You're trying to tell me that what I believe isn't right. No, we, <laughs> unless I'm coming to argue with you, we don't need to be talking. So that pride is tough. It's going to lead to faction out of the self-will because it has to be pleasing to me. Now, if our mind was in the right space, if we were in humility, objectively, okay, huh, I haven't heard that before. You all remember in the book of Acts, those people, they heard from Paul, they went and searched the scriptures. They heard the whole matter. Like, hey, okay, I hear what you're saying. Help me understand it. What, where are the precepts for this? So I can see how it's aligned. Okay, let me pray about it. Let me ensure I'm on the right track. And if it's right, hey, man, thanks. And if it's not right, hey, I looked at it. Uh, we just have a difference of perspective. But that's, of course, if you can't get on the same page with the person. Of course, if you're somebody you can actually speak with because they're, it's mutual humility. Like, hey, I read what you talked about. I see that part you're saying. This precept here, what's, what's this one about? Is this aligning to it or is this helping add more to it? And then you will see <laughs> Allah is in the midst where there's humility and two people are seeking to actually be in agreement according to the law. And understanding the law is the law. The testimonies are the testimonies. They're going to stand. They're not confusing. They're not contradicting. It's just seeing them in truth. Okay, so that's understanding of a lawless man. It don't please me, so I'm not hearing it because it's my own law, what feels right to me and what I already know for myself. Okay, but a humble man is not about what I know for myself. And now we got perspective now knowing that what the devil led us onto with that knowledge of good and evil for ourselves. 
we know we have the internal choice of what's right to me or am I going to come out of myself and submit to what's right to Allah I am? And if I'm that man realizing that and seeking after that humility and long suffering and what's right to Allah I am, I'm going to do as follows. Can you read Sarat 33 and 3, please? A man of understanding trusteth in the law, and the law is faithful unto him as an oracle. That's the truth. We know when the law is alive. <laughs> we know when it's living. It's Yahweh. We trust it. I know I've got guidance from Yahweh. I went on to the oracle, my oracle, the oracles of my Alahayim, where I can inquire. So to have good understanding where the spirit may dwell in our thoughts, that's where our trust and our faith needs to be. As the just shall live by faith. If you find you get into your own mind or own thoughts about things and the law isn't enough for an answer as to what is right in any given situation, it's an attack of pride, as walking according to my own mind and heart is a symptom of pride. Can you read Sirach chapter 5, verse 2, please? Follow not thy own mind and thy strength to walk in the ways of thy heart. If my heart is leading me, I'm following my own mind and strength, trying to understand and take care of things myself. Okay? It's a difference where my heart is accusing me because I did something wrong. Okay. <laughs> so just so we don't continue. Uh, yeah, Sirach verse 3 and 24, please. For many are deceived by their own vain opinion. So I walked in my own strength and mind to walk in the ways of my heart. But it sets me up because many get deceived by opinion of their own instead of Allah Hayim's opinion in his law and testimonies. So I deceived myself by my opinion instead of letting the facts of the law be sufficient for me. Now let's see what overthrew my judgment to go by my own opinion rather than just trusting in the law. Continue, please. And an evil suspicion hath overthrown the judgment. An evil spirit lied to me to have some evil suspicion that something outside of the law was possibly true or right. But I didn't withstand it by seeking the judgment of Ahaya in the law for a peace of mind because I went according to how I felt in my heart without counsel from Allah Hayyam for assurance. It's pride that was testified that keeps us from knowing the law to seek. Judgment in any given situation from Ahaya, leading us to our own vain opinion to overthrow our judgment. We have to be mindful of this because the way pride works, it it's it's lawless to Allah Hayyam, but it actually has its own law and its own standard of righteousness. Um, and whatever it is, it's not a spirit from Allah Hayyam, so it's going to be contrary to him and lead us not to submit unto him. And this is something the children of Israel had struggled with. Uh, can you read Romans 10 and 3, please? For they being ignorant of Allah and righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Allah. So you can see. Pride causes us to try and find another way. Though we may get bad results over and over. If you can imagine, if I'm reading the law, this is speaking of the children of Israel. The law were given to them. We knew the law. And I'm speaking of our four parents. Yet, we still established our own righteousness. Hopefully, you can understand this was that concept that Allah Hayyam just loves us so much. We're his people. We can do no wrong. Like, we're still his people, even if we mess up. It was a precept that spake on that. Where we were really saying that back then. In Jeremiah. 
chapter 7, it says, verse 9, Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other Allahims whom you knew not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? The same way the devil said from the beginning, we'll be secure before Allah Hayyam to do what we will, fear not. We will do the same thing. We believe we were delivered. We have the grace. We have the freedom. He loves us. We're his people. He understands us. Isaiah prophesied of us being hypocrites, having Allah Hayyam in our lips. But our hearts have been far from him. The biggest thing I've seen in myself, looking at myself, I've been studying and reading all these books, learning all this information. But my heart wasn't in it. It was head knowledge. So I continue in the struggle. If my heart ain't right, if my heart isn't, Levi said, fear Allah with your whole heart and walk in simplicity according to all his law. There's no other way for it to be done. There's no double dipping with Allah Hayyam. What's the greatest commandment? To fear Allah Hayyam with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. It's, it requires everything in us. That's the only way. Oh. <laughs> Thou shalt love Ahaya thy Allah with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. That was Mark 12 and 30. But it has to be wholehearted because so long as there's another spirit there, Allah is not in all our thoughts because we're not there with him wholeheartedly. And the difference between us and our foreparents, well, it may not be different in us. Well, it we're, we're all the atoms of our own souls. Correct myself. Baruch said that. We all have the same choice. The double if mind. An, go right, I was just about to say, you're going into the double mind. Because if there's another way, then that makes Allah a liar. But if there's another way to get to him or get to heaven, Yahshua told us that there's only the narrow and straight way. Then that would make Yahshua a liar. That means that everything Yahshua came and taught us was a lie. Because he literally showed us the one and only way for us to get to him and to the Father. And if we devise in ourselves that there's another way, then we make Elohim a liar. We make Yahshua a liar. And then we make the devil righteous. Right. He becomes the angel of righteousness, the angel of light. Mm. Mm. The we angel of enlightenment, as they call him. Yeah, we see. So you his... can see, you can see how it plays, right? Yes, I can. Like. Whom you yield is whom you serve. So right. we glorify whoever we work for. And and setting our hearts right, knowing that if I'm not fulfilling his will, though I know everything I know is showing my heart isn't there. Getting to know that is good for me because that lets me know 
hey, your heart isn't in it. Now I know what I need to focus on, my heart. Because it's not about information anymore. It's not about just reading constantly. It's actually my heart. And investigating the deity and the truth. Putting his commandments into action. Rather than just being able to verbalize them to someone. That is possible when you only believe there's one way. Can you read Armour's Vision 3, chapter 7, verse 1, please? But the other stones which thou sawest cast far away from the tower, and fallen into the way, and rolling out of the way into the regions where there is no way, these are they that have believed but by reason of their double heart, they abandon their true way, thus thinking they can find a better way, and they go astray and are sore distressed as they walk about in the regions where there is no way. Look at that. <sighs> they roll down in the regions where there is no way. The law is a straight path. The regions where there is no way, that's lawlessness. You go wherever you like. These are they that have believed. But they tried it. But by reason of their double heart, they abandoned their true way. This is where I see the right way. But I still have desires. This gospel is constricting for me. It's taking away everything I like. There got to be another way. I can't be required to actually have to do all this. Where's the mercy? Where's the grace? It's a false perception, but this happens. I, I see where these people are going. I see this doctrine is calling for all this obedience and consistency. And there has to be a better way. And they go astray. So, easier way that's what they well yeah better thank you being specific right. yeah it has to be something easier for me because this is hard i have pride i don't like being corrected i don't like being wrong and i still like to fulfill my pleasure so this is too much everything i thought like in pride i grew up knowing something you mean to tell me what i knew wasn't right like, you know how much time I spent learning? How are you going to tell me I didn't learn the right thing? Like, that can't be me, not me. <laughs> like, the, the sense of importance, not understand. It's interesting because I thought, um, I thought the Lord was with me so much that there's no way I could learn the wrong thing. Because I had this high sense of importance. But then when he actually comes to show me, hey, I do love you. I'm trying to get you out of the wrong way. It offends me. Because I thought I knew the Lord for myself. This is where it's, it's unfortunate, but it's happening. And it happens. We had the children of Israel. Allah sent Moses and Aaron. Some of them didn't listen. Seeing all the plagues. Pride is tough and seeing everything that happened and still, no way, I'm not leaving. Because it was somebody else that said it. It wasn't told to me. It wasn't me that said it. It wasn't me that came up with it. I'm going to go my own way. And when you go your own way, no matter what, Allahim is Allahim. Hearkening to idols, we're going to get afflicted. It says they go astray and are sore distressed. Life gets tougher. Not listening to Allah Hayyam, through whomever he speaks through. Because his scripture said he doeth nothing, but he revealeth. What is it? It says in Amos 3 and 7, Surely the Lord Ahaya will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So, it's hard to hearken to a prophet. 
when my desire is that I'm that person. I'm that person who gets the understanding, who has the knowledge. Whereas if you look in the scriptures, the prophets, they were meeting together to discuss like, hey, let me share like when Isaiah would come around, the other prophets would come to share their prophecy to make sure everybody's making sure they're on the same page. Things being done in order. So we got to get away from our own righteousness. There is only one way. Anything else aside from Yache, the law, the fruits of the spirit, the testimonies and admonitions in the law and the testimonies and the records gathered by Ahaya. We're thieves and robbers. We're trying to take something that is not ours. Because those who Yache belongs to, they're going to go his way. His name is already in them. He's known them. He's sealed them. He's going to bring them through his way. But if we find ourselves trying to get around the commandments, get around the statutes, get around the fruits of the spirit by our feelings or justifying ourselves, we're casting ourselves from the opportunity. Can you read John chapter 10, verse 1, please? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Okay. It's only one way, and knowing that, we got to go his way. Let's save ourselves the trouble of mind and the distress of going our own way. <laughs> Can you read God, chapter 7, verse 3? Please seek out the judgments of the Lord, and thy mind will rest and be at peace. Amen. That's what a just man does. Because he understands it's about Allah, not ourselves. Verse 5 and 3, please. For he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Lord looketh on its inclination. We've been talking about all this pride. And you can see a just and humble man, not only can he receive correction from another, but he's also correcting himself. This is a person you can actually have a conversation with. Because this person is not actually seeking to be right for himself. He's considering, Allah is looking at my inclination. Let me pay attention in every conversation and make sure I'm not going against him. Rather than looking at the person across from me as that's who I'm in competition with. So that's what we're supposed to be. And that's what we're supposed to do for Rest of mind, being just and humble, remembering he looks on our inclination. So let's seek after his judgment to ensure we please him and he'll give us a peace of mind instead of the anxiety and uncertainty of going according to our own thoughts or what we think may be right for ourselves. Definition of inclination is a person's natural tendency or urge to act or feel in a particular way. So know Allah is watching to see what our tendencies are and what spirits are urging us in our acts and feelings, as Zachwa explained to me. Can you read Proverbs 16 and 2, please? All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but a higher way of the spirits. I can't see my own struggles going according to my own sight. <laughs> as my own perspective isn't going to be against myself. Yet, Ahai is watching within me, nonetheless, to see what spirits I'm listening to and being urged to act by and operate in. Knowing this, verse 3, please. Commit thy works unto Ahia, and thy thoughts shall be established. If you also find you're struggling to keep faith, 
Let's seek out the judgments of the Lord and his fruits of the spirit and commit unto those so that our thoughts can be established in truth to withstand the lust of our mind and body. The definition of the word commit in H1556 is, read the ones we need, commit to seek occasion, trust. We have to look for occasions to fulfill the law, being intentional, not being lax, like it's supposed to just come to us naturally. Because if I give myself room to lax, I'll fall into something because the spirits attend upon me, looking to insinuate themselves into my heart. The English definition of commit is to be dedicated to something. So if he sees we are dedicated to getting it right, He'll send help where we lack, as we learn that we will be surrounded with holiness if we repent with our whole heart in the last lesson. So dedicating our works unto him in everything, that's going to help us and he will see the good spirits around us. Okay. Can you read 2 Timothy 3 and 7, please? Ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How can I be studying all these scripts and learning yet never come to the knowledge of the truth? The English definition for knowledge is, or one of them is, awareness of familiarity gained by experience of a fact or situation. So, Knowledge comes through experience. If I'm not applying what Allah Hayyam said to do, I'm not going to get it. As Zach, what we does in the last lesson, investigate, put in the work. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's how ever learning, but can't come to the knowledge of it because we're not actually doing it. We're not actually right. putting it to the test, putting it into practice to see and become aware and familiar with it by experience. Okay. And kingdom doesn't come by observation. We actually it's to... like <laughs> go ahead. You just came back in. Go it's ahead. like a manager. You know how you have that manager that went to college and then he's coming for his first manager position. And he's like, he had no experience, but yet he studied for four years. And when he gets into the field, he's terrible. He don't know what to do. Like nothing makes sense because he doesn't have the experience. And then you have that one who never went to college, but yet they've been a manager for 10, 15 years and they have all the experience, though they may not have all the book understanding. Right. But they have knowledge because they are aware. They have the experience by situations. So they have the knowledge, but yet they may not have the, what do you call it, wisdom? Well, they've gained the wisdom by experience. Whereas right. What do you call it? Just, hmm. I don't know. What do they call it? Book? They say know. head knowledge. Head knowledge. There we go. All right. So they may have the wisdom and the knowledge through their experience but they don't have the head knowledge. But it's funny because they actually gained the head knowledge unawares through their experiences. Mm -hmm. They just don't know the, the proper, you know, they may not know as much right. when it they comes to head knowledge, but they have the knowledge. They have the, the wisdom of what they're doing and why they're doing it. And they've learned through their experiences some things that's not in the books for head knowledge. <laughs> so. What's the gospel in perspective? Right. The difference from the heart to the head as opposed to the head. And sometimes it doesn't make it to the heart. Right. Because you can do well in college and be a great student in college learning all these things would be a terrible manager. Mm. 
funny it takes the fruits of the spirit to be a good manager <laughs> right because you may not be able to work well with people you may not be able to understand people and their needs so it really shows like if i have if i'm getting head knowledge and i'm prideful and then i go into the workforce to be a manager and i'm prideful over people I'm not going to be a good manager. My works are not going to be well because I'm doing everything in pride. I'm causing contention. There's conflict. Came in superior to them in my mind rather than right. one that came in that put the work in with them and understand the struggle they're going through in everyday life and can relate and understand how to bring them along or help them along. The difference. No one way. Or making it easier for them. No one ways and, and even picking up the slack in some areas when you see that they need help. Being a servant unto all. Right. Yeah, so didn't come with a book in his hand. No, I didn't. Came to be a servant. The standing of pride versus humility. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now we understand with the world perspective or world analogy of someone who worked, who put in the effort, as opposed to someone who just got the information but didn't actually take the time to apply it. Can you read Hermes Mandate 10, chapter 1, verse 4, please? Listen, saith he, those who have never investigated concerning the truth nor inquire concerning the deity, but have merely believed and have been mixed up in business affairs and riches and heathen friendships and many other affairs of this world. As many, I say, as devote themselves to these things, comprehend not the parables of the deity, for they are darkened by these actions and are corrupted and become barren. I can't be going through the motions not committing my works unto Ahaya and expect to have my thoughts established in truth to come to the knowledge of it because his will has to be done in his commandments to actually know his doctrine. John 7 and 17 said, if any man do his will, he shall know the doctrine. And the angel of repentance confirms it in Hermas Mandate 10, chapter 1, verse 6, please. But they that have the fear of Elohim and investigate concerning deity and truth and direct their hearts toward the Lord, perceive and understand everything that is said to them more quickly, because they have the fear of the Lord in themselves. For where the Lord dwelleth, there too is great understanding. Cleave therefore unto the Lord, and thou shalt understand and perceive all things. Knowing this. I have to focus my mind and meditations with my whole heart on the following so I can understand the word of the Lord more quickly by my investigations of him. Sirach 6 and 37, please. Let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord and meditate continually in his commandments. He shall establish thine heart and give thee wisdom at thy own desire. So... If we want thoughts established in truth and a heart established in the Lord, the ordinances have to be our meditation and our works have to be committed unto them so that we can have the experience investigating the deity and his truth like we discussed. And wisdom, the Holy Spirit, will be given at our desire because we have shown by our actions and thoughts in the law that she is who we really want. 
Sirach 15, verse 7 and 8, please. But foolish men shall not attain unto her, and sinners shall not see her. For she is far from pride, and men that are liars cannot remember her. Pride made me foolish, and a sinner. Each person has to see it for themselves, to get tired of walking in it, and turn away from it unto the law of Allah where life and humility and long-suffering is, to end up getting the Holy Spirit. For the sake of the desire of the Holy Spirit, we have to be honest with ourselves today and get understanding of where pride has place in us and speak truth within ourselves so that she can come into our remembrance and heal us. In the last lesson, Zachar spake on there being nothing more important than keeping our souls. Yet the world has every distraction of the worldly affairs like business, heathen friendships, and distractions of the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the vainglorying in pride of life from the thing that really matters in life. A woman who formerly had pride and glory in this life, in beauty, wealth, and social status, and power, before she converted to the faith and humility, was speaking with her friend, who was Queen of India. And what she said is good to hear, because it entreats us all to really consider what is profitable for our souls, pride or life and humility and long-suffering. If you can read Acts of Thomas, chapter 135, please. You stand clothed in robes that grow old. Our fine apparel, all right? But you don't even desire the things that are for eternal. The eternal robes laid up for the righteous in the seventh heaven, which Isaiah saw. Okay. Looking proud with this beauty, which eventually vanishes. Our physical appearance. But you have not even considered the holiness of your soul. Why aren't we considering what makes our soul beautiful, yet we focus on our outward show? Continue. You are rich in a multitude of servants, but you have not freed your own soul from servitude. Sorry, how can we truly be rich when in servitude ourselves unto our pleasures? Continue, please. You have self-pride from the glory that comes from many but you don't redeem yourself from the condemnation of death. Self-pride is in vain glory in seeking admiration and respect of others or being above others. But in doing so, we lose focus on redeeming ourselves from the lawlessness of pride unto the condemnation of death. So while it is called today, we have the opportunity to come out of the lust of the world and the pride of life to enter into the rest in Christ through meekness and lowliness of heart, speaking truth to ourselves and examining ourselves in the truth of the law. All right. Now let's get into understanding how pride works more, as we've understood a lot thus far. An overview of pride. Sirach chapter 10, verse 12, please. The beginning of pride is when one departed from Elohim. And his heart is turned away from his maker. Our maker is the Holy One, Yahche Christ, by whom all things are made. But pride is far from him, so it takes our heart away from him. Thus pride is the beginning of going away from Allah Hayyam, And that spiritual fornication draws us from his law, as Judah attested fornication does. Now, what gets us to depart and turn away from the source of our life? To begin in pride. James 1 and 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's our desires that draw us away and give a place for pride to begin its works in us. The definition of lust is G1939, a longing for what is forbidden, concupiscence, desire, lust. Though we may be unlearned, these spirits know the things forbidden in the law. Can we touch on lust real quick? Go ahead. I want everybody to understand lust. 
because lust is interesting because the way it plays like it can play different ways like Casa talked about when we speak about the vexation um, during that vexation period is a lot of times where lust actually comes in that's why once Eve desired the fruit that's when the devil sprinkled the lust on it like it's a longing so like during that vexation period that's when a lot of times when the lust gets taken in because it's literally pulling us it's a longing it's literally pulling you and that's when you can actually know hey i'm getting vexed and lust is trying to get me. That's why when Casa was talking earlier about you be talking to yourself like, no, that ain't right. That ain't right. Because it's actually lust that you're fighting against. That's why it says a longing, especially for what is forbidden. You find yourself literally trying to fight against the lust within yourself. And that's why you... you, you <laughs> Is it making sense, Casa? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. Keep going. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. When the I know sometimes you get it out better than me sometimes. All right. And in case I do, you're going to help me. <laughs> I mean, in case I didn't. When the vexation comes, like, no, that ain't right. Like, it's a, it's a weighing down. It's a sorrow that comes. That's actually lust at work. I'm fighting against my own body the lust of my flesh it's it's desiring me to fulfill it and i'm actually desiring it so i'm going down it's weighing on me it's stressing me out i'm like man nah that ain't that ain't right but the thoughts it's funny how it's is you'll know it's lust still at work because the thoughts continue they don't actually stop when you're like nah that ain't right i shouldn't do that when you're getting down like ah oh, here's that thought again the thing keeps playing because it's, it's that it's pushing me to long for it. What's the definition of longing? Yeah, I'm going for it right now. It's um a yearning desire, having a showing a yearning desire. So it's like a, it says like a ache or a, like a, <laughs> a, a, a urge, a eagerness. It actually goes into covetousness. Desire. Ooh, Naphtali said with vain words to beguile your souls. That's the, oh, the empty words, like nah. <laughs> Say vain like, words. Nah, that right, empty uh, words, because it's not coming from my heart. I'm just saying it because I know it ain't right, but I right. still actually desire it, so it's empty. Right. I'm not. And that's I why you end up falling. You end up going into it, though you may fight it for a minute, whatever the case is, you're literally just on the decline because the lust is still at work. Yeah, it still has a place in you. So, like, Ooh. you'll say whatever you got to say to yourself to make yourself feel better. The vain words, but at the end of the day, you're still going to give into it because you still have pleasure in it. Like, you just start putting on a show. Yeah. One of the definitions for longing was an ache, a burning. You feel that it's, it's dulling. It's like, ah, uh, like it brings you down. It's not chair. It's not it's like, nah, that ain't it. Nah, thanks, Allah. Thanks for pointing that out. No, it's, it's way down. Like it slows everything down. Or it gets in motion to help speed it up, actually, like get off in it. I've, I've, man, praise Allah, I've experienced it. And then putting, investigating, putting that stuff to the test. I like, I've seen the difference when I, that's why I talk about staying out my feelings. When I can stay out my feelings and catch, oh, nah, nah, that's not right. There's different, like steadfast, the firm, that's not right. Right. Ain't no, emotional that's not right oh man i shouldn't do it. it's no that's not right well, and I'm standing me. fast in the faith yeah like lord help me 
no the seriousness the sobriety right. of a no yeah that's it i have felt less yeah i ain't want to ride over that one <laughs> praise Allah, man praise him though we may be unlearned these spirits know the things forbidden in the law can you read romans chapter 7 verse 7 please what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Allah forbid. Nay. So the law isn't our issue causing us to go astray in sin. <laughs> right. I had not known sin, but by the law. Because it helps us understand what sin is so we can be aware of it. Right? For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. That's interesting that the, the synonym for lust was covetousness. Yeah. Yes, sir. Covetousness means in this Greek word, H, 1937, to set the heart upon, that is, long for, rightfully or otherwise, covet, desire, would fain. That's the acting. Oh, no. Nah, that ain't right. <laughs> Getting to see it for what it is. It's like, yeah. You, you gotta be honest with yourself. Like, man, yeah. I'm acting, man. Right. <laughs> like, who I think I'm fooling to acting like, oh, man, no. Nah, like, this happening again. Like, come on, man. Be honest. It's a desire. I don't want, <laughs> like, yeah, I don't want that. I'm over and over. If you gotta yeah. keep saying it over and over, then you <laughs> you, got, man, you gotta keep repeating it. Like right. you gotta tell the truth. Like, no, I do want that, and I need to get away from this. This isn't good for me. Right. You gotta be honest with yourself. Allah I'm deliver me because I'm struggling right now. Yeah. What does that law say? Let me go find the law. <laughs> like, yeah. Let me go pray. Like, let me call somebody and call a counselor and say, hey. I'm struggling right now. Like, <laughs> By all means, do what you have to do to stand. Right. He said you have to, what, doing all you can unto blood? What, what? He said you, you haven't resisted unto blood. <laughs> like, you right. Know, so Man. Don't get weak now. And every person has to know for themselves. Like, we all have certain things that are stronger than others. You have to be honest with yourself and know what that one thing is that you can't play no games about. Right. Because you know you actually still want it and you know it has place in you. Like, and you actually want to overcome it. Let me hold this law to the T. Like, if you really want to overcome it. Because lust is lust. It's going to find, it's going to try it's going to work. It's enticing you. We didn't get to the, I don't think we did get to that definition yet, but it talks about enticement means to offer, um, to attract or allure. We not, it's right here. We're about to get to it. Where is it at? It's right oh. under you. Thank you. Entice, the English definition is to attract or tempt by offering pleasure or advantage. If we're not being honest, lust is going to continue working to put us in position to fulfill the desire. It says to entrap. Yes, sir. It's literally setting you up. Yeah. Like that random thing will happen. You will see some random something will happen. And then it makes you think about something. Then next thing you know, you're in a whole battle. It was a trap. It was a snare from the beginning. Right. Also means beguile, delude. Right. So it's That's seduction. To, right. To allure you. That's how that spirit operates. Right. Getting there scrolling through social media. Next thing you know, you're in a scene something and you're battling. Like right just that easy 
Thank you for bringing that up. Social media is a great example for plainness. If you find you go on social media and you keep scrolling until you actually see what you wanted to see, and then you act like, <laughs> oh man, I, <laughs> oh man, I gotta get off. <laughs> That's that be? I tell you, stay away from social media because social media ain't pushing nothing but fornication and lust mm-hmm. and every evil desire. Like I, I. I'll be on there. I'll post my stuff, man, and I try to stay away from it. Like I, I really do. Like I had to learn through experience myself. Like nah, that being honest with myself. Like hold on, because there's some one lesson we talked about how the end of a matter is gonna show what your intent was, or show what right. spirit was in your inclination when you get to the end of it. If I've gone on there. And by the end of it, I had to get off because something then stirred me up. That was what I went for. Right. If I'd have went to handle my business, I'd have went to handle it and got out of there. What am I scrolling to see? It's a setup. I had to be honest with myself. Like, nah, go post that lesson thing and get off of there. It's nothing else. Right. So just for real experiences, like, we have to be and honest. It's just that's looking for something on social media. If you're looking for something on social media, you can type it in and it'll pull right up. Man. You can bypass all the rest of the stuff if that's what your intent is. <laughs> and you have to be diligent. You know exactly what's on social media. So when you're pulling the app up, you have to be aware. You yes, know you what do. the probability is. <laughs> like, be mindful like you if you find your eyes is right there just setting so you can set it up so that you can see something and then act like ah man man how'd that get there oh no i don't want to see that but no you have to be honest i actually did want to see it because why was i sitting right there knowing what the probability was i'm putting myself in position that's the lust entrapping me i'm i'm it's like we we try to deceive Alahayam. <laughs> no, the definition says delude. It's yes, part but... of the lust. It's part of the enticing. Right. Delude is a to impose a misleading belief upon someone. Right. Lying to myself or me listening to lust, like I'm right. just I'm just waiting for this to upload. I'm just looking, yeah, I'm just looking to see what's going on. But you scrolling and your eyes stop at all the wrong things. Then how are you just looking? You you have to see it for what it is. You have to be honest with yourself and speak truth. Because Yache is truth. Yeah. If if you want to sit in a delusion or you want to sit in that, then you're giving heed for the spirit of guile and deceit. The net deceit blinding you. You're giving heed to those spirits, and if you give heed to them, they're gonna take their position. Right. However, they can get it. They don't care. They don't care how they have to get there, as long as they get there. That's facts, right? And we only way we can be real, man. Know what environment you're putting yourself in. You know. If I'm a drinker, why am I going to the bar? <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to know if drinking is a trouble for me, I should say, because drinking right. is a sin in itself. But if it causes me to sin and I don't have the self-control in it, why am I putting myself in that environment? Correct. Because the desire is still there. And I want to give myself an out to then when I do it, I can act like, ah, oh, man, it just happened and Man, how am I going to get it right, man? I keep. But that was your heart's intent before you even went. Right. (laughs) But I didn't want to see it. So I'm going to keep on. And then to feel better after, I'm going to do that feign. I'm going to act like, oh, man, I can't believe that happened and get into vexation like I was trying to do right. When No, I had to tell the truth. If I was trying to do right, I wouldn't have been there. So. That self-assessment really takes that honesty, man. We know the conscience, the heart is burning us up. 
Elohim knows, you know the feeling when you ain't in the right place within. You know the feeling when you're up to something you shouldn't be doing. So every man has to be honest with themselves. Can we read Psalms 94 and 20, please? Sure. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? Okay. We can know all the mischiefs of the devil that he uses to seek to lead us astray by knowing the law and the fruits of the spirit in it, because it encompasses what mischief is. Lust knows it. The devil knows it. Pride. It knows it because it stays away from it. I have to know <laughs> these spirits are well aware of the law of Eliab and they have no fellowship with him. Now, James said, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So lust itself seeks to entice us to desire what is forbidden by the law of Elohim. Yet we have to actually be enticed for it to have place in us. As we read some of it, I'm going to read the rest of it here. The definition of enticed is G1185. It means entrapped. That is figuratively delude. And the word delude to impose a misleading belief upon someone, deceive. So lust is just as vexation, wrath, and these things delude our mind and bring confusion. Lust is also a blinding spirit. It entraps by delusion, bait, deceit. But if we're being truthful with ourselves, like hopefully you can see that if I'm faking the funk with myself, I'm going to stay in my lust because lust is about faking it and acting like something isn't what it is or trying to downplay something like it's not that bad. The definition of entice is also allure, beguile, entice, to bait, catch by a bait. As Zachwa mentioned, random things pop up. You see something that's going to get your mind on something to get you into that lust. And however lust is trying to play. And that enticement is an attraction or temptation by offering pleasure. Not by advantage. coincidence. Right. Nothing is by coincidence. <laughs> it is not. You have to understand yourself. <laughs> Knowing that lust entices by pleasure or advantage. That's what it offers. Lust deceives us by attracting or tempting us to sin by offering pleasure in our own will against Allah or getting an advantage for our pleasures over our neighbor. Thus, going against the two great commandments. So if we want to overcome being enticed by something that pleases us or gives us an advantage to get what we want, we got to look into the law and the fruits of the spirit, learn them to know what mischief is and see what pleasures we have that are not advantages to keeping from the mischief explained in the laws and focus on overcoming those, getting insight on how they work in prayer and from your one counselor who keeps the commands for understanding on what to do so that the lust has no grounds to draw us away in pride because we actually understand what it's seeking to do. Remember, he says, through thy precepts, I get understanding. Our wisdom is to depart from evil when we become wise. Because remember, the devil was full of wisdom, too. When we become wise in Allah ways, we can actually have the understanding to combat these spirits. For example, being proud and boastful is one of the seven spirits of error from youth, according to Reuben. And it's something I grew up having pleasure in, unawares of what it was. Wanting to be the best or held in honor or to be light, get attention or just better than others and boasted in whatever I was able to do. If I could do anything, 
And that pleasure followed me into adulthood. Now, if I'm in my feelings, it's easy to be enticed by the pleasure or the misleading belief that this pride gives me an advantage to feel I'm better or desire to be better than someone. This is a truth I had to come to terms with in my heart so as not to continue deceiving myself like I was just falling, but it wasn't my fault. Seeing as though I can truly be tempted by my own lust, as we even seen here in this lesson from the beginning. Each man has to look within himself and be honest to create that division between these spirits and our souls. Or else, if we don't want to see it or want it to be, those spirits are going to stay right there at work in us and our high is still weighing what kind of spirits we are in company with while our heart is burning us up because the spirit of truth is also accusing us with the guilty conscience nonetheless. So if you want to start the process of coming out of whatever you face, start being honest with yourself and Allah Haim in humility to tell the truth so you can start getting free because Yache comes to bless us, to show us what we have going on in us by his spirit in us. And the more honest we are, the more truth will set us free because we can see clearly as to who we truly are to overcome ourselves and let his kingdom shine forth in us by good works to change into a new man. Gospel of Thomas, chapter 9, verse 1, please. Yachi said, Blessed is the lion which becomes man when consumed by man, and cursed is the man whom the lion consumes, and the lion becomes man. You know who the lion is. If you let the devil as a roaring lion consume you in pride, because you enjoy the pleasure he offers to be as a Allahayim, controlling, knowing, and making decisions for yourself, or you don't want to be esteemed less than others, or be wrong about who you led yourself to believe you are, or you don't want to look bad though you know who you are, and you're scared to put in the work to change either because of the sorrow, or you avoid it because of the pleasure you still have, or is laziness to plow, thinking it's hard, the devil will consume you. You have the choice to make, and the Lord knows what we will choose. Some of us, our conscience is seared as a hot iron, and we are going to stay where we are, having a reprobate mind as Paul spake of. Then there are those of you who are actually called and chosen from the beginning. Yache is going to afflict you with the like punishments we discussed earlier until your heart is where he needs it to be. So you're just making it harder on yourself because your pride is never going to help you in the faith of his name as I've been learning from my own shortcomings and secret faults revealed. This journey is easy once the whole heart is in it. I'm staying out of my feelings and I'm really honest with him, myself and others in humility. Hopefully, everyone can assess for themselves where they are in their life and make the assessment and adjustments to see growth in themselves while the opportunity is still here for us all. Continuing. Understanding our lust is important for overcoming sin as it begins the process to sin. As we know from the time Eve ate the fruit because it is the poison of the devil's wickedness and pride. Then, when enticed by lust, let's see how it plays out. James 1 and 15, please. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. All right. Conceived. We're looking at the definition of conceived. G4815. To clasp, that is, seize, arrest, capture, specifically conceive, literally or figuratively, by implication to aid, catch, conceive, help, take. 
Losses and aid are help for what we actually want. Even if we can't see the pleasure we have in the sins we commit, lust, it can see it and it helps us do it by enticing us by an offer that pleases us or gives us an advantage for what we want. So no one can come out of lust if we don't want it to be or we don't want to see it or we just have pleasure in what we have pleasure in. Once lust has captured us by the desires we have, we're overtaken in that self-will to please ourselves to do what pleases us in sin. Continue, please. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. As the angel said, in lawless men, which are the self-willed as we know, is death. All this evil we're discussing, pride is the root of it all, being self-pleasing. Can you read Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 24, please? And the angel answered and said unto me, Pride is the root of all evils. For anyone wanting to overcome pride, let's understand his characteristics. Sirach 10 and 7, please. Pride is hateful before Allah and man. Okay. Proverbs 21, 24. Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. All right. Sirach 10 and 9. Why is the earth and ashes proud? There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. All right. Thank you. Pride is hateful, so we got to understand how it works in hatred. Pride is wrathful, so it's emotional, given to passions, and it's covetous. So it wants what it wants and gets into passions when it doesn't get what it wants. Thankfully, the lesson on anger was a good way to begin this series to understand the power of temperance and the deceptions of emotions. We will be discussing these characteristics of pride here today, Lord willing. Can you read Sirach 10 and 13, please? But pride is the beginning of sin. Pride is the root of all evil, and lust is the poison, and root of it, and the beginning of getting into it, to sin and do evil. Continue, please. And he that hath it shall pour out abomination. Remember the angel of righteousness enters the heart of a man to make him do some good. So even a person struggling with something can do some good. Yet, as Allah weighs our actions in the balance, once the spirit of pride has place in us, lust continues to draw us away through our pride and our works are going to be abominable. Can you read Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, please? These six things do of Ahiah hate, yet seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. He hates it. It shows he is not in all our thoughts by our countenance, according to Psalms 10 and 4. All right, continue, please. A lying tongue. Pride is wrathful, so it works in vexation to arouse wrath with lying. Continue, please. And hands that shed innocent blood. Interesting. Just as the devil is a murderer by seducing others to sin to fulfill his own desire, pride does likewise to the innocent who are seductible to fulfill its lust. So it will take advantage of others to get what it wants, or just take what they have, as in business, pride leads to defrauding others of their due pay to be a bloodshedder, according to Sirach, where it says in Sirach 34 and 22, he that taketh away his neighbor's living slayeth him, and he that defraudeth the laborer of his hire is a bloodshedder. Or when they fall, they want to make you fall too. Just as the devil did at the beginning. Yes, sir. Yep. 
innocent blood. Mm-hmm. But I did something. So I want to see you do something too, so I could feel better. Right. It's pride. Grabbing a bucket. Uh, chapter 6, verse 18, please. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Pride in the heart of man brings forth strife, according to Proverbs 28 and 25. And that starts in the mind with the mental warfare of idolatry and the wicked imaginations these spirits give. Pride is rooted in lust, so thoughts will be according to a man's own opinions and desires, not Allahim's. Continue, please. Feet that be swift and run into mischief. That's the hastiness of spirit that hatred and the devil uses in all things. Pride is covetous, so as Naphtali explained, a man will be eager through covetousness, and the vain words of his thoughts help beguile his soul by convincing him to do some mischief, which we know is against the law because mischief is explained by the law. And now we got further understand today to know that in vain words come when we're in that vexation, lying to ourselves, feigning ourselves like, oh, no, nah, this isn't right. Instead of being continent, not continent, when we're controlled and direct. Are we going to stand steadfast or are we going to give in to lust? Yes. There's no okay. confusion anymore. Lust right. is what we're now feelings about it. Like, man, whether straight up entertaining, like, geez, or trying to fake it, like, nah, that ain't right. And that's only one part of it, because you can give in to worry, you can give in to doubt, you can give in to frustration, you can give in to annoyance, you know, it, it just goes so many different places. Thank you for bringing that up. Do have to be mindful of that, that self-righteous vexation that can come. Like, I'm tired of these spirits attacking me, like, I'm getting angry about it, because... I, the goal is just to get us out of the fruits. Right. Got to keep our cool no matter what. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 19. 6 and 19. A false witness that speaketh lies. Pride doesn't take accountability. So it will place the blame on others by making up things to avoid accountability or fault. Lying to ourselves and others to protect ourselves. And pride is self-pleasing, so is lawless, living in its own vain opinion. So telling lies comes with it. Because it's going to see it how it sees it. It's the concept of my own truth. Okay. Continue, please. And he that soweth discord among brethren. So, as we all know, only by pride comes contention, according to the precept. So pride will be looking for some reason to store up problems instead of seeking to maintain peace. We've covered the seven abominations that pride pours out, at least these seven. These seven abominations are at work in anyone struggling with pride. Remember, spirits come and go. So it's not to say the person doesn't do any good or they're just constantly doing these things. It's just, it's not truly good when they turn the good intent into evil for themselves. Or it's not truly good unto Allah Hayyam when also committing sins because he doesn't accept the seeming good by doing some good as being a good person. But Allah Hayyam only has respect unto the genuine good by doing good only according to what's right in his sight, as Asher explained in his testament. Pride works with lust, so the things we have pleasure in, we will continue to be enticed to delude our minds with deceit to turn a blind eye to or justify doing it, to continue operating in them out of pleasure by the angel of self-indulgence and deceit. So let's get understanding of how that works. 
Hermas, Parable 6, Chapter 5, Verse 5, please. What kinds of self-indulgence, sir, say I, are harmful? Every action, saith he, is self-indulgence to a man, which he does with pleasure. For the irascible man, when he gives the reins to his passion, is self-indulgent. So hastiness is a pleasure. I had to be honest in how hastiness was a tool for me to sin not taking my time to be attentive, eager through my own bad habits developed from you that I still had pleasure in to continue doing. So I would let the hastiness be the catalyst to get me into it. And then after the prideful sorrow, like, oh man, what am I doing? Why is this happening? Uh, what am I, I can't get it right until I kept doing it. I'm like, okay, some may, right? I had to actually go talk about it. Like, hey, this is what I'm doing. This was happening. To finally get the insight from someone outside of myself. Like, no, nah, you're doing that because you actually want to do it. It's hastiness that's setting you up for it. And then it helped open my understanding. Like, ah, so that's what I've been doing. Putting myself in position to sin or creating an environment for me to sin. Like, oh, I just happen to be going too fast and that happened. Or oh, I'm going to hastily go into it so I can not deal with the resistance that I'm getting because I ain't thinking right. Instead of slowing down. Um, anything? Are you ready to continue? It says, for the irascible man, when he gives the reins to its passion, it's self-indulgent. When you give the reins to his passion, whatever you have pleasure in is a passion. Whether it be anger, whether it be lust, whether it be strife, whether it be contention, whether it be pride, all those things are passion. So it's interesting that you can be self indulgent and all of these different things you can give yourself over to all of these things as it says that they're harmful and they're harmful in every action because you're given over to a pleasure or you have pleasure in something that isn't lawful all right can you continue reading please and the adulterer and the drunkard and the slanderer, and the liar, and the miser, and the defrauder, and he that doeth things akin to these, giveth the reins to his peculiar passion. Therefore he is self-indulgent in his action. All these habits of self-indulgence are harmful to the servants of Elohim. On account of these deceits, therefore, they so suffer who are punished and tormented. Pride of life, resisting Allah by our pleasure in sin, leads to all the depression, anxiety, mental health issues, and struggles we see in the world. We have to come out of our pleasures to have peace of mind and good health. Some may wonder, hey, I'm putting in the work to change, but I find I'm doing the same thing still. Oh, I keep falling to the same pleasure. So what's going on? The thing we have pleasure in will continue to entice us because self-indulgence has no memories to remember what we did or how bad it felt after doing it to keep us from doing it again. The pleasure is going to stay there to keep us doing it again until we repent with our whole heart because we still enjoy the pleasure it gives to us. Can you read Hermas, Parable 6, chapter 5, verse 3, please? He that liveth in self-indulgence and is deceived for one day and doeth what he wisheth is clothed in much folly and comprehendeth not the thing which he doeth. 
for on the morrow he forgetteth that which he did the day before. For self-indulgence and deceit have no memories by reason of the folly wherewith each is clothed. You got the precepts and praise Allah high informed to understand. You find you getting up every day and the same things happening to you. You got to find out what it is you got pleasure in. It's not just mistakes. It's not just happening because you're trying hard. It's not just because somebody keep doing this certain things and gets under you. It's your pleasures. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. You have to see what the spirits are. Which ones got that place to get you to keep doing it? Why? You're, you're seizing the opportunity. says it gives us reins to the passion like the lust in us is like oh there's a chance let's right. get it then we got an opportunity to do it while we can right. like you got to see that for what it is if you're not being real with yourself you're going to continue with no memories you're going to be clothed in the folly of it you're not going to comprehend what you're doing because you're enjoying it you're going to go set yourself up to do it by whatever means. And then after, you're going to be like, oh, man, why is this happening? You're going to be upset, but it's Don't not. Go just like that. Yeah. The next day, you're going to come and do the same thing again. But it ain't really hit you. Yeah. You still got pleasure. By reason of the folly wherewith each is closed. What's the definition of folly? Ooh. G877. Senselessness. That is euphemistically egotism. Morally reckless. Egotism is the practice of talking and thinking about oneself excessively because of an undue sense of self-importance. So even in folly, there's pride. He that liveth in self-indulgence and is deceived for one day, and doeth what he wisheth, so is self-pleasing what I want, is clothed in much folly. I'm pride again. Blinding me with senselessness because I'm lawless is whatever I want to do and comprehendeth not the thing which he doeth. I've been deluded by lust enticing me and then the spirits at work in me. I'm not really comprehending. I'm going against Allah because it's all pleasing. It feels good. He comprehendeth not the thing which he doeth. For on the morrow he forgetteth what he did the day before. There's that I really have this high sense of importance to Allah Hayyam, that I can just continue in this and he knows my heart and it's okay. I forget it. Like, hey, I apologize yesterday. I repented. But Allah Hayyam knows there's some people he knows when they're going to finally stop and there's repentance for them. But we don't know if we're accounted as those people. And we're really taking risk. We're really being reckless, as folly is the definition. We're tempting Allah Hayyam, and it's a dangerous game. Did you have some Zakwa? No, go ahead. Okay. Each person has to be honest with themselves about the folly they are in and start the process of coming out of it and confess to Allah Hayyam and get counsel on it to start resisting the pleasure of it if you don't know what it is or are still struggling though you know what it is so you can overcome it. Don't let pride keep you there. If you find you're doing the same things, be honest and find out why it still pleases you to give your mind to it. And praise Allah for the experience for showing you where the spirit still has place 
and letting you know you haven't repented with your whole heart as yet to overcome it. If you find you keep doing the same thing still, you need to pray and then reach out to your counselor who keeps the commandments to talk about it honestly, not downplaying what's going on, because that is persisting without insight. And doing that persistence without insight is what's getting the same results as we discussed in the spiritual perspective lesson. When you talk with your counselor, you got to be honest, like real deal, because Yache is truth. And everything comes from him. If you have a counselor that's actually keeping the law, I don't know how gives him understanding. Yache is gracious. He's not forceful. He's gentle. If you're not willing to be honest, he'll be patient. He'll wait. Because you have to actually want to come out of it. That's what I've learned from experience. I have to actually want to see it. I have to be honest with whomever I'm speaking with. Because when my mindset changed to realize I'm not speaking with the person I'm talking to. Yache hears me. He's hearing the dialogue. He knows if I'm being honest and sincerely vulnerable to speak on what's going on. And I found when I'm actually telling the real deal story and not trying to downplay or like be vague about what I'm talking about to try to save face, I actually get the insight I need to actually overcome what I'm dealing with. Because he meets us as we are. So. <clears throat> Says when two or more gathered in my name, know that I am in the midst. Right. I can't be there in his name in iniquity trying to deceive my brother. Trying to save face. Being a respect of persons. So. Did you have anything, Zach, or was that it? Mm -mm. You go ahead and finish. Okay. That was that. So just be honest. And make sure you're talking to a brother who actually is in the faith and actually keeping the commandments. Because some people are brother in word, but not in truth. And you're not supposed to open your heart to every man according to the precepts in Sarah, unless he requite thee with a shrewd turn. Some people lay up what you're saying to look down upon you or to use it against you at a later time. Okay. Use discretion. And if you don't know who your one counselor should be, pray about it and ask how I am and wait for an answer so you don't go astray and get yourself in a jam or be a stumbling block to somebody else. Okay. So continuing understanding pride. Once departed from Allah Hayyam and our maker and what pleases us, pride begins the sin and will cause us to commit abominations. Pride is the real problem to get over because everything wrong begins with its covetousness, self-pleasing, self-exalting, hatefulness, and emotional characteristics from the precepts. I would also add lust is important as well because pride plays in lust. Mm -hmm. Let's look at how it further works to identify it and get insight and learn how it works in us to start plowing away at overcoming it. We had read in Sirach 10 and 7 that pride is hateful before Allah Hayyam and man. And it goes on to say, and by both doth one commit iniquity. So if I'm in pride, my hateful works, I'm going to sin against Allah and against people. Knowing that pride is hateful and any place where pride is, hatred is there as well. We got to jump into the spirit of hatred to get some insight of this hateful pride. Testament of Gad, chapter three, verse one, please. Now, my children, hearken to the words of truth toward righteousness and all the law of the Most High, and go not astray through the spirit of hatred, for it is evil in all the doings of men. 
He spake on actually working righteousness through the words of truth and the law and testimonies and not let the spirit of hatred take us away from that focus because it's going to lead us to all evil doings. And this witness is true because that hateful pride begins the sin. Chapter 5, verse 2, please. These things, therefore, I say to you from experience, my children, that ye may drive forth hatred, which is of the devil, and cleave to the love of Allah. The thing is, a person has to experience what these two spirits do to us to actually repent, speaking of hatred and pride. You have to experience them to actually repent from the pleasure of comfort in their works in order to see them for what they are and call them out by taking accountability and to understand their works, their symptoms and characteristics that works in us to take heed to stopping the habits or the reactions or behaviors to overcome them, changing our hearts by good works. Okay. If I didn't mention it, to be a hateful person is a prideful person, okay? Uh, if you don't understand these spirits or believe you're struggling with these spirits or are not willing to accept when the words of truth in Scripture show that you are struggling with these spirits, how can you have the experience to overcome them? How can you have the experience to understand them, to know them by their works and to know what they're doing in you or to you and to know how bad they are for you to flee away from them? You can't. You stay there in it. Gad himself, he went through experiences of being in them, getting afflicted for them and getting afflicted for being in them then getting tired of being in them and willing to search himself out to understand and see them for what they are. And he truly learned that righteousness by following the words of truth in the humility it requires to be able to follow the words of truth. He got to see that was key to overcoming. Uh, chapter 5, verse 3, please. Righteousness cast about hatred. Humility destroys envy. Amen. Knowing this then, let's listen to what he says to help us. Chapter 3, verse 1, please. Hearken to the words of truth toward righteousness and all the law of the Most High. That gets us away from self-righteousness because we actually have to listen to the words of truth in order to work it. Okay. And righteousness is essential because it casts out hatred so that we don't give place to that hateful pride. By precept, if you remember, hatred of heart causes envy. So humility keeps from the spirit of hatred's tactics through envy against those who may be prospering better than us in their walk or in our perception of their life. Or they may just be held in admiration by somebody that we desire to have like us or admire us as it did to Simeon and Gad. But rather, humility, on the other hand, leads us to focus on our own plowing in ourselves so that we can see the secret faults in us at work to learn, understand and overcome them while praying and being happy for others, prosperity or well-being. Can you read Sirach 3 and 19, please? Many are in high place and of renown, but mysteries are revealed unto the meek. So unless we humble ourselves, mysteries of what we have going on within us won't be revealed to us. Psalms 19 and 12, please. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. If I want to walk in humility and righteousness and truly want to overcome pride and the spirit of hatred that it works by, this is the type of mind I have to be. Chapter 5, verse 3, please. For, he that, for he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust. 
being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Lord looketh on his inclination. That's what we got to be. We got to get over ourselves and focus our emotions on the Lord himself to have that right urge unto good. It's like always tells me about being intentional. We can't let our minds be lax. If we know who we are, we know if we get to Dalton, it might, like, for me anyway, my Levi said, read the law without ceasing. I have to fill my mind with something righteous. I can't sit still and just kick it. Every man has to assess for himself. There are a few tribes, and I think, see, reading all that law as I'm talking about, I think that kind of goes for everybody. There's a commandment for Judah, for the kings to have to record the law to read all the days of their life, and they have to overcome pride. The children of Joseph, Joseph said he had the fear of Allah before his face. So they, with their pride, they have to make sure the law is what's before them, that fear. Alahayim, Zachary, can you may probably can differentiate the differences for different aspects of pride and how people struggle with it. Gad, we see he says seek the judgments and he struggled with hatred, so he struggled with pride. Benjamin with the bad mindedness, pride. It's consistent. Dan with anger, pride. So I think for anybody wanting to correct their mind and cleanse their mind. Got to have that law going. Got to be studying intently, not just listening, but listening for guidance for self as well. Got to watch out for. If you find when you're listening to the scriptures, all the thoughts that come to you about other people and what they're doing is pride attacking you. Right. That's the arrogance coming to keep you feeling like you're better than others because you find all you listen to you heard some things about you but in the end you just remember the things about others that will upset you or bother you so gotta be mindful for that if that happens to you i learned about that um that shows you what you take to heart mm -hmm. yeah because i had to learn my heart wasn't in it for sure so I'll watch out for but that. you take to heart the things that you see of others so you are taking something to heart it's just right. not the things that are helping you grow yeah because it wasn't about me growing it was about me being superior right so it's easy to see everything everybody else got going on with that desire to be the one that knows all and gets to tell you what you're doing to have that, that position so definitely that iniquity was in me Praise the Lord for showing it. Amen. We touched on the taking pleasure in the good inclination. You learn things about yourself. We read in Asher, confess it quickly. And the quicker you confess, the more you know you're actually growing in faith and growing in your desire for righteousness. Let's continue learning how hateful pride works in Gad chapter 5, verse 4, please. He speaketh not against a holy man, but the fear of Elohim overcometh hatred. For fear and least he should offend the Lord, he will not do wrong to any man, even in thought. These things I learned at last, after I repented concerning Joseph. The pride being hateful. It's unforgiving. Here, a humble man, just an humble man, he wouldn't speak against a holy man. But a prideful man, even if the man's doing right, he's going to look for something. Or he's going to want there to be something. Because there's no fear of Allah. And remember that self-will is not afraid to speak evil of dignities. There's not a view like, hey, Allah is prospering. Let me not speak against his servant. As we've seen in the wilderness when them guys were going at Moses and Aaron. Okay. For fear unless he should offend the Lord, he would not do wrong to any man, even in thought. 
And pride, on the other hand, is not a fear of the Lord. It's not a fear of offending him because in pride, I think I'm the most important person to him. And he knows my heart and he just loves me. And anything I do, even if it wasn't right, he knows I meant well. Or it was just I wanted something. So he understands. I would do somebody wrong because all I'm thinking about is myself. But in my thoughts, I'm in my own world in my thoughts. I don't have Allah Haim in all my thoughts. And my inclination is not considering that he's watching and listening to everything I'm thinking in, in my head. So who knows? A prideful person in their mind, they're not the same person that they may portray. It's interesting because for a, a prideful person, they may do something and justify it. But if you do the same thing, then you're the worst person. Right. Because now that's my opportunity to be superior over you. Right. Like, yeah, I did it to you. Now you're going to we're going to have to jump over to this other thing. <laughs> Yeah, I did it. No, it's all right. <laughs> we're going, we're rolling with Allah and take this thing. I did it to you. Forgive me, man. Come on. Why are you holding a grudge? Like, you got to let things go. Like, have mercy on me. All right. You had mercy on me. Appreciate it, man. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing because you didn't hold me accountable. But all right. you, <laughs> you do me wrong? Nah. Like, I can't believe I'm you taking did that. it all the way down. I ain't yeah, you. Like, you're not gonna live past it, man. Like <laughs> how did you do that to me? Like I remember this <laughs> come together. Self and dozens has no memories. I don't forgot what I didn't did to you, right? And if you do bring it up, like why are you dwelling in the past? But when you did it to me, remember because of pride, I've taken on being my own Alahayim. So that thing, I'm going to hold it because that's a one up on you. Right. That keeps me above you. So yeah. that I'm going to bring it whenever I talk to you, I'm going to bring it back up. I might not say it to you, but that energy is going to come back up. If you mess up again, because hatred is bitter, it holds grudges. So that pride, it, that sentiment is going to still be there. Not the humility and long suffering of really casting off whatever it was understanding having a pure honey of long suffering like if you mess up again no like man i know what this journey's like i know what it's like to be in pride or struggling i understand let me have patience on my brother car it's gonna take some time All right it isn't like that pride is still in the thorns itself so man it's no compassion because it's right. we're gonna touch on that the difference between how a humble person deals with forgiveness for oneself and then dealing with others. Um, yet in humility, I'm not going to think evil of a person or hold a grudge against a person having Allah Hayyam in mind and his fear and understanding what we went through ourselves. Because remember, to come to that humility, we actually have to have the experience of being in the wrong spirits. And when we know the struggle it takes, Zach well talked about this. When we know the struggle it takes to actually come out of it, then we can actually truly have compassion on others. Because we know the journey. We know the struggle. But if we're still in pride in the struggle, we can't see right to have compassion on another in truth. It may be in word. This is why God is interesting. God do pride, man. <laughs> he talked about love one another in word, deed, and inclination of soul. He understood the fakeness of pride. Well, yeah, I'm going to tell you I forgive you, but in my heart, it ain't gone. How I feel about it, it ain't gone away. And it's going to show itself the next time something comes up. Okay. If we're in true repentance, because these things we're talking about, it's through true repentance, you'll start to see things for what it is. Can you read Testament of God, chapter 5, verse 7, please? 
But true repentance, I said, holy sort destroys ignorance and driveth away the darkness and enlighteneth the eyes and giveth knowledge to the soul and leadeth the mind to salvation. And those things which it hath not learned from man, it knoweth through repentance. Oh, I am knows true repentance is from the whole heart. Our heart is actually going to be towards Allah. I am. And when we actually want to see it, it's going to destroy ignorance. Because now I'm not hiding pride anymore. I'm not going to be its accomplice to try to cover it. I want it out. So I'm calling out everything it's doing. I don't care. <laughs> I want to get free. Yeah, I just start to open my eyes for me to see because I actually want to see. I don't want to be deluded anymore. He'll enlighten my soul. I'll start to hear the angel of righteousness because my inclination is unto righteousness. He's going to start leading my mind because now I actually want it. I bought in, you know, I stopped kicking the pricks like I bought in. All right. Whatever it takes. And I went through the process of humbly going to a man to get understanding. Then through showing my humility, Allah will start to speak to me. Because he knows my soul can be trusted. I'm not going to lift myself up when he shows me something. In the humbling process of coming out of iniquity, you start to learn more faults about yourself. And if you have the right mindset, you can take it as good because that's what true repentance does is destroy ignorance as to what's going on in us to have insight. And the things we don't know, Allah will open our understanding by dreams, visions, when we get the interpretation from him or by his prophets through our repentance and desire to know the truth for our growth. It's a journey. And if we stay the course, we will have new hearts in time to perform good only, keeping our repentance pure. Testament and God, chapter 3, verse 1, please. Go not astray through the spirit of hatred, for it is evil in all the doings of men. Whatsoever a man doeth, the hater abomineth him. And though a man worketh the law of the Lord, he praiseth him not. Though a man feareth the Lord, and taketh pleasure in that which is righteous, he loveth him not. He dispraiseth the truth. So pride criticizes the truth and senses it because it doesn't fit his perspective. As proud wrath and anger doesn't allow us to see in truth. A proud person, when they hate you, or you're better than them, there's nothing you can do right. They're going to make whatever you're doing is going to be bad. Because that's all they can see. And when you do do good, they're going to ignore it. As it says, though a man worketh the law of the Lord, so a private person will see you doing right, but they're not going to praise you for that. But when they come talk to you, I'm going to come talk to you about the faults, the things I see that I think are wrong. Because... I don't want you to be who you actually are because what you're doing is testifying against me that I'm not doing right. As you've seen God, he hated Joseph just for Joseph being Joseph. Joseph That's a good example. Go ahead. That's a good example because it doesn't always have to be about the law. It can just be about some worldly thing that they see that they feel you're doing wrong. Yes. Right is looking for it. It's a scripture we'll get to. It says, as a spy, so looketh he for thy fall. Right? Pride will create some is and deceit is there, lying, own perception. He'll create some problems. The devil himself, like Adam, what does thou tell me? <laughs> like you did me wrong. And Adam didn't do a thing to him. Just being created. So. And that desire for vainglory, we got to really watch it. That self-pleasing and arrogance, wanting to be superior, wanting to be better, wanting to be held in honor, 
it got Gad and Simeon. They hated Joseph because of how he was exalted. So everybody has to be mindful of it. Okay. It's man. You got to watch it. He envieth him that prospereth. He welcometh evil speaking and loveth arrogance. Arrogance, the definition is an attitude of superiority manifested. So it's shown in an overbearing manner or in presumptuous claims or assumptions. Presumptuous is overstepping due bounds as a propriety of courtesy, taking liberties. So an you know, arrogant person, they show their sense of superiority in being overbearing. If you've ever been around an overbearing person, you can understand. It's no fun. They just require a lot of attention or they take up attention. No, they require all your attention. Yeah. That's a, that's a very prideful person. It's very overbearing. They require all your attention and all your concentration. Yes. It's un overbearing means unpleasantly or arrogantly domineering. So they're controlling. They're dominating. They have to dominate whatever is going on. If you're having a conversation, they end up dominating the conversation. Mm -hmm. They have to be the one that the attention has to be on them. Long-winded or loud, obnoxious, things like that. That definition of domineering was asserting one's will over another in an arrogant way. So the arrogance, it's, it's very controlling and it's just unpleasant to be around. So something we really want to overcome if we find we're in it. If we find we're having to have a big presence in whatever environment we're in, we should examine ourselves to see if pride has place in us. Because the angel of righteousness is bashful, gentle, and tranquil. So if you feel the urge where you have to get attention in any environment you're in, do some self-examination and pray about it. Be sure pride doesn't have place. Okay. Hateful pride loves arrogance, and arrogance is overbearing. So if you find you can be overbearing, it's a spirit of pride at work, since the fruits are gentle and kind and modest, not requiring or trying to get attention. Or rough and domineering, trying to control. If in your work field, if you find that you're more overbearing on people on their neck rather than doing things in righteousness, you know, being as a servant unto those under you or your co-workers, just examine it and pray about it and be sure pride isn't at work. The spirit of fornication and lust teaches arrogance for us to love it in our hateful pride if we have it. Testament of Judah, chapter 17, verse 2, please. Beware, therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money. For these things withdraw you from the law of Elohim and blind the inclination of the soul and teach arrogance. So fornication teaches arrogance and hatred loves it to blind me in the pleasure of it. So a man of my particular tribe who has to beware of fornication and has all spirits of pride attendant on me, an angry temper looking to insinuate into my heart by hatred in pride to blind me through my feelings unto envy or vex me into my emotions unto wrath 
Keeping temperance and a sound mind is of utmost importance for me, as my feelings get me overtaken, and I'm not the same person by evidence of the spirits that conspire against me, and by precept this affects others likewise, so everyone has to really beware of their energy to stay in the right spirit if you want to prosper in the faith. Because if not, if you don't focus on your energy and where your inclination is, the hateful pride is going to do the following. Go ahead, Zach, please. Oh, Testament of God, chapter 3. For hatred blindeth his soul. That hateful pride will blind us, as I also learned from my own experiences. Testament of God, chapter 4, verse 1, please. Beware, therefore, my children of hatred, for it worketh lawlessness even against the Lord himself. Right. Because the self-will, remember, when you see lawlessness, akin it or link it with self-will, because it's self-pleasing, what I want to do. Hence, it's easy for hateful pride to blind us, because once I want what I want, I can't see beyond it. <clears throat> No matter what anyone says. And that's the fornication. Yes, sir. Withdraw me from the law of Allah. I am. Resents the word of holiness. I will not hearken to a prophet. So. And I will work lawlessness against the Lord himself. I'm not going to obey Yache when I'm in my feelings. Mm -mm. Confirming hatred and pride work together. Because hatred makes a man self-pleasing to establish his own law, which is lawless, seeing that hatred is lawless even against the Lord himself. This confirms hatred and pride work together. Because hatred makes a man self-pleasing to establish his own law, which is lawless before the Lord, and it's against the Lord himself and his law. Can you read Testament of Gatcha, the 4 verse 2, please? Or will not hear the words of his commandments concerning the loving of one's neighbor and sinneth against Allah. I'm self-pleasing, so I'm not going to hear the commandments concerning love for my neighbor if it's not something that benefits me. And whatever Allah commands, I'm going to sin against it if it's not what I want or it's not helping me attain what I want. Because pride is hateful. There's no respect for others. There's no compassion for others. There's a false sense of love where I may love some people according to my own standard of love. But it's not actually true love because I just want to be held in admiration by them. I want their respect. I want to be liked by them. Right. Charity is without partiality. Right. It's not true love, according to Allah Hayyam. Continue reading, please. For if a brother stumble, and delighteth immediately to proclaim it to all men. So let me see. If it's somebody I don't like, and I'm speaking of a brother, even in the faith, it delighted to proclaim it to all men. Because pride likes to talk about others' mistakes because it distracts from our own accountability or makes one feel better about oneself and desire to be superior or seem better. So even in the faith, you come to find out about the faith of Christ and get to find out maybe even who you are, what tribe you're from, of whatever nation and anything that there is to glory in. You can consider examining yourself if when you talk with somebody, that's in the faith, you don't have conversations about how you can grow yourself. Your main conversations are about what you see others doing or what's going on in the world. And there's a sense of like, we read a definition earlier about, was it contempt? Where it brings the thoughts to feel, to feel justifiably, angry about what someone else is doing and having feel like we have the right to judge them 
But like talking about doing like, yeah, man, I can't believe they doing that. You know, like it's a difference in the spirit of how we're talking. We gotta be mindful of it. If we're more if we're more comfortable talking about other people and what they got going on than than actually examining it and getting an understanding of what's going on within ourselves. You gotta remember pride too. A lot of times when it delighteth if a brother stumble because they create a false perception of you to go along with their narrative. Like I have to tell everybody the things that my brother is doing so then that people can have this perception of that person to therefore lift myself up to establish my righteousness. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, I see how it, it delights in it because it's what it wanted. I like, I knew you wasn't doing everything right. Well, I knew you couldn't be doing everything right. Like, yeah, see, there it is right there. I knew it, man. Like, he was looking for that opportunity. So just as we talked about lust, right. doing this, the opportunity's there. There it is. Let's go. We got go one. for it. Right. Yeah, he, he told you he wasn't doing everything right. He made mistakes, too. Like Now you're slandering. Yeah. Continue when you're ready. And it's urgent that he should be judged for it and be punished and put to death. Pride struggles to forgive or not letting go of the false people commit and is critical of others when they fall or don't do what's right in our own eyes. The proud like to be forgiven, but don't like to put the work in to show repentance as pride is still given to pleasure. That's why the devil's doctrine of I'll make you secure before Allah I am no matter what you do. That's right along with pride because there's no accountability. Just hurry up, forgive me, be appeased for the multitude of my sins and let me continue on my way. Okay. And don't judge me because I have security that Allah is going to be merciful because he knows my heart. We're going to see it, how it scriptures show it. Oh. Yeah, you're not merciful. Yep. <laughs> you're right. When it, when it comes to others trespass against the proud. Or yourself. Yeah. And it does keep me, it did keep me there. Where I was beating myself down, boy. My own righteousness thinking I was, that was how I was striving for it because I'm so hard on myself. I was tripping. Let's see the dichotomy of how pride operates when it comes to forgiveness. And we're going to start with our dear brother Peter because he was a Levite. So he had to overcome pride too to know that it can be overcome. So we can see where he was. And of course, we know where Peter ended up being an example of a believer. If you look at Matthew 18 and 21, please. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Yahshua saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, the one who was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, 
have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had been called, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldn't not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even if I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till they should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We went all the way through. We heard it. And we see where Yache focused on by the end, the heart. And using Peter for our edification, he helped Peter understand for growth in his own heart. Because if we're considering a set limit of times to forgive somebody, it shows a lack of mercy in our heart. As Yache said, so 70 times 7. So that we have compassion no matter what. Yes, there's forgiving and then also protecting yourself. We're not saying you're supposed to just let a person continue doing something to you to hurt you. There are instances where you do have to separate. And we're going to get into that today. But in regards to forgiveness itself from the heart, really letting it go, knowing that pride is hateful and does not forgive, you truly have to do it from the heart no matter what. And then we know when that comes from pride, the lack of forgiveness, hateful pride to be exact. Now, Yache goes on to explain how the prideful are when it comes to forgiveness. He said, a certain king, as Yache, we have the servant who needed forgiveness and he was not forgiven unto his fellow servant, which are his fellow man. So we see how this prideful man treats Allah Hayyam, And we know if how we treat Allah Hayyam is how we treat everyone else from prior lessons with Zach Bond explaining that to us. The prideful man, he begged the Lord to forgive him. Have patience with me, I'll pay thee all. He said whatever had to be said to get out of the situation. All right. But as soon as he got out, he left off all that. That was just a gimmick. It was to get out of that right there. Because pride is also deceitful. When the next man did him wrong, he grabbed him by the throat. He's severe. He's harsh. He holds grudges, unable to let go. We have to see in ourselves, take the time and assess. When we make a mistake, how do we feel when we wrong somebody? Do we want them to hurry up and forgive us and let it go and move forward? But then... When somebody wrongs us, it lingers. The thoughts come back. The random remembrance of the offense comes back. These are things we have to assess to see if pride is in us in bitterness. And then the servant, in regards to how the prideful are unwilling to do the work to bring forth repentance, the man said, be patient with me and I will pay thee all. But soon as he went out, he went back to doing wicked works. Showing the desire for forgiveness was in hypocrisy. He still wanted to do what he wanted to do. He just said what needed to be said in the moment because he got caught. Mm -hmm. He ain't paid the whole time. Put it in <laughs> real life. I ain't been keeping Yachay commandments the whole time. But when I got caught, then I'm not keeping it. Then it's, oh man, forgive me, forgive me. I'll, I'll do right, I'll do right. But then when you give me a chance, I go right back to what I was doing. Because my fear wasn't actually fear of him. It was just the fear of getting caught by him. It takes whole heart to have the real fear. To keep his commandments. Knowing that he sees everything. He's, he's always present. There's no game in him. 
There's no deceiving him. <laughs> he is Lord and Allah Hayyam. And knowing he is in all creation too. That just reminded me. He is, yeah, his spirit's in every man. So treat our neighbor with that same love. Be quick to forgive just so we would want somebody to quickly forgive us. And also walk in wisdom. Again, we're not saying to let somebody abuse you. But we do have to forgive from the heart. And if it's necessary, separate ourselves for peace's sake from whatever situation it may be. Uh, anything else, Zakwa? <clears throat> the example is interesting because we just read in the Testament of Judah about the love of money. Like we just read it. It said, beware therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money. And in the case in Matthew 18, it was all about money. Like the love of money caused him to sow the hatred toward his brother. Okay. He was given to that contrary passion. Right. right. And the lust. The opportunity was present. And as lust is, if it's in us. I'm going to take that opportunity. He went right for it. He wasn't a compassionate person. So his and first That's experience. the reason why, right? That's the reason why he didn't pay his master because of the love of money. That for as much as he had not to pay. So whatever he was short, that's what he was going to sell him for. <laughs> the sad part is that he could have said, Yo, take this, take this, and I'll get the rest for you. But that wasn't the option. I don't want to get out of it. He didn't want to give up what he loved. Right. And that's why he treated the other person so badly, because his love of money. And dang teeth of this world. And just then it goes into the anger lesson. These things. Are... All right. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, forgot, as you mentioned that pride when it comes to dealing with money, because money is another lust. If you find a scripture says the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. If you find you're quick to ask people for money, trying to get handouts, but not trying to pay back, or when you get it, you don't pay it back, that's a good opportunity of self-examination to see if you ever struggle with lust, particularly money and pride to be taking advantage of people. All right, continue understanding the hateful aspect of pride, please. Oh, Gad, chapter 4, verse 4. And if it be a servant, it stirs him up against his master. Pride despises dominion, so it stirs up a person against whomever is over them. Continue, please. And with every affliction, it devises against him, if possibly he can be put to death. So when that master holds a prideful person accountable and doesn't let them do what pleases them, the prideful take it, it as affliction and plot to overthrow the person because you're not letting pride just do what it wants to do. Okay, continue, please. But hatred worketh with envy also against them that prosper. So the master is actually doing right. So he was prospering. But the prideful person envied him, then tried to get them to fall, letting anger blind their mind with the net of deceit to see their master negatively because he didn't let them have their own way or the mere fact that he's doing what's right. Continue, please. So long as it heareth of or seeth their success, it always languishes. That's pride causing depression and anxiety for different reasons, depending on what desires you have. 
this pride, like, if you find that other people's success bothers you, it vexes you, catch it. It's pride. Okay? It's pride vexing you. Because it's hateful, it's envious. You know the admonitions to pray for the person to have perfect prosperity and mean it. And also be glad when they have success. Come out of the vexation. Keep your temperance and and no, that's not right. That's great. I'm glad they're doing that. Zach, what you had told me about how you have to convince, I think you said in a lesson too, you have to convince yourself through your works to come out of the spirits. I remember that. Yes. So I know. I learned. <laughs> you gotta convince yourself through your actions. You see, we need practical examples. You see the wrong thought came. You feel a vexation. You gotta come out of it. No, that ain't right. Cut them thoughts off. Not in anger, it's temperance. Like, that isn't right. That's a blessing. Pray Allah and prosper this brother. And that thought is going to come back because remember, it actually has place in you. So it's not going to just stop right there. It'll come again. You have to change it. Keep fleeing to the Lord. Lord, help me. That's it. Like, no, Lord, help me. It, that's that thought. Please help me. And temperance, though. Right. Not, ah, because you freak out. And the thought's going to run because you're out of temperance. That goal is to get us, remember, wrath is to be disturbed. Okay. But for that one, very specifically, if you see somebody prospering, like the scriptures say, the thing to combat the envy is to pray for them to have perfect prosperity. So now you're putting something in action that's actually the right direction. So now you're like, okay, I'm praying for this person to have perfect prosperity. I'm Allah and bless them and keep them. So now you are putting forth something in action that's combating the evil that was trying to get you. And remember, the word is living. So stand on that when the thoughts come back. You know, I did what was right. Allah and prosper me to pray for their prosperity to be perfect. And I'm going to pray for their prosperity to be perfect again, like combating, combating. Because we we got to fast, the fast of righteousness. We got to put in the work. We got to practice it. It's not something we've just been doing and bam, we got it. We have to practice it and make it a new reality. Our new habits. Our habits, our habits should be the law. Amen. That's the goal. That Amen. our habits are the law, keeping the law. And that we're not trying to go the opposite direction. We're not trying to change our bad habits to the law. The goal, but of course, if that's where you are, pray the higher forward to have the opportunity to then start putting the law in action. But we want to get to the point where our habits, our first inclination is the law. And if an evil spirit is coming, trying to take us away from that, then we just sustain and be steadfast in the law. That's the goal. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. Praise God. Amen. So, if you find anxiety creeps in and depression, that's pride causing the depression for different reasons, depending on the desire you have. So if you're struggling with depression or anxiety, you would really have to talk things out with somebody, honestly, somebody who actually keeps the commandments and fears Allah Hayyam, to see where we are resisting Allah Hayyam so we can come out of it. 
I remember it, these struggles, these emotional and mental struggles come from resisting Elohim. Verse 5, please. For as love would quicken even the dead, and will call back them that are condemned to die, so hatred would slay the living, and those that had sinned venally, it would not suffer to live. Look how a hateful pride seeks to kill the living, who have life in humility and long suffering by its works. And if a person is in that hateful pride, any venial mistake made, hateful pride will guilt trip us, not suffering us to live by confessing our fault and repenting, or allowing us to think we can overcome the sin by the hateful sorrow that has no confidence in Allah. So even when you mess up, you got to watch yourself because pride wants to keep you there. There is only two sides of the spiritual warfare. So who is behind all of this and how is he doing it? Can you read verse six, please? So the spirit of hatred worketh together with Satan through hastiness of spirit and all things to men's death. The devil, he won't give us a chance to slow down, to stop and repent and focus, but floods the mind with everything else of the cares of this world and the affairs of this world. And then guilt tripping, judging, critiquing others, worrying about how we look, or worrying about how folks think. Emotional anxiety keep us sped up in mind, not attentive to be slow to act or slow to speak. Continue, please. And gas lighting. Okay. Thank you. I don't remember what that means. I know it means something. What does it mean, please? But the spirit of love works together with the law of Elohim and law of suffering unto the salvation of men. That's the dichotomy. Love and long suffering and humility in man to our salvation with the law, because that's the thing that holds it all together. The word, that living word that keeps us alive or gives us life by doing it. What does gaslighting mean again? You're the definition. Oh, I get it. I see. Oh, then you got it. Yes. To gaslight someone means to manipulate another person into doubting their own perceptions, experiences, or understanding of events. Yeah, definitely, because pride is deceitful. It's, it's going to try to get over or get out of things in any way it can. So when dealing with a prideful person, you have to keep account of things. Whether it be keep text messages, keep records. To make sure you know what happened and document things for yourself while it's fresh so you don't forget. Chapter 5, verse 1, please. Hatred, therefore, is evil, for it constantly made us with lying, speaking against the truth. There's the gaslighting. <laughs> <laughs> Pride is the reason we don't know the law. So the hatred of it speaks against the truth, lying to us. So it can be towards Allah It's going to sin because it's going to speak against the truth. And towards our neighbor where it's not going to be honest about what happened, but it's going to lie for its own means or its own endeavor or goal and confuse us if we aren't firm on the truth. Continue, please. And make it small things great. So you make it small things to be great. That's being petty. Pride is petty. Okay, continue, please. And calleth the light to be darkness, and calleth the sweet bitter. Things are upside down, as I talked about. And that's small things to be great. Remember we talked about overbearing person likes the floor, likes the attention. Pride, if like you do something to them, they're going to amplify it. It's going to be drama. 
because pride is going to take that attention up. It's going to take up your time. It's not going to keep it simple. Okay. Continue, please. Oh. And teach it slander. It's going to evil speak because pride doesn't take accountability. So it has to create you being the reason. You have to be at fault. Someone else. Or it just relishes in being better than people. So let's just talk about people just because that's what makes it feel better. All right. Or some agenda. Or somebody may be in the way of getting what they want. So they have to tear them down to get what they want. Right. Right. You're in the way. You're the enemy. Right. Even as Allah is at the enemy because his commandments withstand him. Continue, please. And kindleless wrath. It's the hatred of pride that makes the pride wrathful to be in emotions whenever we don't get what we want or the thing we want or things aren't the way we want them to be. Continue, please. And stir for war. That's the mental health troubles and the contention with fellow man. Looking for problems when things aren't the way we want them to be. Continue, please. And violence. Pride is forceful. It's not gentle and apt to teach in meekness. So it's domineering. It's forceful and domineering. It's going to hold you accountable to do things that I'm not doing myself. It's going to be hypocrisy. Continue, please. And all covetousness. Pride is rooted in self-pleasing being overly into ourselves, wanting what we want and doing what we want. So we have through scripture, interesting is the hatred and pride that makes it wrathful and covetous as well. Okay. Continue, please. It fills the heart with evils and devilish poison. That devilish poison, as we know, is lust, the root of the devil's wickedness. Mm -hmm. Continue, please. These things, therefore, I say to you from experience, my children, that you may drive forth hatred, which is of the devil, and cleave to the law of Elohim. For he that is just and humble is ashamed to do that which is unjust, being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Lord looketh on his inclination. He speaketh not against the holy man, because the fear of Elohim overcometh hatred. For fear, at least he should offend the Lord. He would not do wrong to any man, even in thought. These things I learned at last, after I have repented concerning Joseph. For true repentance after an holy sort destroys ignorance, and drives away the darkness, and enlighteneth the eyes, and giveth knowledge to the soul, and leadeth the mind to salvation. And those things which it hath not learned from man, it knoweth through repentance. For Elohim brought upon me a disease of the liver. It takes repentance to acknowledge the afflictions we get from Allah Hayyam are actually from him for our works. So if a person, if you're struggling to see that, it's a sign for growth and understanding for wholehearted repentance. All right. Continue, please. And had not the prayers of Jacob, my father, succored me, it had hardly failed, but my spirit had departed. For by what thing the man transgresseth, by the same also is he punished. Since therefore my liver was set mercilessly against Joseph, and my liver too I suffered mercilessly, and was judged for eleven months, for so long a time as I had been angry against Joseph. So as we talked about early on in this lesson, pride affects our health. And we can see it's the source of not being merciful. So many are facing different illnesses because of our pride, lack of mercy and compassion, not keeping the commands or not showing repentance when we do fall from the commandments, but rather justifying or avoiding accountability for what we did. Or the part we played in a scenario. Understanding this 
If you're having health troubles, examine ourselves and see what we may be doing unawares so as to why Allah Haim is affecting us. It could be something as simple as holding a grudge or being bitter about something of the past or continuing in some vain glory of a false perception to others to be liked or be held in honor. Continue, please, in Testament of God, chapter 6. And now, my children, I exhort you, love ye each one his brother and put away hatred from your hearts. Love one another in deed and in word and in the inclination of your soul. For in the presence of my father, I spake peaceably to Joseph. And when I had gone out, the spirit of hatred darkened my mind and stirred up my soul to slay him. Love ye therefore one another from the heart. And if a man sin against thee, cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to him. And in thy soul hold not guile. And if he confess and repent, forgive him. But if he deny it, do not get into a passion with him. Least catching the poison from thee, he take the swearing. And so thou sin doubly. And though he deny it, and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, give over reproving him. For he who denieth may repent, so as not again to wrong thee. Yea, he may also honor thee, and fear, and be at peace with thee. And if he be shameless and persist in his wrongdoing, even so forgive him from the heart, and lead to Allah the avenging. So. God gives good understanding of how to overcome pride in ourselves in regards to when dealing with faults between us and others and how to help someone who's struggling with pride. First, for us to overcome pride, we got to put away the hatred of it from our hearts to love one another in deed, word, and inclination of soul. It has to be complete. We have to mean it wholeheartedly. Because if there's any room, we talked about it earlier, if there's any idol there, any desire for unrighteousness, the spirit's going to find a way in. Now, when interacting with a prideful person, if they sin against you, and you, you got to go talk to them about it, if they confess and repent, forgive them. That's a sign of humility. Like the person is struggling with pride, but they're not trying to stay there. They're willing to overcome they just got to grow got to be patient with them now if they deny it you have to be mindful of pride trying to get you to feel like no nah, you know what you did you're trying to get out of it or something like that don't let that poison of lust get you into pride to then cause that person to further go into pride because they already lied that they didn't do wrong not want to take accountability. But now if you get frustrated, pride is going to get you to get them to sin more by lying again and denying it. And it's going to turn into an argument or back and forth. If you find you're having a conversation and you're cutting each other off or speaking over each other, take the humble route. Catch it. Stop. But hey, I'm sorry. And correct the conversation. Or just let it go. Now, if the person denies it, but you can tell that there's some shame about it, don't try to force the issue because that's going to be pride on your part. Trying to control them. Like you see that they feel bad. Give them space because let out a high and work. They might be at that place in their pride where they know they're wrong, but it's still hard to confess that they did something wrong. And you just see it change in how they act. You'll see it in their actions. You just got evidence to see that they're coming. They're just not all the way there yet. Now, if they're really gone in pride, they deny it, and they're going to persist in what they're doing, nonetheless, forgive them from the heart. They're persisting in it. So he said, leave off reproving them if they continue doing it. Forgive them from the heart and leave to Allah, I am the avenger. This is where don't take it upon yourself. Don't try to act on your own behalf. Pride works in all that. Put it in Allah's hands 
And there are instances where this person, whomever it may be, it may turn to where you have to actually separate from that person because they're persistent in what they're doing. They're not leaving off from it. As we're going to look at in the relationship scenarios, whether friends or spouses and such. You want to not take matters in your own hand and not hold a grudge because remember the devil wants us to think we're as Allah I am to hold grudges and take things in our hands. But we remember in the commandments, our Allah I am is merciful and that's what's going to help us have life with him. Can you read Sirach 28, 1 through 8, please? He that revengeth shall find vengeance from the Lord, and he will surely keep his sins in remembrance. Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he hath done unto thee, so shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. One man beareth hatred against another, and doeth he seek pardon from the Lord? He showeth no mercy to a man which is like himself, and doeth he ask forgiveness of his own sins. If he that is but flesh nourish hatred, who will entreat for pardon of his sins? Remember thy end and let enmity cease. Remember corruption and death and abide in the commandments. Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Remember the covenant of the highest and wink at ignorance. Abstain from strife and thou shalt diminish thy sins. For a furious man will kindle strife as coals are to burning coals, and wood to fire, so is the contentious man to kindle strife. A sinful man disquieted friends and maketh debate among them that be at peace. You get to see all the works of pride. We're supposed to wink at ignorance as the Most High who has mercy upon all and is a lover of souls. But pride can't abstain from strife. It likes the contention. It, it has pleasure in that. It's self-indulgent. So that's the understanding of hateful pride. Next, we're going to understand how pride works in wrath. Can you read Proverbs 21, verse 24, please? Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. So... A wrathful person, somebody has anger issues or trouble controlling the emotions, is proud and haughty. What does that pride and haughtiness lead unto? Dan chapter 3 verse 6, please. For wrath ever aideth such in lawlessness. So we got to understand self-will to do what pleases us is at work and lawlessness and in this angle the spirits get us through being emotional through having trouble with controlling our emotions controlling our reins giving our minds to passions where we're quick to get into feelings about different things the devil works in that and sisters have to be mindful of it because it was a struggle for sarah controlling her emotions Mm -hmm. Of course, not just for sisters only, but just going according to the testimonies. Sisters, the woman is the weaker vessel, so it's something you have to really focus on. And a lot of prayer, cleave to your covering, whether it be father, husband, or if single, cleave unto the Lord and reach out, communicate. You have his ministers, communicate for those of you unmarried or with unbelieving husbands. You have to communicate with, with your covering. Just as for men, our battle isn't ours alone. We have to communicate with Yache. Simeon, who struggled with envy, he said, if a man fleeth to the Lord, his mind is, um, what did they say? He said, Simeon 3 and 4, two years, therefore, I afflicted my soul with fasting in the fear of the Lord. So he has struggled with envy. So he has trouble with pride. He did the fast in righteousness. That's what we're endeavoring upon so we can get over this thing too. 
And I learned that deliverance from envy cometh by the fear of Allah Hayyam. For if a man flee to the Lord, the evil spirit runneth away from him, and his mind is lightened. So we as men, we have to flee to the Lord. We talked about the vexation today. If you get in that vexation, you see that stuff still lingering? That's a telltale sign you haven't flee to the Lord because it's still there. You got to cleave and get away from that thing. Okay. Sisters, likewise, go to your husband. Don't let pride get you trying to fight the battle on your own. That's what you have a father for, a husband for. That's what you have the minister for. Okay. And cleave to the law. Yes. Go ahead, and please. Cleave to the law is actually fleeing to the Lord and going to your husband to make sure that what you're doing is correct. It's whatever law it is or whatever that's coming to your mind. You want to make sure because your husband or your father is your counselor. So you want to make sure that you go to them and get that understanding. Like, hey, I'm having this thought. I cleave unto this law of Allah. I, am. I want to make sure that that's right. Or do you have any other admonitions for me to help me? Amen. And that's abiding the simplicity of Christ because he said your desire shall be unto your husband and he shall rule over thee. So the devil doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to go off on your own and think you know it for yourself and stand by yourself. And he's going to end up getting you because you're not keeping the commands. I would have helped Eve. But Eve knew the commandment of Allah I am. And all she had to do was say, hey, I'm standing on this commandment and go and speak to her husband and say, hey, this is what happened to me. The serpent came to me and I cleaved unto the law that Allah told us not to eat from the tree. I'm just want to make sure that this was correct. And do you have any other ammunition for me? I'm sure Adam would have surely said, Hey, you did good. Cleave unto the law and don't, don't give in or whatever the case is. He would have said, I don't know. I'm just giving something out there, yeah. you know, but, like that's, that's a good guess at it because the devil knew he couldn't get Adam directly. He literally knew he had to go through his wife. Right. So if it wasn't his wife that came with it, he wouldn't have did it. Right. And the devil understood that. As we know, women, you have the power to help and the power to bring down your household. So as we talked about in the women's series, If what you were mentioning, Zach, well, for Eve to have done that, she would have had to slow down. That's not. And I take matters into our own hands. Right. Matter of fact, let's use it for opportunity because the devil came and she got anxious. I fail as Allah and be wroth with me. Sis is, if you find you're vexed, you're worried, you're anxious, you're concerned, you're not sure what you should be doing, or you hastily made a thought and know you didn't actually think it through, stop. Pray and go talk to your husband. And be content not to make a move until you get an answer. Or go talk to your father, whomever your head may be, or your counselor. Cain had that moment. He didn't stop. Sarah, the devil got her because she didn't stop and consider things. But everything was in emotions and it caused her fall. Well, I suppose you have Judith. She controlled her emotions. She focused on Allah and did things the right way. Went to the elders of the city got permission to go do what she was endeavoring to do to save her people. So her endeavor was to help, to be a help meet unto her nation and Allah and prosper her. You know, you have Esther. Esther doubted. 
Because when Mordecai reached out to her, she was like, oh, I can't go before the king. We'll die. And Mordecai, she had respect unto her. her, um, her he became her father-in-law. She had respect unto her father, his admonition. And she committed herself unto Allah Hayyam. She cast off the doubt. Real deal like that. She said, if I die, I die. So, women, you are able to do it. The testimonies show it. All right. And men, all of us, actually, Allah Hayyam didn't give us a spirit of fear. We ought to be sound-minded and in love, trusting, controlling our emotions so that we don't get taken. Hey, Zach, I just realized essentially this was covered in the anger lesson. For understanding of how pride works in anger and wrath, please refer to the anger lesson. Let's move forward. All in all, stay out your feelings. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. <laughs> Be mindful of the vexation. Uh, all right. Now get into some characteristics of this hateful, wrathful, and covetous pride. Pride is selfish. Can you read Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, please? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Vainglory, self-pleasing, that spirit of pride leads to not looking at what's best for everybody, but only what's best for me. It's not lowly, it's high-minded, and it doesn't esteem anyone better than me. I'm better than everyone else in vainglory. So it's self-centered, okay? If you find you only think about yourself, and when it comes to thinking about others, you diminish them or condescending, or the thoughts are in the realm of finding fault or finding issues with them. It's not really about love and figuring out how to work together. Do some self-assessing and praying to see if pride is in there. You got to be honest with yourself. Got to be honest with yourself. Because pride's going to try to cover itself. But you have to truly be honest and 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 really be sincere about how you feel and what you're thinking. Thank you. Also, in that selfishness of pride, he said, "Not a humble man is gonna look on his own things because he's assessing himself from the just and humble man knows the Lord looks on his inclination." The prideful man is not going to look on his own things. He's not going to pay attention to what he has going on within him. But he will also be looking at what everybody else has going on. Because that is where he gets the glory in. To be the one correcting or being the one telling somebody what they're doing or what he sees. So the focus will be there on others. You got to watch that spirit. Again, if you find your thoughts or a lot of thoughts come about the faults of others instead of focusing on yourself or when you're reading scriptures or learning, you can remember what everyone else is doing or, you can, or thoughts come about when everyone else is doing, but it's minimal the thoughts about your own self and how you're doing it and keeping that in mind to focus on your own building. Got to check to see if being glory is there. Okay. Now, anything else, Zachary? No, I'm good. Okay. In that selfishness, the prideful try to take advantage of those who are humble, even Allah himself, thinking that they can get over on him. Can you read Psalms chapter 10, verse 2, please? The wicked and his pride do is persecute the poor. Let them be be taken in the devices that they have imagined. 
Elohim is with him that is of a poor and contrite spirit. But the proud, if they see you're a nice person, they will try to get over on you or think they can because they'll use the gospel because they're going to use whatever. Because remember, an angry man is going to use whatever he has to get an advantage. The prideful in that are going to seek to do that. Yet, what they're trying to do, Allah sees it, and it's going to end up being a stumbling block for them. Yache himself, being poor of a contrite, humble spirit, we have to understand that in our pride, what we've been doing, we've been persecuting him, trying to get an advantage over him by trying to deceive him, trying to fake him out, you know, not keeping his commandments, speaking of we love him in our mouth, but our deeds are far from him, showing where our heart really lies. He wants to see us make a change. Let's see what he said to us in Acts of John chapter 94, please, and chapter 14. Which one you want first? 94, please. He beseecheth you by me, brethren, and entreateth you, desiring to remain without grief, without insult, not conspired against, but chastened. For he knoweth even the insult that cometh of you, he knoweth even dishonor, he knoweth even conspiracy, you know, of even chastisement from them that hearken not to his commandments. So you see that even the prideful treat Allah wrong. Because how we treat Allah is also how we treat others. Okay. But what y'all say it's first John four and twenty. You want to read it right quick? Yeah. If a man say, I love Allah and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love Allah whom he hath not seen? Amen. Because our works show where our heart really is, though we're talking. We're lying to Allah if we're saying we love him, but we're treating people, his creation unwell and not honestly okay. let's come out of this selfish persecution spirit is lying to us too. yes sir spirit is lying to us and deceiving us that we love Allah more than his creation mm -hmm. because if, if we're sitting there having hatred toward his creation and those people that have Yache spirit in them, how can we say we love Yache, but we don't love his creation and where his spirit dwells? That's why, um, who was it said that we, we need to love man and beast? Zebulon. Zebulon. Like, Alahim, that's Alahim's creation too. So if we're treating animals poorly that's another sign that we're in that pride and we're in that hatred that's for sure that's one of the things for the sons of Aaron because it said we'd be puffed up because of our priesthood and one of the symptoms of our pride is that we'll be abusers of children was it abusers of children and beasts actually so gotta watch that stuff And David did, thank you, Brother Johnny. David did say, if we love the creation, it's a sign that we love the creator. So they go hand in hand. All right. Knowing this, let's come out of grieving our Allah by doing good and loving all to show our love for him. Can you read John chapter 14, Acts of John chapter 14, please? Let not therefore our Elohim be grieved, the good, the compassionate, the merciful, the holy, the pure, the undefiled, the only, the one, the 
immutable, the sincere, the guileless, the slow to anger. He that is higher and more exalted than every name that we speak or think of. Our Elohim, Yahweh Christ. Let him rejoice along with us because we conduct ourselves well. Let him be glad because we live in purity. Let him rest because we behave reverently. Let him be pleased because we live in fellowship. Let him smile because we are sober-minded. Let him be delighted because we love. All right, continue to chapter 94, please. Let him rejoice with us because we walk aright. Let him be glad because we live purely. Let him be refreshed because our conversation is sober. Let him be without care because we live contently. Let him be pleased because we communicate with one another. Let him smile because we are chaste. Let him be merry because we love him. Hopefully that helps for getting to know our Elohim. Because through pride, we, we didn't know him. We didn't know his law. Hopefully hearing from him what delights him, what makes him smile, happy. We can have that in mind to know for confidence as well. Remember, we're, we're investigating the deity and the truth. We're going through experiences, learning, applying things. And these spirits are going to continue to attack. And we need our admonitions from our Lord to know when we're actually doing right to not be discouraged, to know we're pleasing him, okay? This is not about pleasing ourselves. All right. It's fornication and lust, making a prideful person insensitive to others and Allah Hayim, in the lack of compassion, withdrawing a person from the goodness of his law. As you recall, we had read the Testament of Judah 17, that fornication, it... um. Withdraws from the law of Allah Hayim, blinds the inclination of the soul. It teaches arrogance. It doesn't suffer to have compassion upon our neighbor. And they rob the soul of all goodness and oppress him with toils and troubles and drive away sleep from him and devour his flesh. So that selfishness and sensitiveness to others, only looking out for self by not having compassion for anybody else, it also helps not only sin against Allah Hayim and man, we also sin against ourselves because we end up getting oppressed with toils and troubles and we're affecting our own health, okay? Now, being self-centered, the prideful are covetous. We had read Sirach 10 and 9 where it spake of why is earth and ashes proud as there is nothing more wicked than a covetous man. Zachary, what does this part mean? For such a one selleth his own soul to sale, because while he liveth, he casteth away his bowels. Yeah, it says, why is earth and ashes proud? There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man, because a covetous man would do anything to get what he wants. Okay. For such a one setteth his own soul to sale, He'll sell his soul to the devil to get what he wants. Okay. Because while he liveth, he casteth away his bowels. So that's bowels of mercy. While he liveth, he giveth that away. He casteth away his bowels of mercy. The selfishness. Don't care about right. nobody. It's all about me. Right. And whatever it takes to get it. Okay. That's great edification to know. What spirit leads a person to sell their soul to the devil and not have compassion and give up all compassion for anybody for the sake of getting what we want? No matter who they got to sacrifice, it don't matter. Yeah. Right. It's usually for the love of money and fornication. Modern day, the glory of the world, money and pleasure. Or whatever lust it is you want. They say in the world, everybody has a price. Okay. No, that's the spirit of pride in that. 
For we know holiness with contentment is great gain to keep us from this pride. Got to be mindful of these things. We may remember from earlier, uh, Psalms 10 and 3 spake of how the wicked boasted of his heart's desire and blessed the covetous whom Ahaya bore. So a prideful person is not ashamed to boast in what they want in their covetousness. It's like, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. You know, declaring what they're going to have, declaring what they're going to be for covetousness. It's not for Allah you know, because for Allah we don't boast. We humbly seek after it. Open Allah Hayyam and enable us. So we got to be mindful of that. And if you find your blessing, somebody that's covetous or you you admire or desire to be like somebody that's covetous, want to examine yourself to make sure pride isn't there. Okay. And Allah Hayyam doesn't like it, though we may think I'm not bad, but we actually have pleasure in those that are doing bad. It actually is not pleasing with Allah Hayyam. Let's read Clement chapter 30, verse 1 and 2, and verse 5 to 9, please. First Clement chapter 30, verse 1. Seeing then that we are the special portion of a holy Allah Hayyam, let us do all things that pertain unto holiness, forsaking evil speakings, abominable and impure embraces, drunkennesses and tumults and hateful lusts, abominable adultery, hateful pride. For Allah Hayyam, he saith, resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the lowly. Okay, and uh, let's see the explanation in verse 5, please. But how shall this be, dearly beloved, if our mind be fixed through faith towards Allah Hayyam, if we seek out those things which are well-pleasing and acceptable unto him, if we accomplish such things as beseem his faultless will and follow the way of truth, casting off from ourselves all unrighteousness and iniquity, covetousness, strifes, malignities, and deceits, whisperings, and backbitings, hatred of Allah, pride and arrogance, vainglory and inhospitality. For they that do these things are hateful to Allah Hayyam. And not only they that do them, but they also that consent unto them. You may have noticed these things come from pride and include the spirits of pride. It's hateful to him. It's against him. And that's the reason we're being resisted, as we talked about. But we're also learning he resists us when we also consent unto them that do them. Continue, please. For the scripture saith, but unto the sinner, said Allah, am, wherefore do thou declare my ordinances, and taketh my covenant upon thy lips? Yet thou didst hate instruction, and didst cast away my words behind thee. This is where a prideful person is willing to declare what's right, but not willing to hear instruction concerning ourselves. And it's more so to tell somebody else what they're doing wrong or to just have the glory of the knowledge of like, yeah, I know about that. But to actually hear it ourselves and conform to it is a struggle. Continue, please. If thou sawest a thief, thou didst keep company with him. And with the adulterers, thou didst set thy portion. Thy mouth multiplied wickedness and thy tongue wove deceit. Thou saddest and spakest against thy brother, and against the son of thy mother thou didst lay a stumbling block. Interesting that this person knows what's right and talks about it, 
but then at the same time is in league with everybody that's not doing right. The vainglory, it looks like, one to be liked. That'll put that person that they acknowledge their sin, but they don't take accountability for it. They have the pride of seeing it and acknowledging it, but still won't take the accountability to actually deal with it and change it. Mm -hmm. Instead, they'll see it and they'll still be around the people that operate that way so that they don't have to change. Yeah, because if I stay in that circle, I still get to be that righteous person in their eyes. Because right. at least I know about, yeah, I know about what this is. I have that glory in their midst. So I'd rather stay there with them rather than take the time to go focus on myself and get away from them so I can focus on me and grow and go unto the wise. There's a scripture that it helps understand how the pride works. It says in Proverbs 15 and 12, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. So thank you. Praise Allah for giving you understanding. In pride, if you're correcting me and you actually see what I'm doing wrong and you're calling out my faults, I'm not going to go be around you. But if I see a group of people who are struggling or they're just at a lower place, I'm going to go find and go hang with them because that's Pride doesn't like to feel inferior. So right. I'm going to see it as like, I'm not on his level. When it's really, I either don't want to be corrected or I don't like the feeling of not being superior to that person because I know they're actually doing better than me. Wow. So I stay away from that person. But I'm going to go hang out with these other people who I know they're struggling. They ain't got it together like that. So that's my comfort zone. I still have some glory here. I can throw out the law, mention some righteousness and say what you should and shouldn't do because I get that glory in their miss, you know. And they don't know no better to call out my father. Right. Puts it in perspective. And in that, we think and we're getting away with something because remember in pride, we think we're that important to Allah Hayyam. And remember, a prideful person doesn't actually investigate concerning the deity and truth. So we really don't know Allah Hayyam. We have our own perception of who he is. And we're thinking we're actually righteous doing all this. Where he's reproving us like, you really, how do you, why are you declaring my ordinances when you cast them behind you? You go tell it to other people, but when it comes to you, you're not taking heed to it. When the wise are around you, you're not listening to anybody. But when you're around people that don't know better, you're ready to spit out all the information you know. And you think you're righteous. But because you, well, you're getting afflicted in your life, but you can't see it because of the pride. You think things are just happening because you're a good person. But Allah Hayyam sees it and he's afflicting you. But you couldn't see it because you thought he was like you. Or like, just think things are by chance. Yeah. Just think things are by chance. It just so happened. Like, yeah. But then if you actually acknowledge that Allah Hayyam was afflicting you, it would cause you to have to take accountability to change. And that's what the person is running away from. Right. Johnny, Johnny just pointed out some well where he said, Thou saddest and spakest against thy brother, against the son of thy mother, thou didst let a stumbling block. The prideful hate those that prosper. So he's going to start. Remember, hatred, love is slander. So he's going to start speaking against the brother that's doing good. Because he wants to bring him down too. Well, it's interesting. It says, thou saidest and spakest against thy brother. So you're slandering one. 
and against the son of thy mother thou didst lay a stumbling block because you're being a hypocrite and you're teaching your brother to be a hypocrite too mm. right and people see it right you may not know they you see know it. How, you know how children are children see everything even the things that you may not see and then it becomes a reproach to you because it's like where is he learning that from and if you can't see yourself then the child is really a testimony against you a person may really think they can get away with all this or not even feel like they're getting away they feel like all oh, this is fine because that doctrine of the devil that we're secure before Allah I am to do all these things. This person actually thinks Allah I am thinks like we do, like either that he doesn't see or that we have the grace to do it. You know, it's just about believing. It isn't about actually doing. Cause look what he says in first comment 35 and nine, please. These things thou hast done. And I kept silence. Thou thoughtest, unrighteous man, that I should be like unto thee. We thought Allah was a hypocrite like us. We thought he'll let us ride with it like we can do iniquity and it's okay. Our own sense of compassion and mercy. Because we want to be forgiven for what we do. So we want Allah to be like us. Instead of humbling ourselves to go learn who he actually is and what he requires. You got to see that false sense of where like Allah just knows my heart and I understand him for myself. When in truth, an unrighteous man, Allah is not like an unrighteous man. An unrighteous man has to humble himself and go learn Allah to be conformed, conformed like unto to his ways right yeah unfortunately the prideful only see it the way they see it and think everyone should conform to their own view or ways even Allah Hayyam. can you read first comment 35 and 10 please I will convict thee and will set thee face to face with thyself. So in that false conception, Allah is going to show us ourselves. And is that going to be in the judgment? Or when we die, he's going to show us the spirits we were walking in, like this is exactly what you were doing? I mean, it could be. Depends on who it is. I know Allah I am showing me myself while I'm here on this earth. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's a blessing, right? He didn't wait till I died. So. <laughs> Praise him for that. Well, but he does get that. The dream. I mean, all right. It's just whether or not you're going to take heed to it or not. Yeah. Well, that Lahayim does convict us to our faces. He brings our sins to our faces. It's just whether or not we're going to cast it from us and keep walking in our pride, or we're actually going to humble ourselves to receive it sure. and take accountability. Sure. Thank you. No. So... Knowing that Allah is not like unto us, we need to understand that he doesn't change for us. He is who he is. And we need to understand him. And that's done through humility. Let's see who Allah is. Jeremiah 11, verse 1 through 8, please. The word that came to Jeremiah from 
Ahiah, saying, Hear ye the words of his covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say thou unto them, Thus saith Ahiah, Elohim of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them, according to all which I command you. And shall ye be my people, and I will be your Elohim, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers, to give them a lamb flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Ahiah. Then Ahiah said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. So we were commanded to obey his voice, but we didn't obey it, nor incline unto it, because we walked, all of us, according to the imagination of our heart, which is one of the seven abominations of our pride. Pride has been hindering us, but we see what Allah requires. Let's see if he's changed from that. Can you read Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 to 8, please? For I am Ahia, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are going away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith Ahia of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? We know he knoweth the proud are far off. So if he's from us and we're from him, we know it was pride. We will resist it. But remember, his heart is merciful. He has no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. So he's calling us back and he gives us understanding. What do we need to do to actually return unto you so that you will be near unto us and have respect unto us? Continue in verse 8, please. This is Micah. Oh, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I didn't realize that. It's all good. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what do if a higher require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy Elohim? That's what he requires. That's the gospel. Humility and long suffering. And we do that, Ahaya. He is who he is. He's going to have respect unto that. Can you read Psalms 138 and 6, please? Though Ahaya be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. If we're lowly, we'll have his respect. And we'll gain the respect of others through humility. Because Levi spake about, if we do the commandments, we'll even have friends. Allah in who he is, he deals with us according to how we're dealing. So you can know, and hopefully it helps for a perspective like, hey, let me do right so Allah Hayyam will treat me right. <laughs> um, Psalms eighteen twenty five to 27, please. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, 
but would bring down high looks. So if we're in pride, he's going to bring us down from it. He's going to afflict us to get us to where he needs us to be. And we know the punishments we'll go through from what we discussed earlier. And thankfully, we have the grace to humble ourselves, knowing that he is given grace to the humble. And we have to submit ourselves. Can you read James chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, please? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, Allah resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to Allah Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to Allah and he will draw nigh to thee. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Gotta resist the devil, staying out of our emotions. Submitting ourselves in humility to Allah Hayyam. And we know we draw nigh, keeping his commandments, staying away from lust and heart into idols. And purifying our hearts and being single, focused on him. And he will look upon us if we put the work in humbly with our whole heart. Isaiah 66 and 2, please. But to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Where the word were actually fearful to sin against him and will not sin against him, he's going to look upon us. We have to grow in that fear with our whole heart. Okay. Pride doesn't give place for any of the qualities Allah Hayyam looks upon, like humbleness, contriteness of spirit. Fearing his word. Fearing him alone now is not going to get us life in his commandments. Okay. Can you read Hermas mandate seven, please? Chapter one, verse five. Wherefore, sir, say I, did thou say concerning those that keep his commandments? They shall live unto Allah. Because, saith he, Every creature feareth the Lord, but not everyone keepeth his commandments. Those then that fear him and keep his commandments, they have life unto Allah. But they that keep not his commandments have no life in them. This is what was told to Hermas after the apostles had fell asleep. And it's the same understanding the apostles had when you read James chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. So that understanding continues with his disciples. And Christ hasn't changed himself. In Hebrews 13 and 8, it says, Yahweh Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And he also commands, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if we want the Holy Spirit, we have to actually do the commandments to attain unto her. So we got some understanding of that Allah Hayim hasn't changed. Yache Lord and Allah Hayim hasn't changed. The commandments have to be kept, not faith alone. But the proud, if a person isn't as they see, they don't think the person is right. Like, that don't make sense to me. That ain't right. And they also do this unto Allah Hayyam, not just people. Okay. Can you read it? Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 10. So you can see how in pride we view Allah Hayyam as not being equal because he's not doing what's right to us in our hearts. Or Allah Hayyam is not equal because he doesn't do what we want him to do. Okay. Go ahead, please. Ezekiel 33 and 10. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how shall we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith Adonai Ahia, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Remember, the house of Israel is a stiff-necked nation. Pride doesn't allow us to change. We thought, hey, I've been like this all my life. We're putting this in layman's terms. If our transgressions and our sins be upon us and we pine away in them, how should we then live? I've been doing this all my life. This is who I've been. How can I live? And you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The worldly mice, but Allah Hayim is saying, why think like that? Why not put the work in? But let's see how the conversation goes. Because their opinion versus Allah Hayim's, right? Verse 13, please, and 14 through 17. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, she shall die for it. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that which he hath robbed, walk in the statues of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Yet the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. Pride doesn't suffer to see another perspective save our own perspective, especially if that perspective is according to the law, because pride doesn't permit a person to know the law. You have the children of Israel, they're against these concepts of mercy and truth and judgment by Allah Hayyam. They felt that if you did some righteousness, even if you do wrong after that, your righteousness should deliver you. So as long as I did some good, I'm good. There shouldn't be nothing held against me. It's the same with Islam too. Yeah, it wasn't about the genuine good. Just make sure you do some good. Right. And then... They also, there's no compassion for people. So if you made mistakes, ain't no coming back from that. If the wicked did wickedly and turned from his sin and did that which is lawful and right to them, nah, he already, he still made them mistakes before though. So ain't no coming out of that. So they said Allah Hayyam way wasn't equal because they didn't see that as right. That ain't right to me. That doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't. That doesn't resonate with my spirit, as one would say. Or in my heart, that doesn't feel right. Even though it's Allah I am speaking, you have to understand, pride is serious. <laughs> Allah I am speaking, but he's speaking through a prophet, so they might not even believe him. But Allah I am, everything is actually in his hands. He makes decisions. Can you read Ezekiel 18 and 4, please? Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, in this respect, the children of Israel, they thought, if your father sinned, that goes down to your household. But I am said, Whoever sins, they're going to die. I'm not going to hold them accountable for something somebody else did. Let's see how Israel responded to it. Can you read Ezekiel 18, verse 19 and 20, please? Yet say ye, why? Do if not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and have kept all my statutes, and have done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. 
the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Verse 25. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, and not your ways unequal? Look at Elohim having the reason, his humility to actually reason with men, though he's on high. And yet, look at the pride of men, where we ask why, why is it like this? But it wasn't because we actually wanted to hear what his answer was. We Like we wanted to agree and understand it so we can do it, because we really just didn't think it was right. Because after he explained it, we said his ways are unequal anyway. Even though he gave us an answer as to why this is the way it is. With the proud, unfortunately, as you see with Alahayim, there's no convincing the proud. They think what they think. You have to just let them stay there. And pray for them. Do things in meekness, even as Alahayim. Answer with meekness, but also avoid foolish questions and unlearned questions because it only leads to strife. Okay. Anything else in that segment, Zakwa? No, that's good. Okay. All right. So we see what we're getting understanding on here. The pride has an inability to listen when it's not what we want to hear or what we already think is right the proud can think they understand already or won't hear something unless it's what they already think or wanted to hear can you read jeremiah 43 and 2 please then spake azariah the son of hosiah and jahanan the son of koriah and all the proud men so, see, these are proud people, so we're looking here to get understanding of how pride works. In Jeremiah 41 to 43, the proud were unwilling to listen and obey Allah or his prophets when it wasn't what they wanted to hear or already thought was right for them to do. As they had decided what they would do or wanted to do before inquiring of Allah So if the answer they get isn't according to what they thought was right, they cast it behind their back. Like, nah, that can't be right because I already know the answer. So they can come and guile asking questions. Just for a little backstory, this is in the time of the Chaldeans. Jerusalem had got sacked. The people that got carried captive, they left the poor of the people. Then somebody killed the governor that the Chaldeans left. So these people, they were scared that the Chaldeans are going to come back and kill them because the governor that he had set in place got killed. They left and already had made plans of what they were going to do. Let's see that in Jeremiah 41, 17 and 18, please. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chinham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them. We see that they were afraid of the Chaldeans, so they were in their feelings making decisions and already had prepared to do what they were planning to do. Making emotional decisions rather than casting care upon Allah and being patient for an answer. The proud Israelites had already sent their minds to flee to Egypt from Babylon based on their fears and own understanding as what was right to do to them. Remember, faith. Faith is not walking by sight, but actually walking by faith, trusting Allah no matter what you see. Now, hey, in pride, it doesn't work like that. And after they already knew what they were going to do, they come to get Allah to bless them in their plans or to say what they want to hear, to understand of how pride works. Can you read Jeremiah 42 and 20, please? For ye disassembled in your hearts when you sent me unto Ahaya your Allah saying, Pray for us unto Ahaya our Allah And according unto all that, our Allah shall say, so declare unto us, and we will do it. 
Dissemble means to conceal one's true motives or feelings. Thus, we see a symptom of pride is dishonesty in dealings. A prideful person may feel one way or have their mind made up about something. They will not be genuine and guileless to be honest with you about it, to see if the thinking is right, seeking counsel. These men knew they were going to go to Egypt no matter what was said, and really only came to have their plans supported because they thought Allah was guiding them as is. So once the answer is contrary to what they really felt was right in their heart, they discredit whatever is said to them. Can you read Jeremiah 42, verse 5 and 6, please? Then they said to Jeremiah, Ahiah be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things for the which Ahiah the Elohim shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of Ahiah our Elohim to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of Ahiah our Elohim. Pride is the beginning of departing from Elohim and mates with lion. So a proud person can say what you want to hear, hoping to get a desired answer and hoping you answer according to their desires as false prophets do. You can visit the lesson on how to identify who's walking in the spirit for understanding of false versus true prophets by scripture. And also understanding when dealing with a proud person, you have to be mindful not to credit everything they're saying because you don't know what they actually have need of, what their true intentions or true desires or true feelings are. Now, let's see how things played out. The proud men came with guile, acting like they would do whatever they were told. And Jeremiah went and inquired for them and got an answer after 10 days later, according to scripture, when you read the story. Let's see what Ahia said. Can you read Jeremiah 42 and 19, please? Ahia hath said concerning you, O ye remnant of Judah, go ye not into Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. Verse 21. And now and now I have this day declared it to you, but ye have not obeyed the voice of Ahiah Elohim, nor anything for the which he hath sent me unto you. Elohim already knew they were going to do what was right in their own mind already. Jeremiah's response to them is before they actually responded to what he said. Yet, Elohim still shared the truth in humility and let them be. Continue in verse 22, please. Now therefore know certainly that ye shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, in the place whither ye desire to go and to sojourn. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of Ahiah the Elohim, for which Ahiah the Elohim had sent him to them, even all these words. Then spake Azariah, the son of Hosiah, and Jonan, the son of Kariah, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. Ahiah Elohim hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt and sojourn there. It wasn't what they wanted to hear, so they had to tear him down. Continue, please. But Barak, the son of Neriah, settleth thee on against us for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon so the prideful when they already have set in their mind what's right the word of Allah if it's not what they already thought they're going to think it's the word of men okay because they already think Allah is with them and in their thoughts and they, they even had to speak against them Mm -hmm. They even made an evil surmising by saying, Barak, the son of Neriah, said if thee on against us, like you operate and that's the enemy. Yeah. That's the same thing they're going to do to the two witnesses. Yeah. They even said, yeah, she had the spirit of Beelzebub. So right. you, know, you speak truth, they're going to make you into a devil. You can see they already plotted in their mind. Like if he don't say this, 
we know is Baruch that did it. We know mm. it's not Alahayim. So the pride really, they think they're wiser than everyone else. So they pride will have you sitting there planning it all out. Like you just have all the understanding and there's no way you can be wrong. Because the conclusion you came to, like, that's the truth. That's what's right. It's no, it's not because it came to you. It's that self glorifying, that self importance. It gets us out of the way. That spiritual fornication and lust at work in pride keeps a proud person from the ability to listen to prophets or words of holiness. So it's hard to have conversations with them as they will justify why. What Allah says by scripture or inquiry isn't right. So it can play out in either case. Like the scriptures say what they say, but nah, that can't be right. Like where you get that doctrine from, like, nah, that didn't come to me. Like that. You're you're prophesying falsely. You're not interpreting that right. Even though the precepts align as they align, it's the feeling. Remember, pride is wrathful, it's emotional. So if it's not according to what I wanted. It's hard to receive it. So this doesn't just happen when you're going through the scriptures with a prideful person trying to discuss something. It also happens when inquiring of Allah Because even in dreams, they won't leave off from the pride of their own way to consider what Allah is showing to help them come out of their own purpose to hide pride from them. But would rather just think the dream was a fearful sight and cast it off, not considering it and it was truly fearful for them because they fear trusting someone besides themselves or seeing their faults because it takes humility to see and confess a fault. Can you read Job 33 verse 14 to 17, please? For Allah speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, and slumberings upon the bed. Then he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction, that they may withdraw man from his pur purpose, and hide pride from man. That's what he's doing it for. He's trying to help us, but the pride don't take heed. This is the reaction of the proud. Sirach 40 and 7, please. When all is safe, he awaketh and marveleth that the fear was nothing. So, Allah shows you something in your visions, in your dreams, yet he's trying to keep you from your own way and get you out of the pride. But when you awake, you marvel that the fear was nothing. Like, okay, that was, I don't know what that was about, but you go on like nothing happened or you take it this unfortunately spiritual fornication also causes us to hear what we want to hear according to our own wickedness like joseph with the egyptian woman when speaking the word of allah to her trying to save her from sinning she just took it as what she wanted to hear to fulfill her lust so that can happen as well or a person takes the dream and interprets it to themselves and gets lifted up in it. Or goes after a desire that they want, thinking it's from Allah. A humble person will consider and inquire to be sure they don't miss what Allah was showing them. Uh, Sirach 32 and 18, please. A man of counsel would be considerate, but a strange and proud man is not daunted with fear. Even when of himself he have done without counsel. So we see the man of counsel. He's going to be considerate. Let me check into this. I'm not sure what this is showing, but let me go to pray about it. And let me go inquire of Allah and be sure I understand what this is showing. Just in case I miss something or I actually don't know what it means. Let me find out so I can make sure I have his instruction. But the proud is strange to Allah Remember, he's he gives grace unto the humble. He's near to the lowly. The strength, the proud person, he knoweth afar off. Okay, so the proud don't know his voice to consider the dream, and to consider how to actually get interpretations according to the scripture, and they're not daunted with fear, so they're not afraid to think 
their way or thinking isn't right, though they don't have counsel on the matter from him. It's just like, I want what I want, and I think Allah is with me, so I'm going to continue my thoughts and my plans because I already think I got an answer. Or I'm anxious about this. I'm not sure, but I'm going to force myself to do it because it's what I want. I don't know what to do, but I'm. this is what I think, and this is what I desire, so I'm going to force it. Much like Saul, when he... um. He forced himself to go sacrifice when Samuel didn't come instead of being patient and waiting. We have to humble ourselves and submit to Allah and casting our cares upon him and stop forcing ourselves to act or coming up with our own things and actually really submitting and trusting and waiting on Allah and knowing that he actually cares for us and wants what's best for us. Can you read it? Sirach 3, verse 17 and 18, please. My son, go on with thy business and meekness. So shalt thou be beloved of him that is approved. The greater thou art, the more humble thyself, and thou shalt find favor before the Lord. You gotta do everything in meekness. Whatever business comes up, whatever affair there is, it has to be done in meekness, trusting in Allah Hayyam. And he'll get us approved by him. And we'll be in company with holiness. As uh, Zach will speak of, we'll have the help. And the more we see he's prospering us, building us, growing us in the faith, the more humble ourselves so we can find favor with him. Because you have to watch pride as it will glory in whatever ability we gain or whatever thing we do. So always remember I'm an unprofitable servant doing that which is my duty to do and glory in knowing that Ahaya exercises loving kindness so it's him that's doing it to bring us out and that inability for the proud to listen if it's not according to what they want really hinders growth the ability to hear is essential for us to actually grow in the faith and listen can you read Sirach chapter 6 verse 33 please if thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. And if thou bow down thine ear, thou shalt be wise. The ability and willingness to listen to words of righteousness and instruction is a struggle for the proud. When people That's interesting. Go ahead. Um, the word obey comes from obedient, right? Yeah, sounds right. right. And to obey... You have to listen. You can't be obedient and not listen. Right. Right. So you yeah. see, the pride is opposite of obedience, which we're instructed to be, or we're instructed to obey his voice. You can't obey his voice if you're in pride and you're walking in your own lawlessness. You can't succumb to the law of Allah because you can't hear it. Yeah, the devil was the first in the accounts not to listen. He said, worship the image of Allah and he wouldn't do it. And the covenant is to obey his voice. So that puts things in simplicity. Growing in our ability to listen with our whole heart and mention and listen with our whole heart. The proud are usually ready to speak what's in their heart more than listen, or will just answer in their own mind. Can you read it? Sirach chapter 11, verse 30, please. Like as a partridge taken and kept in a cage, so is the heart of the proud. So partridge is in a cage. All they want to do is get free trying to get out so conversation with a proud person it's like you can barely talk soon whatever one once you say something they're ready to speak oh yeah 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 that's right they it's instant and if they get the floor they're gonna let out whatever it was in their heart that they were holding on to waiting for their turn to talk 
because there's a struggle to listen because their mind is just they're in their own thoughts ready to just speak rather than actually hear what you're talking about well they're ready to justify themselves everything is about them so instead of actually hearing what you're saying and considering it they they don't hear it they hear the part that they have to justify that's true the part that makes them look bad (laughs) that's the part they hear there's that part and then there's they just hear the part that they can glory in they're like oh i'm familiar with that and like yeah Yeah, me too man yeah Yeah, the dichotomy yeah they have to one up you like yeah i know about that then it runs off into making it about them so if you find you struggle to listen when others are talking as you may be easily distracted with your own thoughts or feelings or think of an answer so you're not paying attention to what they're saying or you're ready to just speak or quick to respond though you don't really understand yet yet you may just want to say what you want to say so that's how pride can work in a person now when talking to someone in pride when you're talking to a person and they start speaking before you even finish it helps see they're more ready to be heard than to listen and or answer your question and usually if they're in pride in some cases i should say in some cases when they're in pride the answer they give you to your question actually doesn't simply answer your question because they weren't really listening or they weren't really trying to answer the question or the answer really doesn't have anything to do with what you asked them because they weren't actually listening in their mind. They're just speaking on what they want to speak on. Or the answer is contradictory to uplifting themselves. So that's why they'll avoid it. Yeah. Because it's not lifting themselves up. It's not, it's not speaking good or praise about themselves. So they'll avoid the answer. Yeah, you know, change the topic. <laughs> yeah. So with these things, pride is at work as a person wasn't listening or just wants to talk about what they want to talk about, regardless of what you're saying, and maybe trying to sway the conversation back to what they want to talk about or making it about them in general or avoiding something that doesn't keep them superior or keep them feeling good about themselves or glorying in themselves so that's general conversation now when it comes to the gospel sadly the spirits of pride also cause us to be slow to learn seeking to be teachers in vain confidence and keeps us from submitting ourselves to them that have understanding can you read hermas parable 9 chapter 22 verse 1 please and the fifth mountain which had green grass and was rugged they that believe are such as these. They are faithful, but slow to learn and stubborn and self-pleasers, desiring to know all things, and yet they know nothing at all. Because it doesn't enter into their heart, as the info is just for knowledge to puff the person up or make things more elaborate than they need to be, as pride makes things more elaborate to the point that it becomes a lie instead of the simplicity of the truth. And it makes the truth unattainable because the heart truly isn't in it. So that that pride in making a person slow to learn, they have to grandize whatever's going on. And it makes it such an elaborate thing that you can't actually do it. And you end up staying right where you are instead of the simplicity of this is what I'm doing. It isn't right. I need to stop this. Okay. The definition for stubborn is having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reason to do so. So if the good arguments of the law and testimonies by precepts Isn't reason enough to change a person's perspective? Stubbornness is making the person stay slow to learn and be healed. Because stubborn also means difficult to move 
or remove or cure. So pride hinders growth to move forward from the season we are in and to be cured from the, our struggles. So a person who won't listen unless it's what they want to hear or think already and not being honest with themselves is difficult to help move forward in the gospel and cure from their struggles because they are self-pleasers. So their own desires make them slow to learn the truth of the gospel because that requires them to change. Continue reading, please. By reason of their stubbornness, understanding stood aloof from them, and a foolish senselessness entered into them, and they praised themselves as having understanding, and they desired to be self-appointed teachers, senseless though they are. So, it's by reason of the stubbornness, by reason of the unwillingness to change one's mind or one's attitude. That's why understanding is standing aloof. That's why if you're seeing you're stuck in a season, you're unable to overcome this certain thing. It's your stubbornness that's hindering you. You won't seek the help. You won't be honest to go communicate, be vulnerable with what's going on. So you can call this thing out and get understanding to know how to overcome it. And it's a foolish senselessness that entered into them. It's an unwise spirit that's at work in us when we're in that position. Yet, we're in pride, so we have information, though. So we praise ourselves as has been understanding. This is where a proud person, when they do talk about their faults, it's long-winded, and they talk as if they already understand everything that's going on with them. And it doesn't give room for you to say anything because they actually don't want to be corrected. So, yeah, like this is what's going on. I already know what it is. So, yeah, and let's move on to the next subject. But then when you say something that's not one of the things that they know, they go into a downward spiral and sorrow. That is true. But it's like you seen something that I didn't see. How can that be? Right. Although they're not taking the time to actually change it, they're aware of it without taking accountability. And a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. So I'm getting their feelings that you did that. Like you're trying to embarrass me when that wasn't the intent. Right. But in pride, you don't want to look bad. Don't want to look like you're less than what you are. So anything you say against, you're speaking against the spirits that's afflicted me. You're trying to help me. <laughs> but I'm in league with those spirits. So. I'm taking it as like, no, nah, you're against me. Right. I can't see it. I can't see it. And I wanted it for myself. So I didn't want to hear it from you. I came to tell what I had going on because I thought I knew. And you're messing like in pride. You're messing with my reality. <laughs> like you're bursting my bubble. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to watch it. I'm comfortable with these, the ones that I already know. Mm -hmm. But you come and you tell me one that I don't know that's dwelling in me, and I'm not cool with that one because I don't know that one. Right. So it's like as long as it's the ones that I'm cool with and I know, they're cool. But you come and tell me that somebody else is dwelling here too and I don't know them, it's a problem. Yeah. And that's how it be. And, and it isn't that the pride doesn't study because it said the, the prideful are learning as the scripture said in Timothy ever learning. So the desire for the information is not actually for helping myself is because I desire to be a self-appointed teacher, though I don't actually have sense. It says senseless though they are, because the truth of the gospel is our walk. I could know all the information I want to know, but I'm senseless if I don't actually apply it. Because remember, we started out talking about how you, knowledge comes with application. You have to have experience to actually have knowledge. It's a senseless pride. So you have to be mindful of why are you gathering all this info? And what info are you gathering? Is it information calling out the things you have going on within yourself? 
to help you understand yourself and overcome yourself? Or is it information that really isn't affecting your growth? Like, are you so caught up in prophecy, but when it comes to dealing with lessons about the fruits of the spirit and the inner man, you shy away from it. You know, like, oh yeah, that was good, but you, your mind isn't set up on it. Like your mind is set up on prophecy. Or you may get the information about dealing with the spirit, the inner man, but you're ready to give that information to somebody else. That's where the self-appointed teacher thing comes in. It's not to say you may not go create a, a channel for yourself, but you go get in an environment where, as we talked about earlier, how Allah Hayim called out the unrighteous man that what have Allah Hayim to do with you where I'm declaring his statutes in the midst of these people that are struggling. I'm getting to be their teacher and have that glory in the midst of them even though I am not actually doing what the commandments say to do. So you have to be mindful if that information you're gathering it and you can remember it when it comes to telling another person what they should do or when you're seeing other people operating, you can remember the scriptures to assess what they have going on. But when it comes to ourselves and when we're tried, we don't remember the scriptures. Or we don't take the time to put what we learned into action. This is that stubbornness and pride at work. So see how pride keeps some understanding. So I read and study and I don't grow in good works very well by reason of the pride and selfish intent of seeking the knowledge to praise myself by the pleasure I got in knowing something someone else doesn't or taking any opportunity I could to tell someone what I know that in the subconscious desire is because I desire to be a teacher, having that glory over someone senseless though I was because I wasn't upholding the things I said. Yet I thought I was righteous because I studied and was trying to do it in my hypocrisy. And I persisted thinking I was in the right track. Yet Allah Hayim saw my works and the fruits of my labors were shown in my life. This happens to those who are proud, stubborn, and self-pleasers, ever learning and studying for their own glory of seeming righteous in word or outward show, but not actually putting in the work to change their hearts and be consistent when no one is looking. Sometimes the much study can be in areas that doesn't deal with our heart, or if we do study things that deal with our heart, it's just a pleasure to know the info so that we can have it to teach someone else, thinking it's saving them. Well, the word is good for them to hear, but it's going to be a stumbling block when they see our hypocrisy. And then us teaching them, we're thinking we're doing good for ourselves. Like, hey, I'm doing the right thing. I'm telling somebody else what they should do. But when I wasn't doing it myself, me telling somebody else was to no profit. And I had to understand that my hypocrisy wasn't for my salvation. Continue verse 3, please. Owing then to this pride of heart, many, while they exalted themselves, have been made empty. The more you learn, the harder it can be to change as the knowledge puffs up in self-exaltation to where no one can tell you nothing, yet you actually learn the wrong things but pride was the spirit at work in what was learned. So having to humble oneself and unlearn or be wrong and start over can be difficult for a person who thought they already knew the truth for themselves. The pride empties a person of our faith. Continue, please. Well, a mighty demon is stubbornness and vain confidence. These spirits get a hold of the proud. Hence, it's tough to see growth. Hopefully, others also get to the point where they realize the knowledge, self-confidence, and much study without their heart being in the right place and doing it for the right reasons to apply it in their own life isn't actually profiting them. Okay, know that this is a demon at work and you really got to confess and get away from it. Continue, please. Of these, then many were cast away. But some repented and believed and submitted themselves to those that had understanding, having learned their own senselessness. There we see again, 
it comes with you have to see it for yourself. I said, having learned their own senselessness, I had to see like what I'm doing doesn't make sense. This hypocrisy is foolish. Then it enabled me to repent with my whole heart about it. Like, okay, this is actually what I'm doing. I'm taking accountability. Now I'm starting that humility process of submitting myself to someone who actually has understanding to go learn, go talk about what I'm doing so I can actually have some sense and come out of this thing. Right. <laughs> and pride, pride is foolish, senseless, and fickle. Did I say pride? Yes. I meant to say anger and then explain that it is pride because pride is wrathful. <laughs> but the spirit of anger, Hermes was told, is foolish, senseless, and fickle. So being in my feelings, it helps me be in this senselessness. Whatever passion it is that's carrying me astray from Allah, you have to be mindful of these things. If we find ourselves in this case, where we're having trouble growing, we're slow to learn, we're stubborn, where nobody can tell us anything, or when someone says something, we get in our feelings, or we have a vain confidence, we're praising ourselves like we have understanding, but in our works, we're seeing that we're not actually applying it, yet we're ready to tell others what they should be doing, or ready to critique others in our minds. We have to take the time and come out of this we have to see it for ourselves come out of the stubbornness the pride of heart the vain confidence so that we can repent and submit ourselves to those that have understanding but it can only be when we actually realize our own senselessness the key is for us to realize it ourselves so the fact that it's hard for a proud person to listen it makes it hard for them to come out of this. So may we be diligent in self-examination to see if we're slow to learn and prospering good works of faith by our own struggle with pride. Can you read verse 4, please? Yea, and to the rest that belong to this class, repentance is offered. For they did not become wicked, but rather foolish and without understanding. There is a difference, as you see. Yet, that's for Allah Haim to judge and reveal where a person is if he wills. So, if we see either one, we just pray for the person. Some will thankfully realize their own foolishness and lack of understanding and come to repentance. Continue, please. If these then shall repent, they shall live unto Allah Haim. But if they repent not, they shall have their abode with the women who work evil against them. That pride, this lesson has been showing how pride is the, the root of it. And we know lust is the poison of the root. Those women that he spake of are the 12 evil women that get people cast out of the kingdom. And we see that stubbornness and pride keeps us right there with those women where we can't come out of the lust of the flesh. Knowing these things, we have to be mindful of pride lest it puts us to shame or continues to put us to shame. Can you read Proverbs 11 and 2, please? When pride cometh, then cometh shame. Pride stays causing mistakes, so you got to see it for what it is and start catching it. Continue, please. But with the lowly is wisdom. Focus on honor for Allah will uphold a humble man as that pleasure in doing his will simplifies life and the living word strengthens the spirit. All right. Continuing understanding pride. Pride is hypocritical and looks down on others to keep from dealing with its own issues. Can you read Hermas Mandate 10, please? Verse 1. Put away sorrow from thyself, saith he, for she is the sister of doubtful mindedness and of angry temper. Remember, sorrow comes after the prideful don't get what we want, just like the devil. Let's see what the prideful sorrow does. Can you read Psalms of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, please? The sinner stumbleth and curseth his life. The day 
when he was begotten and his mother's travail. This is the woe is me thing where we beat ourselves down in sorrow that we just can't get it right instead of acknowledging we were just doing what we wanted to do and what we had pleasure in to be honest and to work to stop it. Continue, please. He addeth sins to sins while he liveth. If you find joy in sorrow and continue in messing up, the pride is getting an advantage. Can you read Hermas Mandate 10, chapter 3, verse 2, please? But the sad man is always committing sin. In the first place, he committeth sin because he grieves the Holy Spirit, which was given to the man being a cheerful spirit. So getting upset when correction comes or grieving or being grieved to admit faults instead of being cheerful, the fault was shown to grow and confessing is showing is pride at work, and that's going to help continue sinning. Continue, please. And in the second place, by grieving the Holy Spirit, he doeth lawlessness. There's the self-pleasing and self-will. Continue, please. And that he doeth not intercede, with neither confess unto Elohim. For the intercession of a sad man hath never at any time power to ascend to the altar of Elohim. Right. The pride keeps us from interceding for the right things because it's our desires that please us, leading us as we want what we want and don't have proper respect for Allah and his will in our emotions for our own desires. Can you read Job 36 and 13, please? But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath. In our heart, we're full of emotions. And it's shown in our hypocrisy. Continue, please. They cry not when he bindeth them. In our feelings, we can't see as Allah reproving us for our works. So we don't cry unto him in repentance and seeking help as to what is going on to come out of our desires, as we should, as the sad man does not intercede, neither confess with Allah since he still wants what he wants. Continue reading Sirach 3 and 28, please. In the punishment of the proud, there is no remedy, for the plan of wickedness hath taken root in him. You have to speak truth with a proud person, but also you have to let them be if they aren't willing to see it for themselves. As Allah I am sure, they have to learn their faults by their own experiences until they are willing to ask for help. It doesn't mean to just let them have their own way with you, though, because you also have to protect yourself. It's just understanding, punishing a proud person. There's no remedy because their lust is what's leading them. They're going to continue doing what they want to do. So when dealing with a proud person, you do have to speak truth out of love for your neighbor because you have to be mindful of not letting their emotions get the best of you. Speak the truth with love. And be at peace, even if that means to separate from the person for the sake of peace. Got to create those boundaries. Right. And those standards. Right. And we're going to get into discussing that in different relationships here in this lesson. The definition of hypocrite in the Greek is an actor under an assumed character, stage player. That is, figuratively, a dissembler hypocrite so it's someone who hides their real feelings or intentions or hides the true facts they're an assumed character so the person they're showing you is not who they really are okay a person who hides their feelings or intentions often by pretending to have different ones this is where a person will act like they're a certain person with you or with those who don't know them but the people who are around them that really know them, they can't fake the funk and they either stay away or they just be who they are in private. Or like the devil, when he concealed his true intentions until the time it actually came out. Right. The guile, the deceit, because they're acting, trying to get over to get what they want. So if a person wants to be liked, 
They're going to try to be that person they think everybody will like. Not being content to be themselves and be honest. We can't get over on Allah Hayim, though. We may try to get over on people. He sees what we're doing. He sees that we're acting in the sight of men. And he sees the vain glory that we're desiring by doing so. Can you read Sirach 33 and 2, please? A wise man hateth not the law, but he that is a hypocrite therein is as a ship in a storm. So a hypocrite is proud. So the law stirs up emotions as it restricts the things they want to do. So they're unstable in hearing it or having to apply it because it isn't what they actually want or what pleases them. Hence, as a ship in a storm, have no control to actually be firm and founded on the rock of the law. Okay? Because they actually hate it, unlike the wise man. Can you read Sirach 32 and 15, please? He that seeketh the law shall be filled therewith, but the hypocrite will be offended thereat. Because that wise man, he doesn't hate the law, so he's seeking after it to get filled with it and make sure it's in him. But the hypocrite, he hates it. He's not seeking after it. He's seeking how he can get around it or where he can find a way to do what he wants to do. So then when the law comes, you try to talk about it or correct the man, he's offended at it because that ain't what he wanted to hear in the first place. It's against him. Good. Yes, sir. There we see how the law is offensive to us if we aren't authentic or we are self-pleasing because it's either correcting our hypocrisy or hindering us from fulfilling our desires or what we think is right. So it won't fill us up by entering into our hearts like the person who's seeking the law with their whole heart to do what it says. Proverbs 11 and 9, please. An hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. The just is humble and actually gaining the knowledge of the truth because his heart is in it, not doing wrong to any man in thought. So his true repentance is teaching him the right way. And he's focused on overcoming his own sins because he knows Allah Hayim is looking at his inclination. So he will be delivered in his trials and from his sins. But the proud hypocrite is different because he is an actor, maybe even trying to convince himself in some cases. Prideful sorrow causes hypocrisy, as we're seeing, to critique others on things we don't do ourselves. The hypocrite destroys his neighbor by judging and censoring their life to keep themselves Lift it up by being condescending unto others, unto their neighbors, for their own gain to feel righteous as opposed to actually humbly helping out of love and yet focusing on their own plowing. Like we talked about in Philippians 2 and 2 in the standard of Yache lesson, you have to actually be focused on your own plowing. And if there's an opportunity to actually help somebody genuinely, you take that moment, help them, but that's not something to glory in. Hurry up and get back to my own plowing. Okay. So that I don't destroy my neighbor by being a hypocrite. Or being a busybody in other men's matters. All right. Caught up in what they got going on. Take the focus off of yourself. All right. Because pride is as a spy, watcheth he for thy fall. So I'm looking to see if you did something wrong, wanting to see it. So I understand how that hypocrisy works. Pride will put on a show to be liked, but burnt out at the end of the day from not being authentic. Can you read Sirach chapter 1 verse 29, please? We're not saying that everybody operates the same or the pride operates in everyone the same. We're going over just all of the spectrum of pride and how they work. Because pride is a spirit and there are spirits, plural. There are spirits of pride. So 
it can vary. It can work in different ways. So that everybody can understand how it may play on different people, but it's all the same spirit, just so everyone understands. Okay. So a person in pride can put on a show, be an actor, to be light. But at the end of the day, when they get by themselves, they're burnt out. Or there'll come a time where they have to actually separate from everyone because they have to recoup, regain their energy because they weren't being authentic. All right. Can you read Sirach chapter 1, verse 29, please? Be not a hypocrite in the sight of men, and take good heed what thou speakest. So we have to take heed to do what's right before others and pay attention to our words so as not to be a stumbling block. Yet, we also have to be the same person at all times, not just when folks can see us. Can you read Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, please? Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul said in this same chapter not to desire vainglory, being self-pleasing. So it's a work of vainglory to obey and be good when in the presence of certain people one respects but not to be the same person when by ourselves or with those that really know us so we can't hide it. If we do right and act right only when folks can see us, it's vain, as we are doing it just for the glory we get in their presence through pride. But if our heart was humble and just, we would do it at all times because we know Allah is always looking upon our inclination as God spake of, if you recall. And remember where he said, Fair and lest he should offend the Lord, he will not do wrong to any man, even in thought. You have that humble man that's focused at all times, so you can know we're trying to understand the spiritual warfare and understand what spirit we're in, or how to know we're in the right spirit. When you see that you're attentive to doing right in everything, no matter where you are, no matter when it is, and no matter what's going on, and you're thinking about Allah Hayyam in every action, you know you're getting closer to him. You're growing in the faith of Yache. But if you see you're having to uphold or act and be a certain person or the person that you want to be in front of others, but then when by yourself you're burnt out, you're tired, or you have to have that quiet time because you've actually exerted so much energy trying to be that person that it wore you out, it's an idol. Because in the firmament, the demons, the spirits, they, in Testament of Solomon, you can go read it to see about it. They can be up in the firmament for a certain amount of time, but they get tired and they fall. And that's the same thing of walking in the wrong spirits. We can be that certain person for a time, but eventually, if we're not really with Allah with our whole heart, we're going to fall out of it. We're not going to be consistent. Okay? For perspective. Now, to have Allah on our mind, knowing he's looking at our inclination and fearing him, to be sure that we don't offend anyone in righteousness, that is, or to offend him in thought. How do we do that? Can you read Philippians 2 and 13, please? For it is Allah with work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. It's Allah that does it. You see, I was not about pride. It's the letting go that faith and trust like abiding in that living law the living word and trusting that he's going to keep me he's he's going to will me to get this done he's going to build me and being on guard knowing that the temptation that comes that's me that's my desire that's the pleasure that i have in that thing that's pulling me away it's not allah i am okay because he wills and wants me to do the right thing and he's working in me to do it but i 
have to be there. I have to be with him with my whole heart because he resists the proud. Okay. Putting forth your hand to keep the commandments is a good start. Like putting forth your hand and start actually start putting commandments and implementing them and start working them. It actually gets the ball rolling so that you can actually start humbling. It is actually the humbling process. Because when you start putting forth your works or your hands to the commandments, eventually you're going to get to the place where you're going to get to the commandments that are against the things that you have pleasure in. So by putting your hand to the commandments and the law, you actually start working against the pride. And the hypocrisy. Thank you. That's great for point blank perspective. How do I start becoming humble? How do I, where do I start at to put this work in? When we're operating as what a just and humble man is, according to scripture, we can know it's Allah I am working in us to do it and willing us to do it. The hypocrisy is at work in looking good in the sight of others, but within still walking in our shortcomings. Can you read Matthew 23, verse 25, please? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You see, we make ourselves look good according to our thinking, but our heart isn't with Allah Hayyam, as it's just a show to deceive others. Continue, please. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Yet we need that spiritual outlook to consider what Allah Hayyam sees in us, and we aren't fooling him and really deal with the inner man and get ourselves right so we can actually be completely clean unto him, which will actually be clean in the sight of others in truth. So that's just like starting to do those commandments, starting with a couple of commandments, start putting those in rotation. You're actually starting to clean the inside of the cup and the platter. And before you know it, if you stay diligent and continuing to, to learn more laws, learn more commandments and start implementing them and start putting them into play in your life, then it's going to clean the outside of the cup because you're going to bring forth fruit. And you said a spirit come from the law. Continue, please. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Can you read Matthew 15, 7 and 8, please? Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. If you find you're a different person when around others, but within and when alone, you aren't doing what you're talking about, or struggling with other sins, you should examine if you're being a hypocrite or is this the real you that you're portraying to others or your heart truly isn't in it by the two versions of yourself. There's the real you in iniquity and there's the one you're appearing to others as, as that righteous man you want others to see. I have to consider these things and be honest with ourselves. Verse 13 of Matthew 23, please. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourself, neither suffering ye them that are entering to go in. The hypocrite withholds info that speaks against their own bad works, so they discredit the truth, 
and won't tell you about it, shutting it up so that you can't enter the kingdom. And they'll shut up the kingdom from you, not showing you the way because they're not doing it or trying to show you an easier way because they don't want to do it to them. But there is no easier way. There's only one way. As he actually speak of, you have to take hold of him by affliction. So a person may not tell you the things that are essential to getting into the kingdom. They'll keep it from you so you don't start to examine yourself to find the kingdom. Lest they also have to become spiritual and examine themselves and change. Continue, please. Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Hypocrites take advantage of others for money and put on a show for financial gain. Continue, please. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye come past sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. A hypocrite loves to find someone to preach to or tell what they know to convert them for their vain glory of feeling like you're a good person or you're doing good works or to have the authority over the person. Yet teaching them in hypocrisy only makes them worse than you because they actually think that double life is the gospel and either run it with it or forsake the gospel altogether when they see you for who you really are. It has to be authentic in word and deed at all times in the gospel, lest you make an unbeliever out of the person, as I've learned in my repentance, as I've lost people through mine own dealings in this spirit in my life. Continue in verse 23, please. Well, unto to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Hypocrites do all the things men see, especially material things, and which alms and tithes it is good, is commanded. But, they don't focus on the weightier matters of the spiritual things within us, like applying the judgments of the law from the heart, mercy in our hearts, and faith in our hearts to work righteousness by faith. Continue, please. You blind guys, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So, hypocrites make small things great in that hateful pride to deal with things outside of ourselves and ignoring the uncleanness that we're nourishing ourselves with within. Sadly, it's a means of avoiding correction to stay where we are, to focus on everything except for the weightier matters of what's going on within us. But pride, one of the aspects of pride is if one resists correction and avoids change to stay where one is. Can you read Proverbs 15 and 10, please? Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Pride is not in the way of the commandments, so the correction of it gets us in our emotions if pride is at work in us like Cain. Continue, please. And he that hateth reproof shall die. Pride is hateful and hates to be corrected because it's hindering the person's desires for what they want. That and he that hated for proof shall die. That's okay. deep. Because that's what saved David. He said, it shall be as a fine oil upon me that shall not break my bones. Like that's actually what saves us is actually loving the reproof so that our deeds can be brought forth before us so that we can change. He's actually given us the opportunity to come out of it and change. Not to say that our way is right. Because if we stay that our way is right, then we're going to die in it. Yes.
recall how it was hard to grow because I didn't want to be wrong. Right. I would take it personal and corrected. And feeling like I can't like I can't get nothing right, or why is it always I'm doing something wrong? Excuses to stay away from dealing with what I have going on and stay where I am. Right. If you didn't have it, thank you. Praise Allah. You're welcome. Praise Allah. Proverbs 15 and 12, please. Uh, Proverbs 15 and 12. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him. Prideful people resent you for correcting them and find fault with you, resenting the words of holiness. Continue, please. What's a scorner? A scorner. It's H thirty eight eighty seven. Um, to scorn, to make mouths at, to talk arrogantly, to boast, to mock, to scoff. A person makes light of the law. It's a joke. And don't take it serious. And it's an arrogance. You think we're above it. This is what happens to, I know this, being honest, from a tribe, Levi said, you shall contemn the holy things with jest and laughter. So I have to be mindful of foolish jesting, not taking the law serious. And taking the walk serious. Like making like it's a game, his joke is all fun and good times instead of being sober minded and, and grave and intent about what I'm doing. Being in that, like mocking it, looking down upon it, thinking I'm above it, like Allah, I am, he got me no matter what. Or I'm above that. I wouldn't love a person that reproves me because you're calling me out, you're making me accountable, showing that I'm not taking it serious when. My not taking it serious is actually to help me stay where I am. So. It says to be inflated is pride. And I will speak against the law too. So if you're speaking the law and correcting what I'm saying, I get offended. And that's again you you're bursting my bubble, you know, you're invading my space, you're messing up my reality. Was there anything you had else there? No, that was all. Okay. So prideful people they resent you for correcting them and find fault, resenting the words of holiness. And now looking at definition of scorner, they also make a light of the commandments, make light of the gospel. It's a, it's a joke. It's a game. It's not serious intently being here for growth and grow and understanding what's needful and what needs to be done. But, and in that, what would this going to do? What would this prideful person do? Can you continue reading, please? Neither will he go unto the wise. Thank you. The proud avoid the wise because the revealing of faults vexes us. So we lose love for those that call us out and avoid them to avoid faults being exposed that they know that we have. We also do it to avoid accountability for our actions by the reproof that we fear we might come. Or we avoid the wise because we don't want to lose our perception as upright or like we got it together before them. Or we just like to be better or seem like we're better so we won't go unto those that are doing better than us, keeping our distance or keeping things surface level when in their presence to avoid any vulnerability or exposure of our true selves to them. Yet, 
we would go amongst those who we feel are also struggling like us or more than us. So no one can hold us accountable for our faults since they are struggling just like we are. Like we talked about in this lesson, how the proud is in company with unbelievers to have that superiority over them. They can still see the person's iniquity too. So the person will be there in the midst of the people that are struggling and try to have that authority over them to tell them what they should be doing. But they're going to cast their words down and run them underfoot because they see what you're actually doing nonetheless. Because remember, one of the punishments from Malahayim is um, reproaches from unworthy persons. Mm -hmm. So Malahayim will be having people see it to call it out anyway. In the pride of life, and anyone who has that pride of not wanting to be corrected or see their faults because they have their own perception of themselves, they run from Christ, lest their darkness should be declared to make them accountable to come out of it. Can you read John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, please? And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So, if our deeds are evil, those evil spirits that have place in us, they actually continue to draw us to the darkness as we talked about how lust works. And everyone that does evil actually hates the light. So, if we're not honest with ourselves to see that, hey, I'm doing evil, that's showing I actually hate the law or hate the light of Christ, we're unable to come to the light because we're not seeing it in truth. We're thinking, no, nah, I do love the light. It's just mistakes. It's just things be happening. It's just other people. It's just somebody making me upset and things like that. Not understanding it can't happen unless it actually has place in us. Some people struggle to come to that realization and accept that truth about themselves, and they don't actually come to the light of Christ, lest their deeds should be reproved, because being corrected is not something that pride is a fan of. So if you find you avoid learning the thing that deals with what you have going on, or getting into discussions to get insight from someone who understands more than you to get understanding of what you have going on. That like we talked about with the stubbornness keeps a person from humbling themselves to them that have understanding. It's hatred of the light because you're keeping yourself in ignorance so that your deeds don't get corrected for you to come out of it. you got to watch pride because you wanting to be or keep your perception of being someone you truly aren't is keeping you where you are and you think you're good. So you're stagnant, unable to change because you don't want to be wrong. So Yachi can't say anything to you through his servants, just as he couldn't say anything to the unbelievers of Israel all those years. Even in your dreams, when he's showing you what you have going on, you're waking up taking it as your own interpretation or you're waking up like it was nothing, that it was just a fear and going on with your life, not withdrawn from your purpose. But anyone who is tired of pride and wants to change, they actually humble themselves to be vulnerable, wanting their deeds to be reproved by the light. Can you read John chapter 3 verse 21, please? But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. A person who does truth comes to have their evil deeds reproved by the light of the law. Continue, please. That his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in Elohim. And that's Elohim willing and working in that person to do so. So you know who's letting go of themselves to be led by Elohim by evidence of the willingness to expose the darkness in themselves for the sakes of their own growth to understand themselves. Now, mind you, the pride of trying to confess our faults in the sight of men have that glory of seeming humble. You got to watch out for it where you might like 
give your whole confession in a public setting, but you're not actually taking the time to like, hey, can we set up to meet? I need to discuss what I have going on to try to get understanding. Okay. With that dichotomy of receiving correction for growth or avoiding it or getting offended when it comes is a simple way to judge within ourselves if we are growing in humility or still in pride. Can you read Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, please? Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Easy measuring stick for ourselves to know where we are and where our brother is when we have to talk about sensitive topics. Yet, the person who hates being corrected doesn't really hate you per se. So don't take it personal. It's really spiritual warfare out here. Can you read John 7 and 7, please? The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. It's hatred of the spirit of Yache, reproving the world and his deeds. So we got to be patient, gentle, and meek, hoping they come to repentance. I also have to be mindful not to hate yourself in truth. Like, don't get into a hatred where you tear yourself down, but hate the unrighteous man that you are and show that hatred by putting in the work to change. Staying out of your feelings, staying cheerful, taking the things in joy that you're seeing within yourself, being attentive to catch it and repent as soon as you see it to cast away the unrighteousness. Speaking okay. a wise man so you can figure out how to come out of it. And a man that you know that keepeth the law. Amen. Now, when it comes to ourselves, if you find you avoid the man of Christ that would a person that you think is wiser, or doing better than you to get advice from them is pride, sorrow, or envy at work to keep you right where you are. You may also come unto the man of Christ, but when you talk about your struggles, you speak like you already know the answers, so you won't have to be corrected by another. Yet your continuance in the struggle shows you don't understand it, or not as well as you're trying to portray you may also avoid talking about your own struggles to focus on others' faults and your hypocrisy to see what others are doing, to see what others are doing wrong, but not actually willing to see it and hash it out in your own struggles. This is also pride because talking about others just helps keep us lifted up, whereas coming to talk about ourselves breaks the spirit of pride by the humbling of having to see and admit faults and ask for help. It's a work of truth to do this, but pride and the truth of Christ don't mix as Belia has no concord with Christ. All right, so we're seeing what's going on. When the proud are in their feelings about their own faults or offended when they hear something that doesn't please them or wasn't what they wanted to hear, or are struggling with the fact that they aren't looking like they got it together like they wanted to look. Or they just aren't getting the attention they desired. They start avoiding the congregation for such like reasons. Can you read Ignatius to the Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 please? Whosoever therefore cometh not to the congregation, he doeth thereby show his pride and hath separated himself. For it is written, Elohim resisteth the proud. Pride keeps a person from the gathering together of the assembly of the saints. One may have different reasons to justify it, yet by precept, Allah shows what spirits are at work to keep us apart. Can you read Barnabas chapter 4, verse 10, please? Let us flee from our vanity. Let us entirely hate the works of the evil way. Flee from all vanity of pride to avoid not coming together for the common faith. Continue, please. Do not entering and privately stand apart by yourselves as if you were already justified. 
What does that word privily mean? Look at that. It means like to come in and nobody knows you're there. Praise Allah. Also, when we do come together, don't let pride also cause us to stumble amongst the congregation, acting like we are chosen or already got it together or being silent and staying in the background. Not to say we should be boastful, trying to get attention, trying to be, you know, in the face of everything. But if we're like laid back, not really being involved, uh, acting like we're already justified. Like we already have an understanding. We're trying we to avoid have, people. Yeah. Right. We don't want to be seeming like we already got it together. We understand for ourselves. And then when we do talk, we only talk when we're ready to spit out all the info we know. Or only looking to talk when we get to tell somebody else what they should do. We have to avoid that vain confidence and that stubbornness and those spirits that desire to have that glory over others or seem that way in the sight of others. Continue, please. But assemble yourself together and consult concerning the common welfare. We got to assemble in humility, seeking out our own salvation, examine ourselves, and consulting together about how we all can overcome the spiritual warfare. So you have the difference where we're not coming in privily, like secretly standing apart, not really speaking, staying away from everyone. But we're actually coming together, gathering with brothers and sisters. We're consulting, discussing the faith, trying to understand these spirits, understand what we need to be doing. We're actually engaged. We're not just here just to be here. We're here to actually work together. All right. Can you read Barnabas 4 and 11, please? For the scripture saith, Woe unto them that are wise for themselves, and understanding in their own sight. So, if I come to an assembly and stand off and try to be that person who just speak about what I know, or only speak to tell another what they should do, or look down upon another in my mind when I see their struggles like that Pharisee looked down upon a publican, or I give off the impression that I already understand everything, either by taking the floor in conversation, that means dominating conversation, being extensive when I speak and not letting my words be few, or being quick to respond like I already know when someone else is talking. These are the things that show that high-mindedness of being wise for myself and understanding in my own sight. Continue, please. Let us become spiritual. Let us become a temple perfect unto Allah. As far as in us lies, let us exercise ourselves in the fear of Allah. And let us strive to keep his commandments that we may rejoice in his ordinances. Thank you. So there we got a good, quick dichotomy of coming in spiritually for the sake of the gospel or coming in carnally. You have the spiritual man who is focused on becoming a temple perfect unto Allah, putting everything he has in it to exercise ourselves in the fear of Allah, striving to keep the commandments that we may rejoice in his ordinances when we come together, interacting with the brothers and being a part of the family, putting our hands, getting involved, seeking, consulting how we can prosper to work and also get understandings for our edification and for helping others. And then there's the carnal entry where coming in, if we do come in, because there can be pride where we don't come in at all, we stay apart from the congregation because we're in our feelings about something. And then, or when we do come, we stand apart. We are not very talkative. We act as if we understand for ourselves are already justified. You can find that in vain glory and like just glorying in being who we are or glorying in that the fact that we're here where when we speak, we're talking about what other people got going on, what's going on in the world. And it's, you can, if you understand, you can understand a condescending speech 
being harsh or critical of what the world is doing rather than actually looking at it to understand it in compassion and using it to, to for motivation or focus to be an example so that people can see Christ. Anything else on that, Zach? Oh, no, that's good. Okay. Let's see what Paul says us to do as a congregation in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, please. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. So there we see, we're supposed to be coming together, provoking one another unto love, being encouraged, and hey, I see you building, keep going. You know, hey, glad to see you, glad you're here, hope everything's well, you know because we're a family we need each other we're in this fight together and we're not supposed to forsake the assembly as we see ignatius to the ephesians show this pride that's at work in forsaking the assembly and pride is in its feelings so you have to be mindful of what's actually keeping you away from applying yourself to make sure you're there to partake in the assembly of the congregation okay because frankly people have time for what they want People have time for what they desire. Okay. Let's continue to come together and build each other up, especially as we're seeing the day approaching. Now, the vainglory heart wants to have all the glory at all times, even from Alahayim. Can you read Sirach 7 and 4, please? Speak not of the Lord preeminence, neither of the king, the seat of honor. So don't seek to be an exalted one from Malahayim, neither a seat of honor or some position or title, Miache the king. Sirach 1 and 30, please. Exalt not thyself, lest thou fall, and bring dishonor upon thy soul, and so Elohim discover thy secrets. And cast thee down in the midst of the congregation, because thou camest not in the truth of the fear of the Lord, but thy heart is full of deceit. It said, from pride cometh shame, right? You see how it happened. If we come and our heart has deceit, because Elohim sees us, he sees our intent isn't right, or we're seeking something for ourselves, and in our heart we think more of ourselves than we ought to think, we're going to fall, and Elohim is going to discover our secrets and cast us down in the midst of the congregation. Everybody's going to see it. So you have different ways. <laughs> you can have your faults revealed by, hey, reaching out, coming in humility, being vulnerable, humbling yourself, meeting, getting counsel, and getting understanding so you can grow, or you can continue staying apart, stand by yourself, and be in the pride, and eventually, Allah is going to show what you have going on anyway. So, And it's all for your good. Because he's going to cast you down to hope and that it will humble you to actually just do what's right. Okay. Oh, can you read Sirach 7 and 5, please? Justify not thyself before the Lord, and boast not of thy wisdom before the king. We know this comes from pride, being in feelings, to justify ourselves, to not be wrong, or boast to the Lord. Yache, as the Pharisee boasted of, thank you for making me as I am, and thank you for choosing me. I can't believe I'm the called, I'm the chosen, like making it about us. Got to watch these things because it's all pride at work, seeking that glory. Pride makes a person feel they're righteous in their heart, and no matter what they may be doing wrong, Allah still sees their heart is righteous. They have their own perspective of who Allah Hayyam is, so they can stay where they are, believing he knows they have a good heart and don't want to do the wrong thing, even though they're just doing it. Let's see what the scriptures say about it. Can you read? We're going to be in Sirach 5 and 2, please. Follow not thy own mind and thy strength to walk in the ways of thy heart. A person that is doing this, they actually have a sense of security that it's okay to do it. You have the doctrine of the devil that you're secure before Allah Hayyam, 
that no matter what you do, it's going to be okay. And then you have the thoughts that he is going to be. Matter of fact, let's see what the thought is to stay in that. Can you read verse 6, please? Chapter 5, verse 6, Zach. And say not, his mercy is great. He will be pacified for the multitude of my sins. For mercy and wrath come from him, and his indignation resteth upon sinners. So you see what the mindset is to be able to walk in the ways of my heart, thinking his mercy is great. I have grace. I'm under his grace. He's going to be pacified no matter what I do for the multitude of my sins. He knows my heart. But this actually isn't true. And what it does to a person, it lifts us up to think I'm that important to Allah. I am. He's going to be pacified for the multitude of my sins. Now, nobody can tell me anything. No man can judge me, right? Read, please, chapter 5, verse 3. And say not, who shall control me for my works? For the Lord will surely revenge thy pride. You see what happens. It's pride that's doing this. The pride is saying, Allah is going to be pacified for the multitude of my sins. I can do no wrong. His mercy is great. He loves me that much. And then what can a man tell me? Who can control me for my works? The Lord knows my heart. There's nothing you can tell me. My heart is good. Whatever happened, that happened. But my heart is right with him. So I'm fine. Don't say anything to me. But what's Allah perspective on this mindset, this type of perspective? Can you read Isaiah 65 and 5, please? Which say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are smoke in my nose, fire that burneth all the day. So that's that person that's like, stand by thyself, come not near me. Don't you say anything to me. Who shall control me for my works? Because the Lord knows my heart. I'm holier than thou. Like, I'm better than you. Leave me alone. You just don't understand the relationship I have with the Lord. That actually angers Allah Hayyam. So you can understand it. That relationship isn't accurate. And unfortunately, when a person is in that mindset, though, they see their life. Let's see how they see their life. Can you read Sirach 5 and 4, please? Say not, I have sinned, and what harm hath happened unto me? For the Lord is long-suffering. He will in no wise let thee go. Look at how... In pride, how we see Allah Hayyam's long suffering. We thinking, ain't nothing happening to me because he loves me. He knows my heart. Not understanding. And you know you've sinned. I know I did wrong, but ain't nothing happened because I have that grace. He's pacified for the multitude of my sins. You just don't understand grace. Stand away from me. Stop trying to control me. But Allah is actually long-suffering, but he's not going to let thee go. Because you're not seeing it aright, yeah, things might be going well for a while. He's hoping you'll repent, but your fall, remember, what is it? Pride cometh before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. He is seeing it, and unfortunately, we are actually just setting ourselves up for something that's going to hit us later. And in the punishment of the proud, there's no remedy. Unfortunately, we're not going to even acknowledge that that was from Allah. I am. We're going to stay there thinking, man, the devil's trying to get me. Not knowing Allah is trying to correct me because we're not seeing it aright. Mercy and wrath come from him and his indignation resteth upon sinners. We have to understand that. Like, that's not going to please Allah I am if I'm sinning. That angers him. If I continue doing what I'm doing, he's had mercy on me to let me be at this time, hoping I repent. Let me go ahead and not tarry. Matter of fact, <laughs> verse 7, please. <laughs> Sirach 5 and 7. 
make no tarrying to turn to the Lord, and put not off from day to day. For suddenly shall the wrath of the Lord come forth, and in thy security thou shalt be destroyed, and perish in a day of vengeance. We need not to make no tarrying. Stop thinking that I've sinned, nothing's happened to me, his mercy is great, he's going to be pacified for a multitude of my sins. If we think like that, and we stay in that security thinking, I have grace, I have um, security, somebody's going to secure me before Allah I am, even though I've done all this iniquity, though I say I believe and I'm continuing in sin, suddenly wrath is going to come from him. Something's going to happen to show I wasn't doing right. And in what I trusted in, that belief, that belief of the devil that I can sin and I'm going to be secure before Allah I am, I'm going to be destroyed in it. Don't trust our hearts. Yes, the heart does accuse us. When it's accusing, trust that. <laughs> don't let that pass all by. But don't trust in the heart to think we should actually be led by our heart. We're supposed to be led by the Spirit, having the renewal of the Spirit in our mind. We have to be seeking the law, the commandments, the judgments, the fruits of the Spirit to change our mindset and be attentive in our mind to what is coming into it to stop it before it gets to our heart. Because we're fasting a fast of righteousness. We have to stop the evil from coming in to purge the evil that's already in our heart. Okay. How should we view our heart, our own personal perspective? Can you read Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, please? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, Ahia, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Ahia himself is saying what the heart is, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It's always seeking to do something it shouldn't be doing from the poison that was poured into us from the beginning. And now he is watching the heart to give us all according to our ways and according to the fruits of our doings. So in taking accountability, we have to see what we're doing and acknowledge it, knowing like this is from something, I got to correct this. Or understanding like, okay, finally I'm growing because there's levels to it. I'm growing, I'm seeing, I'm doing better. Now I know no matter what, it's from Allah I am. This is for my good. He's building me. He's helping me see, okay, I got to do better at this. Oh, what did I do to bring this about? Let me inquire. Understand that he's actually watching. He's paying attention to what's in our heart and he's trying our reins testing our minds to see if we're going to keep his law or not. Proverbs 16 and 2, please. All the ways of a man are clean in its own eyes, but a higher way of the spirits. Judah went into how our mind is the middle ground. The spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit is there for us to go the direction we will. And that high is weighing the spirits to see what are we surrounding ourselves by. Is it humility, long-suffering, being gentle, being temperate, the fruits of the Spirit? Or is it the lust of the flesh, pride, lust, vainglory, fornication? We have to be mindful of that and pay attention and not let pride get us stirred up out of ourselves to do what's right. Can you read Proverbs 28, 25, please? He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. So if pride is in us, it's going to lead to mental stress, mental health issues. Okay. Pride is not peaceful. It's emotional. It's hateful. It's covetous. It's desirous. It's self-pleasing. Okay. And those things are going to stress us out. All right. Can you read Sirach 27 and 15, please? The strife of the proud is bloodshedding. And their revelings are grievous to the ear. So now if you're interacting with a proud person or pride is working within us, pride weighs down on us. The strife of pride is bloodshedding, the dropping of blood. 
Zach always explained to me, as blood continues to drop, it eventually kills. You lose enough, it's going to kill you. Pride, the strife of the proud, when that spirit comes in, it brings so much stuff along with it, it weighs you down and it drains you slowly. It's going to continue to press on us to get us to into sorrow or to stay in sorrow and sin. It beats now, you down to depression. Yes, it does. It beats you down to depression. And over time, as it weighs on you and as it continues to beat you down, it puts you into depression that eventually you start having health complications and health issues. So you actually end up deteriorating and dying away. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, when interacting with a prideful person, that strife, that relationship with them, whether it be a friend, spouse, or whatever, they're going to wear on you. It's going to wear you down. It's going to be stressful. You'll find they're affecting your mental health <laughs> because of pride is a spirit. It's affecting the person within, and it's going to affect those around it, especially if you've ever been around someone with depression. Depression is depressing, okay? And then there are those who struggle with pride and liking to argue, liking to debate. There's always a problem or they're always looking for a problem because pride watches for thy fall. It's looking for issues. It's hateful. It makes small things great. Those revilings, it says, and their revilings are grievous to the ear. Reviling is to criticize someone strongly or say unpleasant things to someone or about someone. So in pride, a person is going to be hard to have to interact with. Having conversations are tough because they're getting in their feelings. They're criticizing you. They always have something to say. They're overbearing. That wears on you too. It's grievous. It stresses you out. Okay. Or their words are just hard. Like it's, it's just tough to be around them. Can you read Sirach 27 and 28, please? Mockery and reproach are from the proud, but vengeance as a lion shall lie and wait for them. I remember we talked about how the heart of the proud, they think Allah is great in mercy and they'll be forgiven for whatever they do and nothing's happened to them and no man can control them. So they're doing what they want and saying what they want. There's mockery, a scorner, mocks at the commandments. They'll mock at people that are trying to do the right thing. Or they'll mock at others who are doing things that they look down upon. And their reproach comes from them. They always have something negative to say. Or something that casts down another person to lift themselves up or keep themselves superior in their own perspective. But unfortunately, those all those works are leading to their own hurt. As Allah I am, something will happen to them to help bring them to humility. That same prideful person that reproach comes from, like Sirach 11 and 30 says, like as a spy, watcheth he for thy fall. They're going to be looking for issues. It's going to be tough to be with them because there's always a problem. And they're always complaining about something because anytime they don't get what they want or things aren't the way they think it should be. It's a problem. And like as a partridge, they have something to say. They're like as a partridge taken and kept in a cage. So is the heart of the proud. They're itching to get to say what they have to say. There's not consideration for you or compassion for you and how you feel or you and what you have going on. They need the floor and they just require a lot of attention. It's overbearing. Uh, can you read Sirach 27 and 29, please? They that rejoice at the fall of the righteous shall be taken in the snare, and anguish shall consume them before they die. They that rejoice at the fall of the righteous shall be taken in the snare. The proud, like we talked about, they don't like to see people doing better than them, or when they're doing bad, they like to see people in the same position. So there's a delight when they see someone isn't doing well or when they see someone fall. And that's going to be a snare because that lack of compassion actually causes the spirits that person's struggling with to end up attacking you for lack of compassion as it befell Judah, as we talked about a lot earlier in the lesson. 
So you have to be mindful and have compassion for people. Like a true church member, according to the Acts of Peter, when somebody fell, they all looked upon themselves like, man, is Allah going to forgive us? To know what people that are walking in humility, how they look at somebody else's fall. They, they want to see the person get back up and continue striving. And they also consider their own faults to make sure they stay in humility. Okay. Uh, Sirach 23 and 8, please. The sinner shall be left in its foolishness. Both the evil speaker and the proud shall fall thereby. Remember that definition of folly was also egotism. So that proud person, they're going to be left in what they're doing because they have to come to repentance of their own accord. They have to see it for themselves. All right. So that gives us understanding that you got to have patience with them. You may not be able to continue being with them or being around them per se, but you have to have patience in the heart. As Gad said, if they won't leave off and persist in their iniquity, leave off reproving them and leave the vengeance to Allah Hayyam. Let Allah Hayyam do what he does to help bring that person to where they need to be so that they'll be converted. Okay. Anything else on that whole thing, Zachra? No, we're good. Okay. Now, jumping into the proud look. We see the heart. Now, let's understand the countenance. Sirach 19 and 29, please. A man may be known by his look, and one that hath understanding by his countenance, when thou meetest him. When Allah helps you understand with spiritual eyes, according to the law and testimonies, looking according to the commandments, you can see the manifestation in the countenance of the spirits at work in a person's thoughts. Psalms 10 and 4, please. The wicked, through the proud of his countenance, will not seek after Allah Hayyam. Allah Hayyam is not in all his thoughts. The pride shows in the face and is an indication of that spirit leading us because it will stop us from seeking after Allah Hayyam and his judgments to have a peace of mind. When we seek after Allah Hayyam and his judgments and we're content in that, we'll show a cheerful countenance knowing that when that perfect long suffering without any of that wormwood of our feelings deterring us from the chair, trusting that everything that's before us is good. It's coming from Allah Hayyam. Let's see what he has for us. Continuing Sirach 37 and 17, please. The countenance is a sign of changing of the heart. Knowing that, don't take the countenance change lightly. You got to catch it. Don't brush it off as nothing, but hurry up and confess the fault and focus on the faith. We have to be very self-aware of vexation and the change of our countenance. Can you read Sirach 13 and 25, please? The heart of a man changes his countenance, whether it be for good or evil, and a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. The scriptures stand true. We got to actually be cheerful in truth. So when our face is changing, it's letting us know something's going on with our heart, and we need to be aware and catch that. Continue, please. A cheerful countenance is a token of a heart that is in prosperity. That's how we know. In that humility and long suffering, that chair will be there with you. Okay. Easy ways to know our long suffering is growing when we are consistent in chair because long suffering is prosperous. Can you read Hermas, Mandate 5, Chapter 2, Verse 3, please? But long suffering is great and strong. Mm -hmm. And has a mighty and vigorous power, and is prosperous in great enlargement, gladsome, exalting, free from care, glorifying the Lord at every season, having no bitterness in itself, remaining always gentle and tranquil. This long suffering, therefore, dwelleth in those whose faith is perfect. Amen. So, if we desire to perfect our ways, we got to focus on chair to be long suffering and take heed to our countenance as it shows wherein we need to grow in our heart because it shows whether good or evil is in us. When pride is in us and Allah is not in all our thoughts, 
Our actions will show the works of pride if we didn't take heed to ourselves when we got vexed and our countenance changed. You know, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. So when that strife comes, that's that mental warfare striving against Allah Hayyam. When pride's going to show in our face because peace is not dwelling in us to seek after him. But strife of spirits in us is disturbing our soul to get the Lord out. We are vexed and start talking to ourselves or feeling overwhelmed. When we're like that, we're getting taken over. We need to be attentive to that. Can you read Psalms 59 and 12, please? For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for cursing and lying, which they speak. All right. From what this verse is showing, from the sin of our mouth and the words of our lips, pride is already in us. It's in our mind. It's in our heart. And we're talking according to it. So then we're going to get overtaken. As it said, let them be taken in their pride. So we have to be mindful when we entertain pride and the spirits that come with it, it overtakes us. We have to catch ourselves when we are in our heads murmuring or disputing about things or worrying about things, vexed or anxious about things, trying to figure things out on our own. We got to be mindful of what spirits are at work. Can you read Philippians 2 and 14, please? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. So stop going through it in our minds. Stop, pray. And be clear in our minds and remember Allah Hayyam and keep silent so that we can actually hear him and read his law to know his will so that we can learn his thoughts. Can you read Naphtali 3 and 1, please? Be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness or with vain words to beguile your souls. Because if ye keep silence and purity of heart, ye shall understand how to hold fast the will of Allah Hayyam. And to cast away the will of Belia. Don't let the devil speed you up to fall, even in thought, through that hateful pride. Pride and covetousness. They work in the hastiness of hatred and the eagerness of covetousness to get us to corrupt ourselves and corrupt our doings. Okay? With vain words, getting in our feelings. Okay? Yeah, that can that can go all the way to you feeling like you're further than you are in the walk. Yes, so sir. Right. Instead of slowing down and actually saying, hey, okay, I need help in this area. Let me slow down so that I can make sure that I get it right. You're like, I should be able to do it quickly. I should be able to calm down quickly. I should be able to to gather myself and control myself. So instead of actually taking the time and actually controlling and gathering yourself, you try to do it quickly to show that you're further than when you are and then you fall. So you see the pride and then you see the covetousness because you want to be further along than where you are. There's also the deceit and self-indulgence where, you know, I know I'm not in the right spirit. I know I'm feeling sped up. I'm feeling anxious, but I hurry up and say, okay, I got to do this right. And then I just go so that I can give myself the excuse of, oh, I tried, but I just was hurrying up so I can fulfill my desire. That's the other side of it. Yeah, covering all things today. Make sure we get as much as we can in this sitting in this session. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if we keep silent and purity our heart, take our time, like Zach was speaking of, we shall understand how to hold fast the will of Al Hayam and to cast away the will of Belier. Understand how true that is. Imagine if Eve would have sat still <laughs> and kept silent in <laughs> purity of heart. <laughs> like, uh, let me sit out. <laughs> I'm gonna wait. Let me wait. Let me wait for my husband. I don't know what it is you're talking about. So let me I'm gonna sit down. 
Because Satan came. I don't know if everybody knows. Satan came when the angels went to Elohim. So the angel, her righteous angel, would have came back eventually, even if she would have just sat there. Right. So don't take that light. Like sometimes when it's required, sit still. Ain't nothing to say. Don't move. Say, well, there is something to say for respect. Like, excuse me, give me a moment. I'm sorry. I need a moment. But sit still. And it's not about pleasing men or being a respect of men. Like we have to do what we have to do to keep the commandments. So don't let the devil speed you up. Okay. Don't let him do it through that hateful pride. Because God already said in God 4 and 6, for the spirit of hatred, work it together with Satan through hastiness of spirit and all things to men's death. But love work it together with the law of Allah I am in long suffering unto the salvation of men. Love with the whole heart and keeping Allah I am in mind, believing he is working in us. When we keep peace within us and silence and purity our heart to give him place to work in us, that's helpful to stay in long suffering. Hello. Trusting that I'm doing what he said to do. I've sat down. I'm waiting to hear. And I'm not going anywhere until I get guidance, until I have peace and I'm calm. Not peace to do what I want to do, but peace to know what's right. Okay. And in that patience and trust, what will happen? Proverbs 28, 25, please. But he that putteth his trust in Ahia shall be made fat. Fat with the fruits. Because it's Allah that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He wants us to attain unto this. But we have to do it according to how he wants it done. <laughs> we can't do it our own way. <laughs> right. <laughs> we got to get to know him, right? <laughs> That's right. 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 Not him, no us. Right. right. Like we have some importance. It's interesting. Like we're we're special when we're doing what's right. When we're doing what's wrong, Allah says he can raise up stones unto the seed of Abraham. When we're doing what's wrong, just like he said, we're counted as spittle. When we're not doing what's right. We're worthless, just like a man that has wicked sons. It's like he doesn't have any. But when we're doing what's right, we are special. So right. we have to be mindful of that. Okay. So he said, if we obey his voice, we will be his peculiar treasure, a peculiar people. Full of good works. Thank you. So we walk in that patience and temperance and slowing down, clearing our minds and controlling our emotions. Allah is doing this in us according to his good pleasure that we may be blameless and harmless and truly the sons of Allah without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom we will shine as lights in the world to help Christ's kingdom come forth. And it really takes humility because that light that's shining isn't going to make everybody love us because they actually hate Yache, who don't want to come to his light. So you have to be content with what he provides is enough. His love is contentment. Now, this comes with growth and understanding, temperance and practice at doing works of truth. So don't be deterred in the learning process, but entertain righteous thoughts. And be quick to repent and get back to plowing if you fall, as we talked about in Asher, about the righteous entertaineth righteousness and repenteth quickly, as opposed to the wicked who continues in sin, being in his feelings. Now, getting into understanding the effects of pride on friendships and relationships. In any relationship, pride makes it hard to have peace 
and a healthy building environment to be in agreement. Can you read Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, please? A friend love it at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. We need friends and brothers in the adversity of this walk, but we have to be like-minded, seeking after the same things in righteousness to be a help to one another. Proverbs 17 and 27. Proverbs 27 and 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so as a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Thank you for the correction. I just realized what I said. <laughs> Our, fr okay. <laughs> Our friend in the faith will help keep us accountable. All right. Your friend actually sharpens your countenance. He helps cheer you up to actually do us right. Okay. He helps you see, hey, you're going into sorrow. Take some time to breathe. Hey, remember the commandments. Like, hey, you you okay? Like when you have that relationship where you know your friends actually for you to do righteousness, not actually to justify you or to be a yes man, so to speak. Or to tear you down. Yes, sir. You know, when your friends like, you okay? Or everything good? It's like, huh, maybe he's seeing something. Let me assess. Or being honest with my friend, like, ah, I'm not feeling good today, man. This and this is going on. So you can talk about it. Allah, I am in the midst because you're being honest with each other. Let's look in the scriptures. He's going to sharpen your countenance. Oh, okay. So that's what I was doing. That's what was happening. I appreciate it. Praise Allah, I am. Now I can get back to chair and have a good day. Okay. Proverbs 27 and 6, please. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. All right. Getting that correction. As David said in Psalms 141, 5, please. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. So that faithful wound of a friend smites me kindly. His correction is as excellent oil. He's It's an anointing. It's not breaking my head. It's helping me attain unto the salvation we're both seeking after. When he says, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. What does that mean? I don't know. Right. He's praying that they don't fall. Oh, so they're smite. Oh, that's that love. Like he's not resenting the correction that comes from his friend. He doesn't grow bitter or think like, oh, why you always got something to say? He's not getting into pride, looking for his friend to fall, but he's not envious. So when his friend corrects him, he appreciates it. He takes it as a kindness. Like, thank you, brother. That's love. And then I'm going to also pray for you, for your faith to be perfected. And I'm going to pray as you're struggling or whatever you're going on, with, I'm going to pray that you also be prospered too. Okay. And you they don't are fall calamity. into calamities. Right. He don't want to see you fall just because he's fallen. He's not a crab in a bucket. Right. It's the opposite. Right. A true friend. It's good understanding for us here today, brothers and sisters. Praying for perfect prosperity. Amen. Amen. We have to have love and truth to gain true friends in the faith. Can you read Proverbs 18 and 24, please? A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Sirach 26 and 5, please. Sirach oh, 26 and 5? No such thing. Sirach okay. 26. <laughs> Sirach 6 and 5, please. Sweet language will multiply friends. And a fair speaking tongue will increase kind greetings. So it's good to show yourself friendly. It's good to speak sweetly to people, to be fair speaking, to be kind. Yet you have to take your time when choosing friends and understand who they are and what they really are about through experience. Okay. So we're going to read Sirach chapter 6, verse 7 through 
17, please. Okay. So right, chapter 6, verse 7. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. For some man is a friend for his own occasion, and will not abide in the day of trouble. And there is a friend who, being turned to enmity and strife, will discover thy reproach. Again, some friend is a companion at the table, and will not continue in the day of thy affliction. But in thy prosperity he will be as thyself, and will be bold over thy servants. If thou be brought low, he will be against thee, and will hide himself from thy face. Separate thyself from thy enemies, and take heed of thy friends. A faithful friend is a strong defense, and he that hath found such a one hath found a treasure. Nothing doeth countervail a faithful friend, and his excellency is invaluable. A faithful friend is the medicine of life, and they that fear the Lord shall find him. We have to keep the commandments to find a faithful friend, as righteousness destroys the blindness of the darkness to see a right and to know a true friend. And once found, the fear of the Lord will prosper the relationship. Continue, please. Whoso feareth the Lord shall direct his friendship aright. For as he is, so shall his neighbor be also. Having friends is good. And it's interesting that as he is, so shall his neighbor be also. If I'm in pride and I'm hurting myself, I'm going to also hurt my friends and do them wrong because I do myself wrong. But if I'm actually keeping the commandments and holding myself accountable as I am walking in the fear of the Lord, I'm going to also be of that same mind towards my friend and make sure he's on point also. We're going to actually prosper together. All right. Can you read Sirach 6 and 6 so we can see that Yes, it's good to have friends, but when it comes to counselors, it's a bit different. Continue, please. Be in peace with many. Nevertheless, have but one counselor of a thousand. Okay. In the midst of friends gained, be at peace with all, yet learn and understand which one friend is your counselor. Okay. And touching on some of the things in regards to friends, definitely make sure you pay attention because Paul said, like he told Timothy, um, lay hands suddenly on no man because some men's sins are shown forthwith and some are shown hereafter. So you got to pay attention and learn people and knowing how pride works. Pride is in the world. So not every person is honest, giving you an honest perception of who they are. They sometimes may be just showing you the person they want you to see. Mm -hmm. And some people are a friend for their own occasion. There may be something they need from you or they want from you or some benefit or advantage they feel they might get from being around you or being associated with you. And but when you're in trouble, they won't be there. They'll not abide in their trouble. Because there's a friend. Also, you got to watch out. Some people, they're only friends when things are good. A good way to know or see a friendship build is when something comes up, when there's actually something to talk about that there may be a fault because a friend slips, friends make mistakes. But you know, matter of fact, we're going to touch on that here shortly <laughs> to see how you can know your relationships going in the right place and know that a person's a true friend. But you have to be mindful because some friends, when they don't like you, they'll be telling the things that you told them in secret. So you have to be mindful not to open your heart to every man because every man is not truly your friend. All right. And some will be a companion at the table. They'll be cool with you when everything's good, but won't be with you when you're going through the struggle. All right. Anything else you have, Zach, well, before we continue? No, that's good. Okay, um, having one counselor, how do we identify a counselor? Can you reread 37 and 12, Sirat 37 and 12, and then verse 15 and 16, please? 
So Acts chapter 37, verse 12. But be continually with the holy man, whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord, whose mind is according to thy mind, and will sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry. So Acts right, chapter 37, verse 15. And above all this, pray to the Most High, that he would direct thy way in truth. Let reason go before every enterprise, and counsel before every action. So, you got to pray to the Most High first, so that he will direct your way in truth. But don't trust in your own understanding, but go speak with that holy man that will help you. And let reason go before enterprise and counsel before every action. So you have an idea, something comes to mind, set your protocols to keep yourself from falling by going to get counsel and make sure you get the proper reasoning before taking on that enterprise. And it's interesting in trying to gauge a righteous man that you or a holy man that one should go get counsel from. You have David had mentioned how let the righteous smite me will be a kindness to me and how he would also pray for the person that they don't fall. So you can see the mutual respect and mutual support because that righteous man, he's going to smite you. He's keeping the commandments of the Lord. So his mind is as your mind. So you may get into some passion, but he's going to help you come back because we're of the same mind. We're seeking after Yache in the humility and keeping out of our feelings. And say you have made a mistake. He's not going to look down on you. He's sorry with you. Like, man, I understand. I know I can be. I've been there. Or I can feel a sentiment of what you went through. He's not going to look down upon you if you miscarry or if you slipped up. He's going to be there to support you because the scripture says, if anybody be taken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, restore them in the spirit of meekness. See somebody, the devil is trying to get them out of the game or out of the race through their feelings. We humble down to men of low estate, we lower our tone. We are there for support to help bring them up and encourage them to get back in the race. That's the man that you know that keeping a command is not going to just tell you what you want to hear, but actually is going to tell you what the commandment says. That's the person you want to go to because he's there for support and he's also there for accountability to make sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, anything else on that, Zachba? No, that's good. Okay, thanks. Praise Ahaya. Um, now, when it comes to friends, prove a friend. Don't be hasty to credit him. Yet, in building, you know when you have a friend, when you can have dialogues about when things do go wrong, when there's a fault. Sirach 19, verse 13 to 17, please. Admonish a friend. It may be he hath not done it. And if he have done it, that he do it no more. Admonish thy friend. It may be he hath not said it, and if he hath, that he speak it not again. Admonish a friend, for many times it is a slander, and believe not every tale. There is one that slippeth in his speech, but not from his heart. And who is he that hath not offended with his tongue? Admonish thy friend before thou threaten him, and not being angry, give place to the law of the Most High. We have to keep that in mind as we're building a relationship. Things happen. We're all growing, but we got to be able to talk with each other instead of taking things personal or getting in our feelings. Because remember, we have to stay out of that poison of passion, but talk with each other to help each other build because we're coming out of the world. The world's concept of friendship is not the scriptural concept of friendship. Okay. <laughs> so we got to be patient with each other and build. Okay. And of course, if you find when you go try to talk with your friend in faith and you can't come to peace where they're denying it or they continue doing what they're doing, those are signs to let you know that's not really a friend. And you have to find that boundary where you can have peace. Okay. Also, when it comes to finding friends in the faith, 
You have to be mindful of those who are struggling with spirits that are detrimental, like anger. Can you read Proverbs 22 and 24, please? Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man, thou shalt not go. That person's actions can affect you, and if you go and endeavors with him, it can affect you negatively. Uh, verse Next verse, please. At least thou learn his ways and get the snare to thy soul. Okay, that's straightforward. You don't want to pick up that emotion, his ways of being emotional, getting in his feelings about things is going to snare you because you're seeking after the faith of Yache. Well, we have to stay out of our feelings. Um, Sirach 7, verse 12 to 13, please. Devise not a lie against thy brother. Neither do the light to thy friend. Use not to make any manner a lie, for the custom thereof is not good. You have to be aware of lying and those who are liars, okay? Sirach 22, verse 20 to 22, please. Sirach chapter 22, verse 20. Whoso casteth a stone at the birds, frayeth them away. And he that upbraideth his friend breaketh friendship. Though thou drawest a sword to thy friend, yet despair not, for there may be a returning to favor. If thou hast opened thy mouth against thy friend, fear not, for there may be a reconciliation, except for upbraiding or pride or disclosing of secrets or of traitorous wounds. For for these things, every friend would depart. Pride makes it hard to maintain any relationship because contention comes with it. As you know, only by pride come contention. But with the well advises wisdom, according to Proverbs 13 and 10. So a prideful person won't listen when trying to work with them to help them or communicate with them so they'll always be contentious unless you just do what they want you to do or you're letting them do what they want to do but the scripture said with the well advised is wisdom because a humble person like that listens to you and you can have a conversation and you can communicate and come up with solutions and you can get what's best for everybody not just that one person and what they want or what pleases them as that person would be willing to come together, find what's the best solution. And they would be willing to actually be advised about something and get wisdom from somebody else. And the Holy spirit dwells in unity. So she'll be in the midst of that dialogue to bring people together so when in pride, it just makes it tough because the Holy Spirit is far from pride. It's hard to have peace. Nonetheless, if you're having to interact with a prideful person, you got to be mindful yourself to avoid the lust of pride, like growing hatred for the person and how they're treating you or what they're doing. Can you read Leviticus 19, verse 17 and 18, please? Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt you... not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Ahia. So when interacting, you got to actually hold people accountable. You got to hold your neighbor accountable by speaking about what's going on and not suffer sin upon him. Now, Zach, will I help me with this if I'm saying this wrong? If you've spoken about it and he won't repent and he's continuing in it, he's instructed, leave off from reproving him and leave to Allah him to avenge him. Right. Yet, you have to right. create boundaries for yourself. Thank you. Right. You have to make boundaries where you got to protect yourself still. Like you can't just let the person just do you wrong and it's okay. Or treat you however they want to. Right.
but you can't do it out of taking vengeance for yourself. Like I'm going to do this since you're doing that. It's not a spite thing. It's not a, it's not a bitterness thing. It's, Hey, this is what's necessary for peace. Okay. And this, this is, is what's right. necessary for my mental health and my soul. Right. Cause if it's causing you to go off into a, a spirit that is going to stop you from getting salvation then you need to separate yourself so that you don't go off into that spirit right you just have to be mindful to do it peacefully okay. definitely it's simple words do well and communicate hey this relationship isn't a good environment for me so i'm going to separate for the sake of my salvation and for the sake of my own mental health or whatever the case is. And, you know, if our higher brains are back together or whatever the case is, if we are able to see eye to eye later on down the road, praise the higher for it, you know, but you can't just sit there and stay in it and then find yourself where you're away from Elohim because that's what pride wants. That's what the devil wanted from the beginning was to get you away from Elohim. So that's what that spirit of pride actually operates to do. It's like, come be lawless with me. I'm going to tear you down so that you can be lawless with me. Right. And lose faith and lose hope. Thank you. Are you finished? Mm -hmm. Now, this is for in the church environment and also, well, he was speaking of the church environment. Titus 3, verse 10 and 11, please. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So this is confirmation that we're not supposed to just keep saying the same things over and over. You see, after the second time, they're unwilling to listen. You reject and let them be. If it's in a church setting, they have to come out of the church. In a regular life setting, you just have to know that person is not your friend. And you create that space, have that necessary conversation and create that boundary for peace sake. And it's for peace sake. So, you know, and they're doing it to themselves. You understand how pride works. And that person has to get to the place where they want to see what's going on for themselves. You pray for them and hope they be brought out of it. But got to be mindful. Do not strive because the heart of the proud bringeth forth strife. So they're going to probably like to get into arguments. Or some kind of heated discussion. Definitely. Okay. Heated or emotional discussion. You got to watch it. Okay. And they may not respect your separation. Like if you say, hey, you know, I'm doing this for peace. They may not respect that. So you still, you have to actually find more boundaries. Like, okay. Like at certain points, you may have to block them or whatever the case is because it's for the sake of peace and you've already spoken to them and they're not accepting your boundary. Right. The pride is overbearing. It's going right. to try to domineer. Right. Even when you're trying to, you're trying to get peace for yourself. Pride is, is self, is self-centered. So. Right. Self-pleasing. So. Yeah. Being in an environment with a prideful person, what should we do to actually help that person? Even though we may have to separate, even though we may have to hold our peace or humble ourselves in the midst of it, in the midst of a discussion to be helpful to the person, what should we do? Second Timothy 2, verse 24 to 26, please. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, at the teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If Allah I am pure eventual, would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 
and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. We know the devil works in emotions. You know, we have to be long suffering and understanding. We don't know what experiences a person has had, why they may be so emotionally attached to a certain perspective or a certain mindset or a certain belief. So understanding that, like, take the time to understand the person, but also protect yourself. Like if you see after you talk with him, the second admonition, he said, um, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves and being gentle and patient. So even though you have to have that conversation about separation, Zach, well, as you were saying, it has to be in the right spirit. Right. It's not out of anger and frustration. It's, You've taken the time to gather yourself. You've gone and prayed about it to know what you're supposed to do. And you go have that conversation meekly and stay in the meekness in hopes that they recover themselves from the snare of the devil. And they may not recover themselves right then and there, but maybe later it comes to mind and they reconsider and come back around and want to respect you and treat you the right way. Especially in this day and age that we're in, you know, you have to understand that a lot of people have mental health issues. So it may be, of course, these are all spirits that we're dealing with, but you have to understand that some people may not be in their right state of mind. And you have to go into prayer or you have to go into um, getting an understanding of what you're actually dealing with, praying unto Allah for him to show you, for you to understand, to be able to help them. So it just depends on the scenario. Amen. Thank you. Can you read Proverbs 22 and 10, please? Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. So when you find you're in a contention a lot, you should examine yourself to see whether pride is getting you. Or where is getting you if you're the one getting into contention a lot? <laughs> if you find it's not in you and it's someone contending with you to provoke you, then you have to separate from that person so that you can have peace, whether it be a friend or a spouse or even in the church as a brother or sister. As we saw, Paul had to put out that fornicator for his own repentance lest the person get lifted up to stay where they are, like it's okay to do what they're doing. You got to know when, out of love, it's better to depart for peace's sake. Can you read Proverbs 16, verse 19 to 20, please? Better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. Or whoso trusteth in a higher, happy is he. So you got to know, it's better to be with the right people in a humble spirit with less than to be where the proud is and partaking in what the world has to offer. Okay? Consider your spiritual health, as it would be saying today. <laughs> Consider your mental health over the carnal things the affairs of the world and if you have to separate from somebody handle the matter wisely in the fruits of the spirit trusting in Allah you're going to find good even though the person may not agree with it they may be upset at the moment it might be a lot of emotions that's involved because there was somebody you was involved with a friend for a long time or something of that nature it may be a rough breakup trying to complete the work with that person but you know you're doing the right thing according to the scriptures you're going to find good as the scriptures say things are going to work out for the best whether it be that person comes back around or it was best that you all be separate for everybody's opportunity to grow and for some opportunity of repentance okay we have even Abraham. We're going to touch on that, how Abraham had his opportunity to trust in Allah Hayyam and put his family in the best position for everybody to grow by having to separate. 
Anything else, Zach Wall, for the moment? No, go ahead, Cuss. All right. Now let's transition to pride in the household and the effects thereof. Sirach 27 and 3, please. Unless a man hold himself diligently in the fear of a higher, his house shall soon be overthrown. Pride in a man stops him from the fear of Allah to do right. And if he continues in it, he will lose authority in his house, or in his household will lose respect for him. Can you read Sirach 10 and 21, please? The fear of the Lord goes before the obtaining of authority, but roughness and pride is the losing thereof. Pride is hateful and wrathful in emotions, so the man will be rough instead of gentle, self-exalting, self-pleasing, and attention-seeking instead of lowly seeking out what's best for everyone and pleasing to Allah Hayyam in all things. The pride in self-pleasing and wrathful ways and emotions to be rough in speech and dealings will affect his finances too. Can you read Sirach 21 and 4, please? To terrify and to do wrong will waste riches, lest the house of proud men shall be made desolate. So we can see through scripture the effects. Ahaya will take a man's funds to help him focus on the important matters like judgment, learning the law, mercy, and how to apply it, and faith to be strong to uphold the faith by keeping the commandments. <laughs> Men have to change our minds from doing things in our own feelings to focusing on the law to do things that are good. Can you read Proverbs 14 and 22, please? Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. If we devise according to the good in the law of Ahaya, Ahaya will have mercy and guide us in truth because we are seeking after his ways. We have to beware of vexation when our household does things that are wrong. Can you read Sirach 10 and 6, please? Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong, and do nothing at all by injurious practices. If that hateful pride has place, it's shown in bitterness or frustration for the wrongs either a wife or child does, or even towards yourself for your mistakes as you're learning to do right. If we let it have place, we are going to devise evil and error. Because Allah Hayim is not in all our thoughts, and we will do something that is injurious to another by our own feelings and our own will, rather than doing good to help them. Injurious means causing or likely to cause damage or harm. This can range like yelling at the kids in our feelings, neglecting a wife emotionally because she isn't where you think she ought to be in her walk, or being negative, only seeing whatever everyone is struggling in. We have to be mindful of hurting our family by the emotional decisions and actions that we do and words that we speak. Can we read Sirach 9 and 1, please? Be not jealous over the wife of thy bosom. And what teach her not an evil lesson against thyself. So... Don't be jealous over the wife of thy bosom. She may be prospering in something that you're not. Pray for her perfect prosperity. Encourage her. Be like, hey, I see how well you're doing in that. Praise Allah. That's good. Keep building. Because jealousy dwells in fornication. And we know jealousy and envy go hand in hand. And we know the spirit of pride helps bring about envy. Just because a man is the head of the house. There are things the wife is a help me. Allah may have strengthened her something to help you. So be thankful for what Allah is doing and be humble enough to know like, hey, she's great at that. I praise Allah for that help so that she can do what's needful for us to help build this family. And teach her not an evil lesson against yourself. So then you have the dichotomy. Zach was telling me about this. Whether she's doing well, 
don't hate on her in layman's terms. Be thankful. Praise Allah and for her. But if she's struggling, don't get mad about it and try to take matters in your own hands. But be long suffering. Continue to not let her have her way by talking to her about what's right and helping her, being gentle and meek, not getting upset and angry with her, but actually doing it in the faith to help bring her out and recover herself from the snares of the devil and come out of her feelings of whatever may be going on. Don't teach an evil lesson against yourself to do what she's doing to you or to react in anger out of how you feel about what's being done to you. As the law says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Wives are the weaker vessel, being more susceptible to their feelings and desires until they are strong in faith and temperate. So they will have a journey just as a man falls and gets back up. But you have to be mindful not to let bitterness have place in you to treat her unlawfully or well, yeah, unlawfully, because even if you're not doing it in the fruits of the spirit, that's unlawful. Because you're only hurting yourself as she is your own flesh. Can you read Proverbs 11 and 29, please? He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. So... If you are teaching an evil lesson against yourself, you're troubling your own house and you're going to lose what you have just as roughness and pride is a losing of authority. If we keep that rough, prideful routine, teaching evil lessons and causing harm to our families by our practices to trouble our own home, we're going to lose them. Can you read Proverbs chapter 15 verse 25, please? A higher will destroy the house of the proud. And remember, all things come from Allah Hayyam and are counted as good. So if that befell you and you lost what you had, take it as good, knowing that it was from Allah Hayyam was for the best. Maybe he separated the family for a time to help everybody grow respectively because it was not a good environment for growth. Allah was in love. It was in peace. It was pride in the midst, these uh, lusts to people going, you know, going for their own will or somebody not submitting themselves to be patient with somebody else that was struggling. Allah Hayyam will give us needful to give each person the environment they need to. Some people need to actually be alone to grow and see who they are and learn themselves so that they can properly take care of his children that, they, that Allah Hayyam gave in their care. So whether you're married or whether you're separated or you're unmarried and alone, in all instances, take it as good and focus on growing within ourselves so we can find that kingdom within us. And men, if things have fallen apart in the household, understand and take accountability for what part we played. Can we read Proverbs 12 and 3, please? A man shall not be established by wickedness. Allah won't establish our authority in our house to be held in true honor and reverence if we are doing wickedness as we have to hold ourselves in the fear of Allah for the house not to be overthrown by pride. Some of us have to learn the hard way and persist without insight and won't listen in our pride to the admonitions given to come out of our iniquity and we lose our family. Yet, all things are for the good from Allah Hayyam, to take the family away. And this is because, let's see what ends up happening when the family is taken away. Can you read Proverbs 29 and 23, please? A man's pride shall bring him low. He humbles us from our pride and teaches us to focus on honoring him. Can you read um, the rest of that, please? But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. The humility of spirit would actually enable us to be upheld by the life in the law, by just focusing on honoring Allah in everything, rather than the pride of trying to get our own way and uphold our own selves in our own righteousness. 
when we are converted to have the root of salvation in us, what will happen to us? Can you read Proverbs 12 and 3, please? The root of the righteous shall not be moved. We'll become emotionally stable, standing on Yache, not in our emotions being vexed with desires to fulfill what pleases us in the wickedness that got us overthrown in the first place. So take it in chair to know Allah is putting us in position to actually be firm in the faith to support our families. Um, Proverbs 12 and 7, please. The wicked are overthrown and are not. Truly, a man shall not be established by wickedness. So if we're in it, we won't be able to stand in the meekness and lowliness of heart that Yache calls us unto. Continue, please. But the house of the righteous shall stand. Yet when our hearts are in the right place in humility, not only will we stand, but our family will end up standing too. As walking in that fear of Allah will reestablish a man's authority. Can you read Sirach 10 and 21, please? The fear of the Lord goes before the obtaining of authority. Proverbs 14 and 26, please. And the fear of Ahiah is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. So no, if you may have had a separation with the kids involved, your focus on doing what's right to Allah Hayyam, it's also going to affect your family, okay? Even if you're not together, it has an effect, okay? Whether you had lost your family by your own dealings, or decisions you were making were getting you on the verge of losing it by how you were dealing and you caught it in time to acknowledge your works and repent and to start plowing away at humility for Ahaya to restore the house and restore your honor in the house through your good works. That fear of Ahaya and keeping his commands will help you not be moved by any vexation. It'll help you have strong confidence that you're doing what's right so that no one can guilt trip you to go to the right hand or the left hand from what Allah am commanded to do. And in doing that, there's a reward because you're setting a standard for your children to find refuge in from the pride and the lust of the world. Understanding all that, you now know what Yache wants us to trust in. Can you read it? Sirach 33 and 3, please. A man of understanding trusteth in the law, and the law is faithful unto him as an oracle. That's our wisdom and understanding to uphold in faith. And that's what will get us back on track in our families. No matter what it looks like, remember, faith is not by sight. So uphold the law no matter what it looks like, okay? Can you read Proverbs 20 and 7, please? The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. That integrity not only will bless the kids. Can you read Psalms 128, verse 1 to 6, please? Blessed is everyone that fear for Haya, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Amen. If you focus on that, you're going to have a reward. You're helping yourself by walking in the ways of Ahaya in the fruits of the spirit and the fair to keep his law. Your mental health will be well as you'll be happy and things will be well with you. So you will be of a sound mind knowing you're trusting in Yache only, not by your own sight as you walk by faith, not by sight. Continue, please. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Your wife will bring forth fruits of repentance. If she was struggling or if she was prospering, she's going to bring forth more fruits of righteousness because y'all are going to be in agreement, building together. And if she was struggling, y'all are going to end up in agreement at some point. The fruit that you're putting in by doing what's right is going to have an effect on her. And it's going to help grow her in humility, walking in the integrity of the law as well, trusting in it faithfully just as you do. And both of y'all's children will be blessed. So your efforts are for the whole family, not just yourself, not just for the kids. It's for all parties involved. 
Continue, please. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. They will be righteous children. You can see everybody profiting from the seed that you heard and you brought forth fruit with patience. That tree that bud forth, it affects your wife to bring forth fruits and it helps your children go out as young plants and be fruitful as well. Continue, please. Behold, that that thus shall the man be blessed that fear of Ahiah. Ahiah shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. So your family will make it to the kingdom too, in this blessing of just humbling our spirit and cleaving to the fear of Ahiah to walk in his ways and keep his law. Keep these things in mind as the Holy Spirit dwells in such thoughts of understanding. Can you read Sirach 14, verse 20 to 21, please? Blessed is the man that doeth meditate good things and wisdom, and that reasoneth of holy things by his understanding. He that considereth her ways in his heart shall also have understanding in her secrets. Sirach 4 and 16, please. If a man commit himself unto her, he shall inherit her, and his generation shall hold her in possession. Right. This is going to affect your family all the way down. So let's not be selfish and focus on doing the commandments so we can benefit the whole family. Sirach 14 and 26, please. He shall set his children under her shelter and shall lodge under her branches. That's good understanding. Know if you see your children struggling, let it help you focus to know, continue building in righteousness, trusting that if you get it together, they're going to prosper as well, okay? Uh, Sirach 25 and 1, please. And three things I was beautified and stood up beautiful both before Allah and men, the unity of brethren, the love of neighbors, and a man and a wife that agree. If we turn aright, I will set the household aright. Sirach 3 and 2, please. For well, the Lord hath given the father honor over the children, and hath confirmed the authority of the mother over the sons. So, may I prosper the households out there. Prosper us all. All right. Getting into relationships in a household. And understanding how pride can have an effect. Pride can cause separation in marriages because of the contention, strife, and reproaches that it brings into a relationship. Can you read Sirach chapter 13, verse 16, please? All flesh consorteth according to kind, and a man will cleave to his like. As they say, birds of a feather flock together. Right. We meet People of like mind or like interests and come together. Things start out well. They can at least, like they did for Abraham and Hagar as they came together in like-mindedness. Can you read Joshua chapter 16, verse 24 through 26, and then verse 28, please? Oh. Joshua chapter 16, verse 24. And when he saw that she bare no children, she took her handmaid, Hagar, whom Pharaoh had given her, and she gave her to Abram, her husband, for a wife. For Hagar learned all the ways of Sarah, as Sarah taught her. She was not in any way deficient in following her good ways. Just to confirm, we see Hagar was in the same faith as Abraham. All right, continue, please. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, here is my handmaid Hagar. Go to her that she may bring forth upon my knees that I may also obtain children through her. Joshua chapter 16, verse 28. And Abram hearkened to the voice of his wife, Sarah, and she took his handmaid, Hagar, and Abram came to her and she conceived. All right. So whether both persons were believers like Hagar and Abraham or unbelievers, things may have come together well, yet these times to come, will try everyone's hearts. Can you read Luke chapter 12, verse 51, please? 
Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. And that's Yache speaking. He came to try everyone's hearts by the law and the fruits of the spirit. His gospel will divide families if families' hearts aren't after the same goal for perfection in him. Can you read Amos chapter 3, verse 3, please? And two walk together, except they be agreed. Families have to be on the same page, seeking after the same things. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10? And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. That's for all marriages between man and woman. Now, some folks came together not believing in Yache. Then maybe one spouse came into the faith. The command to stay together is still the same. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 to 14, please? But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So, even if folks aren't of the same faith, at least respecting and not interfering with the believing spouse's lifestyle, being at peace to dwell with them, sanctifies the unbeliever and your children, though one may not believe. In either case, whether it's two believers, two unbelievers, or a mixture of people pleased to dwell together, the sword of the ward that Yache is sending into the earth will try every relationship because his gospel is about our hearts, not the outward show. Can you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 36, please? Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Thank you. Oh. The division and contention in a house will arise from pride if it be found in any relationship because that spirit is against Yache and the humility and the change that comes with his light. It can be a relationship wherein both were formerly unbelievers that came into the faith together, or maybe one unbeliever converted and the other didn't, but was what pleased to dwell. Or both may have been believers, but one's heart wasn't found perfect in continuing the growing process of falling into vainglory, as we will see what happened with Abraham and Hagar. In either case, contention will come because someone converts to keeping the law and faith of Christ, or someone continues growing in keeping the law and faith in Christ, but the other is envious or resistant to the change themselves which will cause problems for the spirit of pride because with Christ comes humility and accountability. Let's understand what relationships should be and how pride is seeking to insinuate itself into it, to destroy it. So brothers and sisters, we have to actually walk in humility to keep the law and stay in peace together. Can you read Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, please. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. The lust of pride is enticing men to grow bitter with their wives' shortcomings instead of loving them in long suffering. Or it can tempt a man to be bitter in envy of his wife's prosperity and good works because he isn't doing right himself, as pride doesn't like to see another do better than itself. A man has to dwell with his wife in knowledge in either case. Can you read 1 Peter 3 and 7, please? Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, 
and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So if pride prevails to get us into bitterness, let sorrow be in greed with how a wife treats you, or her struggle with whatever it may be, or her prosperity. That's getting us out of patience and long suffering and being encouraged in hopes of seeing another prosper. And in the end, our prayers will be hindered by the sorrow. Can you read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, please? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we have to give ourselves unto the law and the fruits of the Spirit to die to the lust of our eyes and our flesh, even as Christ died for the church to prevail over the poison of pride. Now, wives, knowing the work your husband is putting in himself, or if he's struggling, the support he needs from you to be a help unto him as a helpmeet is essential. Can you read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24, please? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. So now, on the other side, pride is enticing women from the simplicity of being obedient to their own husbands and everything. Knowing you're the weaker vessel because you struggle with spiritual fornication more than men to get into emotions and hawk into the lusts of pride to be your own alahayim, knowing right from wrong for yourself or making decisions for yourself to disobey the Lord's commands for you. Pride understands that, so it goes for the women more than men, according to the scriptures in spiritual fornication. The Lord is a quickening spirit and gave the living word for you from the beginning to overcome through simplicity of just doing his will with your whole heart. Can you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, please? Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow shall thou bring forth children. Now, he gave you that so that you may be saved in it by natural birth. But pride entices you not to desire children or natural birth, and if you want children, so you can disobey your Lord Yahweh's command in humility. Continue, please. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. Now pride entices wives not to desire their own husband to be content with him. Continue, please. And he shall rule over thee. It also entices against submitting unto him, ruling over them in everything, because that's the humility women have in Christ. So there we have the simplicity for humility and relationships in Christ. Please visit the men's series and the women's series playlist for more details. Now let's jump into the what transpired in the relationship with Abraham and Hagar for understanding. Can we... Pick up at Jasher chapter 16, verse 29, please. Yes. And when Hagar saw that she had conceived, she rejoiced greatly, and her mistress was despised in her eyes. Self-conceit, glorying in herself like she's better, and hateful pride is now at work. Continue, please. And she said within herself, this can only be that I am better before Elohim than Sarai, my mistress. For all the days that my mistress has been with my Lord, she did not conceive. But me, the Lord, has caused in so short a time to conceive by him. Unfortunately, pride is self-centered. It can't be see beyond itself. She couldn't see Elohim did it for the best for everyone but rather could only see the meaning to be that she is superior in her exaggerated sense of self-importance. Elohim gave Abraham seed by request of Sarah, who wanted children, but Hagar could only see herself when it was an opportunity to be humble, glorifying Elohim for giving seed unto her husband. Sarah had grown to do too, as she wished for children for Abraham, but didn't come with her whole heart by evidence of her reaction. Let's read verse 30, please. And when Sarai saw that Hagar had conceived by Abram, 
Sarai was jealous of her handmaid, and Sarai said within herself, This is surely nothing else but that she must be better than I. That sorrowful pride got her too. To take the event personal and making it about herself, comparing herself with another, instead of glorifying Allah for hearing her request and taking courage to believe she can also pray for seed herself. Yet pride causes contention and reproaches. So Sarah got in her feelings and started contending with and reproaching her husband. Can you read verse 31, please? And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. There we see she's not taking accountability. And in catching this spot, if you notice in verse 30, she says, Surely, this is surely nothing else but that she's better than I am. For sisters, when it comes to cleaving to your husband, like this is where Sarah, she should have taken the time to not go according to her own thoughts and go talk to her husband about her feelings to ensure she's seeing things right for helping knowing how to actually cleave like no walk according to your own understanding with in this lesson we talk about being honest with ourselves if the lord says because the lord the scriptures the law and testimony is the standard it's the truth Allah Haim showed that sisters struggle with fornication more than men. Sisters are the weaker vessel. As a sister, you have to come to terms with that fact and it's not to make you weak. It actually strengthens you because now you know the truth of Allah Haim. All right, I know that I'm more susceptible. Let me cleave to my covering. Let me be sure I go to my protection because Allah Haim already told me what I'm facing. So now I know what I need to do. All right. Hopefully that helps. Now with Sarah, she didn't take accountability. As we know, pride does not take accountability when in, when in the emotions of it. Continue, please. For at the time when thou didst pray before the Lord for children, why didst thou not pray on my account that the Lord should give me seed from thee? Yeah, a better mindset would have been to come asking help on the control. Like, hey, we see Allah I am heard our discussion to give seed. Can you pray with me or for me that I be given seed from you too? Pride is at work in Sarah and Hagar. So it was a tough environment for Abraham and everyone in the house. Continue, please. And when I speak to Hagar in thy presence, she despises my words because she hath conceived. And thou wilt say nothing to her. May the Lord judge between me and thee for what thou hast done to me. Sarah was jealous. So she was at war in her mind with envy and pride and wasn't in the right spirit. And Hagar was lifted up in herself in that hateful pride. So Sarah, her mistress, could not tell her anything. As we talked about in the holier than thou mindset, like Allah is with me and with me more than you, so you can't tell me anything. And Abraham's in the middle, not being familiar with what to do. And because their art is between one another, that they ought to walk out between themselves. So, we see Sarah not in the right spirit to reproach Abraham, and not gathering herself to speak peacefully to Hagar. Continuing verse 33, please. Right. Hold on. You even see, she said, May the Lord judge between me and thee for what thou hast done to me. When Sarah is the one who actually gave Hagar to Abraham as a wife. Right. So it's, it's very interesting. You see how that pride works to, to not take that accountability and to forsake the truth of the matter. And Abram said to Sarai, Behold, thy handmaid is in thy hand. Do unto her as it may seem good in thy eyes. It would have been well for Abraham if he understood the spirits at work in Sarah and Hagar to bring peace. Let's see. So it is Sarah is her mistress. Let's see what Sarah chose to do. I remember, unfortunately, she's in pride right now. Let's see. 
and jealous. Yeah. And Sarai afflicted her. And for understanding how the pride and jealousy, jealousy dwells in all the loss of fornication and the spirit of pride. It's a spirit, so it's spiritual fornication. So you can understand these things. It's a team. They come together and work. She afflicted her. The definition of afflicted is 86031. The idea of looking down, browbeaten, to depress, literally or figuratively, abase, afflict, chasten self, deal hardly with, force. It can mean gentleness, also humble or humble self. In the other scripture, of this same story in Genesis said that she dealt hardly with her. So Sarah in her feeling goes to Hagar trying to humble her in the same hateful pride. For we know jealousy and envy work with hatred and bring forth malice. So we can see why Sarah got the results she received from Hagar, seeing they were both in pride. Let's see what resulted from the harsh dealings of pride. Continue, please. And Hagar fled from her to the wilderness. Pushes people away. Hagar didn't want to submit to Sarah in her pride to work together out of hatred for her, so she left without speaking to her husband. Pride is tough because it runs from accountability and having to submit to someone else's will. Hagar, she could have just humbled herself and listened to Sarah. Or, if it was a problem, she could have went to her husband to help bring peace between them with solutions. But she didn't because her pride was a part of the problem. And she'd rather leave than have to be accountable or at fault because she thought she was better in her heart. So she shouldn't have to submit to Sarah, who was inferior to her. It's just like the devil thought he was better than Adam. And notice, Elohim was trying everyone involved. And he came even to help where it was most needed as Hagar was struggling with pride the most. Can you read verse 34, please? And an angel of Ahiah found her in the place where she had fled by a well. And he said to her, Do not fear, for I will multiply thy seed. For thou shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael. Now then return to Sarai thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. You can see the gentleness of Allah Hayyam. He didn't come. He didn't jump down her neck. He was gentle. For us, for an example. Now, the solution for Hagar was to return home and humble herself under her mistress. Let's see what she chose. Can you read verse 36, please? And Hagar at that time returned to her master's house. Now, unfortunately, Hagar didn't leave off from her pride in herself and hatred for Sarah, though she did return unto her husband's house. We do not have any known records showing she submitted herself, though she did return home. Continue, please. And at the end of days, Hagar bare a son to Abram. And Abram called his name Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when he begat him. Okay. Now, we got Ishmael born. Let's fast forward about 19 years later, when Isaac was of five and Ishmael was about 19. Can you read Joshua chapter 21, verse 13, please? And when Isaac was five years old, he was sitting with Ishmael at the door of the tent. All right. Genesis 21, verse 8 and 9. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham mocking. Let's see how he mocked. Joshua 21 verse 14, please. And Ishmael came to Isaac and seated himself opposite to him. And he took the bow and drew it out and put the arrow in it and intended to slay Isaac. Where did Ishmael hatred for his brother come from? Pride, as he thought he was better than him, glorifying in himself. 
Can you read Jasher 22, verse 42, please? Ishmael boasted of himself to Isaac, saying, I was 13 years old when the Lord spoke to my father to circumcise us, and I did according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to my father. And I gave my soul unto the Lord, and I did not transgress his word, which he commanded my father. Thus you have two prideful people in the house, so there's not peace. You have to separate from them for contention, strife, and reproach to cease. Proverbs 22 and 10, please. Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Remember, unfortunately, the proud don't listen unless it's what they want, as lust is the root of it. So there comes a time when you have to separate for peace within yourself and your home environment, even if you have to give up some worldly things for your peace of mind when you separate. There's a verse that talks about it's better to dwell in a wilderness. Um, what is it? Sorry. It's a couple of them. Better yeah. to dwell in a, hot, hot, a roof, in the corner of a rooftop. Right. <laughs> Where's that thing? It says in Proverbs 21 and 19, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. And likewise, if it's a man as well, to right. get that freedom to separate yourself from a person that's struggling with that pride and it's affecting you, you have to be mindful of your emotional and mental health too, and physical health. So... You have to handle no, it. Why? Oh, go ahead. No, you're good. I just want to explain why. Um, the reason you have to make sure that you separate from that is because if you allow them to continue in that behavior, then you are justifying the behavior and saying that it's okay. And if if you don't separate yourself from those behaviors, then you're telling the person that, hey, I like being treated this way. Though you may express that you don't by staying or allowing them to stay, you're enabling the behavior. Right. We're going to get into that. Thank you. So in regard to the separation or when to know when it's time for separation, you have to handle it wisely. Going according to Alayim's will, though, not your own feelings. This goes for any relationship, just as Jacob did when it came to separating from his father-in-law Laban, as he waited on Allah to show him when it was time to actually go, even though Laban had been treating him, not treating him well for a long time. And we will see Abraham did it when it came to separating from his wife and son as well. Can you read Proverbs 16 and 20, please? He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. And whoso trusteth in a higher happy is he. So, if you are sure to operate according to the Lord, trusting in him and waiting on him to show you what to do, whether in his law, his testimonies, his prophets, or by dreams or visions with the interpretation from him, not your own feelings about it, you will find good in the end of whatever you're going through. And be happy going through the process because you know you did what's right unto Allah Hayyam. So we have the testimonies of what to do when in relationships or friendships with the proud. Let's see how things played out with Abraham. Can you read Joshua 21 and 15, please? And Sarah saw the act which Ishmael desired to do unto her son Isaac, and it grieved her exceedingly on the account of her son. And she sent for Abraham and said to him, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for her son shall not be heir with my son. For thus did he seek to do unto him this day. Now we see some growth for Sarah. She went unto her husband without acting on her own accord, which is good. You see, there's a lot, she's getting there. Yet she had grown to do in her manner of speech as she was in her emotions on account of Isaac being exceedingly grieved on account for him. As Jasha 21.15 had said. Now let's jump into Genesis 21.11 and 12, please. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. 
Abraham himself, Abraham himself found himself in his emotions, yet he didn't sin. He waited on Allah Hayyam. Well, it said it was grievous in his sight. It didn't say that he was grieved by it. Mm, okay. All right. So what does that mean? It means that the thing wasn't well. What he had seen happen or heard happen, it wasn't well, but he didn't get into his emotions. Oh, what to hear what his son was attempting to do to his other son? Right. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So he can kept himself in the faith, even though the scripture did say Abraham was patient and not indignant in any of his trials. So right. thank you. Let me correct myself. He was not in his emotions. He saw it and kept himself patient and not indignant. He knew it wasn't good, though. It was grievous in his sight. He said, that's not good. <laughs> that's, not, that's not going to get you there. <laughs> Let's see what Allah told him in verse 12, please. And Allah said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. As you see, he loved his wife and son, though they were struggling with pride and wasn't just going to send them away without being advised by his Lord, even Christ. He didn't know what to do himself, so he waited on Allah and Allah answered him with what would actually help all persons involved. Continue, please. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. There we see wives can make good suggestions too from Allah. A man just has to humble himself to listen to the whole matter objectively. As we see, Abraham wasn't in his feelings. And pray whether it's lawful and just to do in the fruits of the Spirit unto Allah and wait for an answer to set an example to your wife of cleaving to your covering and not send a stumbling block before you both in going according to your own understanding or feelings. Allah speaks by dreams, visions, or prophets according to 1 Samuel 28 and 6. So be sure to wait and get interpretation from Allah by your one counselor, a man whom you know keeps the law. Can you read Genesis 21 and 14, please? And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Allah ordained Abraham to separate from his wife and dwell separately. It was for the best for everyone involved because a scorner has to be cast out so contention, reproach, and strife can cease at home before some physical altercation happens like Ishmael wanting to hurt his own brother. That separation is the final step after the person won't stop what they are doing and repent. <clears throat> hey, that helps understand with domestic abuse. You shouldn't stay in those relationships. Things no, have no. already gone too far. Right. Should separate and dwell alone. So that's the first step. The the verbal abuse is first, and then the physical abuse comes because it escalates, just like what it talks about in um Surah. Hmm. If they maintain you, it's gonna get right. Right. Get into that. Let's understand by precept why things played out like this and see what you have to do before things get to that point. We read Colossians 3 and 19, husband loves your wife and be not bitter against them. As Abraham did, he didn't grow bitter, but even loved his wife by doing what was best for her, not letting her have her own way, but doing what's right in the sight of Allah. If he would have let her have her own way, it would have shown hatred for her by being bitter and leaving her to continue in her sins, just as Hermas once did when he had a grudge against his wife. Can you read Hermas vision 2, chapter 3, verse 1, please? But do thou, Hermas, no longer bear a grudge against thy children, neither suffer thy sister to have her way, so that they may be purified from their former sins. For they shall be chastised with the righteous chastisement, unless thou bear a grudge against them thyself. The bearing of a grudge worketh death. 
So you have to withstand a prideful person by not enabling them to continue doing what they want to do, which requires not letting them have their way by speaking the truth with them and standing up in humility for what's right. And if it leads to a point where they are unrepentant and persist, separating from them in some cases, like we see here with Hagar and Ishmael, so that they may come to repentance for what they are doing is necessary. Now, before and after that, though, we have to beware not to grow hatred or bitterness for the wrongs being done unto us and cast forth the poison of hatred to speak peaceably with the prideful person about what's going on. Can you read Testament of Gad, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, please? The Testament of Gad, chapter 6, verse 1. And now, my children, I exhort you, love ye each one his brother, and put away hatred from your hearts. Love one another in deed and in word and in the inclination of the soul. Our love has to be entire in word, deed, and inclination within to actually be a help to someone else. We're in spiritual warfare, as we talked about in this lesson. So like coming with the whole heart and faith and love, it, it actually matters to help someone else. Okay. This means the law and humility and love has to be the forefront of everything in us. And also what comes out of us has to be in the walk of love as a humble and just man would be, as Gad speaks of here. Uh, can I touch on inclination real quick? Yes, you may. Uh, inclination is a person's natural tendency or urge to act or feel in a particular way. So, like, it said that you were supposed to, to love ye each one his brother. And it says you're supposed to love them in the inclination of your soul. So that means like your go-to or your first thing should be love toward them. It shouldn't be hatred. Like when you think about them, it should be a feeling of love and not a feeling of hatred toward them. And that's where the inclination of the soul actually comes in. When I think of a person, what comes to me? Is it love that comes to me? Or is it some bitterness or some resentment? And that's how you actually understand, okay, my inclination toward that person is wrong. What is going on in this relationship that's making my inclination be of, of my soul, be toward my spouse or whoever, my brother or sister? Why is my inclination of hatred and bitterness toward them? If you get to that point, if that's what's happening, then you definitely need to examine what's going on and what's transpiring in the relationship to actually figure out what needs to be done according to the law. Zach was right. Thank you. That was good. Oh, great to hear. Amen. Okay. Continuing in verse three. Love ye therefore one another from the heart, and if a man sin against thee, cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to him. And in thy soul hold not guile. And if he confess and repent, forgive him. This person, that's where you can build with a spouse. Where you can have honest conversations with about faults and grow to treating each other respectfully and come to peace with one another because you both want things to work out with each other's best interests at heart. So y'all can remain together. Continue, please. But if he deny it, do not get into a passion with him. At least catching the poison from thee, he takes the swearing and thou sin doubly. You got to watch that. Can remember, what you do? pride is also wrathful. Remember, anger looks for a word for provocation. So the pride, when it comes, when pride comes in its feelings, is waiting for the person not to say what it wants to hear. And then there's the window for lust. Going to give our reins to the, to the pleasure of getting angry and getting into argument with the person. That's why, as Zach, I mentioned, we have to be mindful of our inclination beforehand 
to make sure we're actually coming for peace sake and long suffering. So if you come to talk peaceably with your spouse and they deny it, don't get into your feelings unless your initial intent for good be taken away by some evil spirit like pride arousing vexation to get us into a passion and falling into the works of the devil. If you find you get into an argument or some back and forth in your feelings where y'all are interrupting each other or talking over one another about what happened, a passion has entered in and it's a sign of a need for growth and humility and temperance not to let any spirit have place in you to get you out of the good intent for peacekeeping in the faith and agreeing together. So if you catch that back and forth happening, that's a good opportunity to say, hold on a moment. Let's do some, let's take some breathing. Let's calm down and get back to what we're here for. There may be times you just have to accept the example and humble yourself and be merciful by not answering your reviler and praying until you are at peace to speak in the right spirit. As you see by scripture, it will only make matters worse if you get into your passions too. Because the person who already denied the fault in their pride of not wanting to be wrong or look bad or being self-justified now has more of a reason to stay where they are in their feelings because you're not coming to them in the right spirit, which can possibly justify to them that you're the one with the issue. We got to remember not to strive as the servants of the Lord. Can you read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26, please? And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If Allah I am pure adventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Notice here. Some of us are taken captive by the devil at his will because we struggle with that proud wrath getting into our emotions for things. So it's easy to get vexed when we don't get what we want or hear what we want. So for the person interacting with a person struggling with their emotional health, if you stay out of the passions, it gives them a chance to come out of the snares of the devil. Even if they deny being wrong, they can reconsider their ways because you came in love and stayed in love wholeheartedly. Let's see how that plays out when you actually stay in love wholeheartedly. Can you read Gad chapter 6 verse 4 and verse 6, please? But if he deny it, do not get into a passion with him. Okay. You kept your cool. What can happen? And though he deny it and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, give over reproving him. Now, if you don't get into passions, it's a righteous discourse you're having, and it gives the person place to consider their ways by evidence of their sense of shame when they deny it. Notice, it's a sense of shame rather than getting lifted up to try to point the blame. But... Is the struggle of pride to save face, but the conscience is pressing on them, knowing they were wrong, so their countenance shows the humility at work to bring them to repentance. Verse 7, please. For he who denieth may repent, so if not again to wrong thee, yea, he may also honor thee in fear and be at peace with thee. You can see how humility will overcome the pride to bring a person to repent through their works by not doing that wrong again. And if they continue pressing forward in humility, they'll start respecting you and fear to do wrong to you because they consider that the Lord is looking at their inclination and you will eventually have peace to continue dwelling together. Now, on the other hand, you can do right, but the person just has too much pleasure in themselves not willing to be ashamed or stop what they do. Can you re continue reading, please? And if he be shameless and persist in his wrongdoing, even so forgive him from the heart and leave to Allah the avenging. So after you've come to them in love and staying out of your passions, nonetheless, they deny it and they get lifted up 
and don't feel any shame about the hurt you're expressing, forgive them anyway. And don't give in to any passions to avenge yourself or wish bad upon them, but be pitiful and compassionate in humility. Can you read Romans 12 and 19, please? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Stay out of your feelings about how you're being treated. Go ahead, please. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Remember, with a good heart, not wanting bad to return upon the person, because it's a good mind, praise for the person that did wrong. Benjamin 5 and 3 through 5, please. For where there is reverence for good works and light in the mind, even darkness fleeth away from him. For if anyone does violence to a holy man, he repenteth. For the holy man is merciful to his reviler and holdeth his peace. And if anyone betrayeth a righteous man, the righteous man prayeth. Though for a little he be humbled, yet not long after he appeareth far more glorious, as with Joseph, my brother. Mm, chapter 5, verse 1, please. If therefore ye also have a good mind, then will both wicked men be at peace with you. So by holding your peace when they revile you in mercy and praying for them when they do you wrong, this separates you from the unclean spirits. Continue verse 2, please. If you do well, even the unclean spirits will flee from you, and the beast will dread you. The evil spirits will flee and dread you because you're not given place to vexation to cause you to do any of the following out of love. Leviticus 19 and 18, please. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Staying out of feelings helps not to bear any grudge, bitterness, or resentment, nor to render evil for evil. Continue, please. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Ahia. Remember, in Yahshua is in everything. He's in all creation. If we love the creation, we love the creator. Even as people struggle, remember that's still my fellow man. So when the prideful person denies what they are doing with no sense of shame for their action to repent, even in how they treat you and persist in the wrong they are doing, you hold your peace, you pray for them, and for Allah I am to show you what you ought to do. You know your love for others is growing when you can hold your peace when being yelled at or spoken to disrespectfully and humble ourselves to pray for a person instead of rendering an evil for evil by doing what they did unto us or speaking in our feelings to or holding a grudge within ourselves or being offended within. This is to ensure that the hateful pride doesn't find place in our hearts through it all. Can you read Leviticus 19 and 17, please? Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. A lot of folks don't understand hatred. Some may say, I don't hate the person. I just, what they did just really hurt me. But that inability to actually let it go is hatred at work. Because Allah is merciful. So refer back to the anger lesson and this lesson we discussed hatred to get a good understanding by scripture of what hatred is rather than personal opinion of what it is now mind you this doesn't mean to just let someone continue to walk all over you per se you have to love thy neighbor as yourself so you have to be at peace within and speak peaceably with them when you're calm and have cast forth the spirit of hatred to do righteousness when it's a good opportunity to talk with them about how you are being treated. Can you continue, please? Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Remember, one rebuke with love is better than a thousand rebukes. So don't let bitterness or vexation creep in to become nagging or argumentative. Can you read Hermas Vision 1, chapter 3, verse 2, please? But the great mercy of the Lord had pity on thee and thy family, and was strengthened thee, 
and establish thee in his glory. Only be not thou careless. Take courage and strengthen thy family. For at the smith hammering his work conquers the task which he wills, so also do his righteous discourse repeated daily conquer all evil. When you don't let the prideful person have their own way by words of righteousness and faith and love, it helps them come to repentance. If the fault committed is between you and that person, speak between you and that person alone. Matthew 18 and 15, please. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If they won't hear you, you follow the next steps. Verse 16 and 17, please. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So after following protocol, the person refuses to see their fault and persists in their wickedness, you have to separate from that person for the sake of their repentance to make them ashamed and repent. Can you read Hermas Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, please? If therefore in such deeds as these likewise a man continue and repent not, keep away from him, and live not with him, otherwise thou also art a partaker of his sin. For this cause you were enjoined to remain single, whether husband or wife, for in such cases, repentance is possible. If that prideful person persists in their dealings, you have to separate or else you will be unable unto what they're doing. You got to come out of the emotions and stand for the truth so they can be aware that there is a better way. Like Hermas was instructed not to let his wife have her own way. Not everyone is grown emotionally or mentally. Some are still babes in certain areas of life, though they may be adults in age. And if you let a child have their way, it only hurts them and eventually you. Can you read it? Sirach chapter 30, verse 8, please. A horse not broken become of headstrong, and the child left to himself will be willful. Lots of us grew up doing what we wished. So it led to bad habits in our interactions with others as adults. Verse 9, please. Hawker thy child, and he shall make thee afraid. Play with him, and he will bring thee to heaviness. Cocker means to pamper. That pampered upbringing has helped make us prideful. And the person who did the pampering suffered from dealing with the self-pleasing works of the proud. As it said, it will bring the person to heaviness and make them afraid. The person that was pampered, they grow up and get into a relationship with someone and treats them in like manner. Hence, in a relationship with that person that does their own will, you, if you stay, you're an enabler, just as the parent who has pampered their child letting them have their own way. You're going to help them continue what they're doing and you'll suffer the emotional stress of that environment, being made afraid and or brought to heaviness. We have to grow up in the faith and overcome the passions of youthful thinking to make right decisions in temperance according to the law to help ourselves and others grow. Can you read Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 10, please? Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. This one was an interesting one. Remove sorrow from thy heart. The word sorrow is G3708. Vexation. How are we always ending up right back at vexation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anger. Angry. Starts everything. You're right. Grief. Indignation. Provocation, provoking, sorrow, spite, wrath. This is from childhood and youth. And he said, put away evil from your flesh. 
So you have to remove the emotions, the vexation, the getting into passions from your heart, get away from that sorrow, and also put away the evil from your flesh because there's the lust of the flesh as well. And evil means bad in H7451, bad as a noun, evil, naturally or morally, adversity, affliction, bad, calamity. We know the lust of the flesh caused these things from what we've been discussing in the past two lessons. It says grief, harm, hurt, mischief, misery, sad, sorrow, trouble, vex. Yet again, back to feelings, back to the passions and emotions. Solomon understood what we learned in our childhood, for childhood and youth are vanity. Those things, because if you read the Testament of Reuben, there's seven spirits of error that are with us from our youth. Pride is one of them, to be boastful and arrogant, among other things. Fornication is there as well, and we've been learning about how fornication affects us more than just literally lust for, the, for um, pleasure. These spirits have been affecting us from our youth and it's been with us and we were unaware of it or unaware of what to do to overcome it. And it's been affecting our, us, our mental health, our emotional health, and our interactions with others. So hopefully this helps understand in youth, we learn to be emotional, easily vexed in our heart and in our flesh. Lust worked in us to do evil, being led by vexation, sadness, and sorrow to be troubled within. And you can see how pride plays in because pride just wants what it wants. It's self-pleasing. So anytime we wouldn't get what we wanted or things didn't go the way we thought, bam, emotions, vexation, sorrow, indignation, and we're gone. This emotional way of operating as children and youth is actually vanity. Can you read Romans chapter 7, verse 5, please? But when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The motions of sin, which were by the law. We discuss in this lesson how sin knows the law. It knows what to play on to get us to fall. But it's by motions, sins and operating. What is motions? G3408. Something undergone, that is hardship or pain, subjectively an emotion or influence. Affection, affliction, motion, suffering. Sin itself, the spirit works in emotions and can influence our emotions to bring forth fruits unto death. I learned to be in my emotions and passions as a youth. And I had come to terms with the truth that who I learned to be was vanity. And it's kept me in the evils of the flesh through my feelings, being led by my emotions to be easily influenced to bring forth fruits of sin in my childish thinking, understanding, and my childish actions. Can you read 1 Corinthians 13 and 11, please? When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. This is true. Hopefully we can all understand now a child is emotional, led by feelings. So also is an adult who hadn't grown out of that way of thinking and understanding. Continue reading, please. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. When we can be sound-minded and temperate, being on guard against our feelings so that we can stay adherent to the law and the fruits of the spirit. We'll see growth in the faith regardless of our age. All right? And Paul himself went through this. You hear him talking of how he thought childishly, but then he grew up. And then in Romans chapter 7, you can see his process of learning to come out of the childish thinking where he's learning, like, hey, I'm doing stuff I don't want to do. Like, I need help. He's seeking it. He's striving for it to get to the place where he can actually keep the law. And he actually got there to know it's possible. 
So hopefully that helps for understanding. Now, touching back to the person who isn't emotionally balanced yet, struggling with pride and their passions. If the person continues in their faults, you just have to take a stand and separate or else if you stay there and they maintain that relationship with you, they will just get worse, becoming willful as we learned a child does because you're supporting the behavior by putting up with it. Can you read Sirach 25 and 22, please? A woman, if she maintain her husband, is full of anger, impudence, and much reproach. Notice, if she maintain, if he stays there and maintains that relationship with her, she's full of anger. Things just get worse. Impudence, by definition, is not showing due respect for another person. So you see the works of pride just come to their fullness as the disrespect will grow worse, just as a parent who left a child to themselves because the man stayed there and didn't separate out of love to see his spouse come to repentance, according to the word, but went according to his own understanding to stay with her. But her works and her pride just continue to grieve him, either to grow hatred for her or go into depression himself. Can you read Sirach 22 and 5, please? Uh, you mind if I touch on something real quick? I don't. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it says, a woman, if she maintain her husband, that's the interesting part when it says it's full of anger. Like, yeah, it, it may have been anger throughout the throughout the time, but eventually the anger is going to come to its fullness. And that's when a lot of times you end up getting into a physical abusive relationship and it's no longer verbal, right? Because it's impudence and much reproach. So you can see it's, it's, it's the, the reproach, the, the, the speaking is still there, but now it's the fullness of anger. And when anger is full, it becomes, it starts to play out in the physical. It's no longer just, a feeling or it's no longer just vocal it's it's physical because that aggression gets gets worse and 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 for this this can go for anyone this isn't only just for a husband and wife scenario this can be a friend this can be um a child with their parent um this this can go into a broad range of things because it's the same process that's happening uh, regardless of the scenario. True. True. That's yeah. why you end up having those relationships with parents where the child start start uh, uh, hitting them. Even children from a young age, they'll start hitting their parents. It's because the, ch the, the parent is maintaining the child. Yeah. They didn't withstand them to correct them. Right. And that spirit gets a grip of them early. Right. Real deal. Now we get understand of what be happening where we find out people killing their parents and vice versa. Right. Testimony showed Dan, he spake on how anger was encouraging him to slay his brother. So that thing get to his fullness and we see the results, unfortunately, okay. daily. Right. And it was a process. It didn't just happen. It was it was over time. Like and it was not it wasn't being stopped. Like you just kept on supporting it. You kept on supporting it. Yeah, you may have not liked it, but you stayed there and you enabled it. You enabled it. And by enabling it, you're saying that it's okay. You're justifying the action through through action, through your actions, you're justifying it. No matter what you're saying, your actions are what actually tells the tale. Like, we can say that we love Allah and we can say we keep his commandments, but our actions are what tell if we actually love him because our actions and our actions will actually be keeping his commandments. So it's the same way if we're enabling somebody by saying, saying, hey, I don't like what you're doing. I don't I don't appreciate it. But yet you're still staying there and allowing them to continue doing it. You're still enabling 
you're still saying it's okay. What you're doing is okay. So why do I need to stop if you're not leaving? If you're not going to hold me accountable to make me actually put forth the effort to change, why do I have to change? And that's the mindset. Yeah. There's a precept for some people there may be where you may feel there's some worldly thing, whether it be finances or something of the sort that you need to stay for. But in the precept in Proverbs 15 and 17 it says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Amen. So even if it comes to where you actually have to leave and you give up whatever it is, whatever worldly thing you have to give up. Your whatever, peace. whatever lifestyle. Yeah. Right. That peace of mind, that peace. Even if you got that little bit, it's better to have that and be at peace and be safe. Right. Where hatred is, where your life is at risk. Allahim right. gives the increase. So if you do what Allahim says and you keep his commandments, which these are the commandments of Allahim in wisdom, then Allahim is going to look after you and give you what you need. But you have to walk in faith, knowing that doing what Allah instructs us to do is actually the right thing and not going according to your own righteousness or your own mind. Amen. It all goes back to obeying his voice. Um, Sirach 22 and 5. You good, Kasa? Yes, just we going in to see how when that person stayed with the person that was abusing them, whether emotionally, mentally, and could be physically or, got, or may have gotten to the points of physical, we're going to see how that affects them, what it brings about. Continue, please. She that is bold dishonor both her father and her husband but they both shall despise her. The lack of respect and dishonor to do her own will weighs on a man to despise a woman. A person can also get into depression being mistreated by a spouse too with the emotional and verbal abuse. Right. Can you read Sirach 25 and 23, please? And that goes for men and women. Yeah, you right. it's interchangeable. <laughs> right. okay. Go ahead, please. A wicked woman abateth the courage maketh a heavy countenance and a wounded heart. All that reproaching and striving, looking for problems will weigh on you. Even the negativity of not being encouraging, you know, not helping build you up, it weighs on you. Continue, please. A woman that would not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. Any spouse, speaking, we're speaking on either side, who isn't there, with righteous discourse to help build their significant other up in faith and good works is weakening the other person with their neglect. So a person that remains with a prideful spouse ends up either catching the poison of hatred for how they're being treated or getting scarred emotionally into anxiety because of what the bold spouse is doing is bad for both of you. So in wisdom, you have to stop partaking in what that person is doing by separating yourself from them if they won't repent truly from the heart and put the work into change. Can you read Sirach 8 and 5, 15, please? Travel not by the way with a bold fellow. If you stay traveling in this journey of life in that relationship, continue, please. At least he become grievous unto thee, for he would do according to his own will and thou shalt perish with him through his folly. That bold spouse will grieve you by continuing to do their own will, and the hatred and sorrow it will cause you, you'll end up doing damage through to yourself, and they will also end up getting you jammed up in their folly through their ego. Well, it's, it's interesting because it said, for he would do according to his own will. So there's no thought of you in their decisions. They're looking out for themselves and you're just with them. So 
anything, any backlash, anything that comes from them operating according to their own will or trying to get what they want, even having to use you at times to get what they want, you're expendable. Yeah. That is true. It's good to we discuss these things and get understanding of the spirit of what's going on, what the scriptures are showing of what's going on, because people are experiencing this in real life. And that fall that'll come is pride and haughtiness that comes with it. As Proverbs 16 and 18 said, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So in their hearty spirit, a fall will come and it will affect you because you stayed there in their folly, partaking in it. Now in regards to how to deal with a prideful person who does their own will or won't leave off from their trespass against you, you got to pay attention to what's going on with them. Keep account of your conversations for your safety and ability to recollect things as lying comes with pride to distort your reality. Can you read Sirach 42 and 6, please? Sure, keeping is good when evil wife is. So, again, whether husband or wife, sure keeping is good. Speak via text, voice messages you can save, or recorded dialogues to protect yourself and hold each other accountable. All right. Sirach 26 and 11, please. Watch over an impudent eye and marvel not if she trespass against thee. And don't get offended if that spouse trespasses against you, as you know they don't respect you, and you already know. And remember, it's not lawful to bear a grudge. Sirach 10 and 6, please. Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong, and do nothing at all by injurious practices. Don't react in your feelings to do something injurious because it's pride in the hateful work which will only offend a Lahayim and man. Sirach 28 and 2. Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. So shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Right. So we talked about in one lesson about why Yache said forgive them 70 times 7. And you have to do it for you. Like, you got to make sure you protect yourself, not to let any bitterness be in you. That's why we need not to get offended when a spouse trespasses against us, but get out of vexation and remember what we have gone through for our own growth or remember where we are and the things we have to grow in to know this struggle is real. And that remember that we all die, so we are no better to be getting offended. Titus chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, please. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's something to see that you know when, Zach, when we talked about this with being in the thorns. Right. You see, it's, it's possible to not be a brawler and be gentle, showing meekness to all men, when you know for yourself that you are also sometimes foolish and disobedient and deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful and hating one another. It takes getting to a, the truth of who we are and understanding ourselves and putting the work in to see what it takes to actually come out of who we are to really have that compassion for others because you know what it really feels like like man that is not a light thing to come out of i've been there i know what it feels like i empathize with you so it's easy not to get into feelings and it's good guidance to know if you find you're getting into feelings, don't let pride push everything out on everyone else. Come back to self. Like, let me remember who I am. 
Let me remember what I've gone through, what I've been through, and what I've done, lest I get lifted up to think I'm better or I'm worthy of being offended at what this person is doing. Okay. You have anything on that? No, the end goal is just not to bear grudge. You know, though you may have to separate from that person, don't be in your feelings or bearing a grudge against them. You just have to pray and wait on Elohim. Let Elohim guide you. Elohim lead everything. And just pray for when Elohim wants you to come back together or when Elohim wants you to have the conversations. Because um, coming, coming back too soon is not profitable because if the person hasn't come to a place of repentance or um, taken accountability for their fault to be able to then put forth the effort to changing it, then there's not going to be any difference in the behavior. You're just going to be walking right back into the same environment and it's going to start all over again. It's going to be like a cycle. So you're literally just going to be going back into a cycle. So the person literally has to repent with their whole heart and actually has to turn from it and actually start putting forth, bringing forth fruit worthy of repentance and putting forth that effort for change that then you both can come back together in peace, seeing that you both are building and not just trying to get what you want or the person trying to get what they want back, you know, so that it defeats the purpose of trying to rush back into something when it hasn't fully matured based off and going back into it according to your own will. You got your precept cousin. I do. All right, go ahead, man. Along with what you're saying is you all remember pride is hateful. So it's an enemy to Allah. I am in Surat 12 and 10 through 12 says, never trust thine enemy for like as iron rusted. So is his wickedness. Though he humble himself and go crouching, Yet take good heed and beware of him, and thou shalt be unto him as if thou hast wiped a looking glass, and thou shalt know that his rust has not altogether wiped away. So they may be, they come humble, but you have to wait on Allah to show you because you don't know whether they've truly repented. All right. He they says, can come, They can come back crying. It can come back pleading. Like you just don't know. You, you don't know Allah is the one that weighs the he weighs the spirit. Right. He judges the heart, you know. So set him not by thee. So you already separated. Don't let him come back by you. <laughs> right. Lest when he hath overthrown thee, he got an advantage over you. He played the game came crying, weeping to get you back in. He set you up. He stand up in thy place. His goal is to get back the superiority, to get back on top, get back that control. Neither let him sit at thy right hand, lest he seek to take thy seat. And thou at the last remember my words and be pricked therewith. That's where you know you shouldn't have did it. In the end, like, geez, I should have waited. I should have waited on Allah and back in the jam. So that patience waiting on Allah is essential. And also keeping out of feelings about it, not getting, not growing bitter with the person. If we pick up in Sirach 28, 6 through 8, please. Remember thy end and let enmity cease. Remember corruption and death and abide in the commandments. Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Remember the covenant of the highest and wink at ignorance. So don't take the offense personal and wink at it, remembering it's against Christ, not you. Because we war not against flesh and blood. Verse 8, please. Abstain from strife, and thou shalt diminish thy sins. If you stay out of your feelings not to get into strife, it will cut back your own sins. So that's good for remembrance. Like, hey, this is for me. 
too. Like it's not just for the person. But if you get into your feelings, pride will get you into strife and add to your sins. Continue, please. For a furious man will kindle strife. You see the arguing, contention, strife, and reproaching that comes into play when maintaining a relationship with a prideful person? You're hurting them and yourself, so you have to separate and remain alone so you can have peace and not sin, and they can have an opportunity to think upon their own actions and repent. Uh, Sirach 25 and 26, please. Right. That's the whole purpose of a furious man is to kindle the strife. They'll say and do things to get a reaction out of you. And that's the purpose, to kindle the strife, to kindle the 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 um drama. I was about to say the the, the word to start with is the contention. Uh, <laughs> but, right. Name is turn, man, just like drama. Right. Uh so rock twenty five and twenty six. If she go not as thou wouldest have her. Cut her off from thy flesh and give her a bill of divorce and let her go. You all are not on the same page. You're not walking in the same spirit by evidence of the spirits at work. So you have to separate as Christ's light in his law and fruits is going to bring division. Can you read 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 and 15, please? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? But And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Continue read Sirach 7 and 2, please. Depart from the unjust, and iniquity shall turn away from thee. You have to remain alone for the sake of the spouse's repentance. And to help yourself come out of it. Because like we talked about, it can get to you. It's going to weigh on you. And if you're in your feelings, it's going to cause you to fall too. Okay. So in that separation, let's see what we're admonished to do. First Corinthians 7 verse 15 and 16, please. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but Allah have called us to peace. So you have to be at peace with the separation, having faith in Allah that it is for the best as Abraham did. Verse 16, please. But what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Look at that. You're trying to save the person, even in that instance. Separating after doing the proper steps and seeking peace is what you have to do for peace sake. And you have to keep that in mind, that what you're doing may save your spouse from the work of pride or fornication onto repentance. All right. Cause I'm going to jump in because many a times you are going to get pushed back. People may come to you and say, you don't love me or you don't care about me or whatever the case is because it's not the love of the world. The love of the world teaches us that we're supposed to stay with that person and be with them through the thick and thin, no matter the effects that it may have upon us as an individual or our own mental health. But Allah loveth us too much and he doesn't allow. That's not the same love that Allah has. If a person is doing something wrong, even in the church, you cast that person out of the church and hope that they will repent and come back and be accepted in the church. And it's the same for our relationships. We have to separate for the sake of their repentance, for them to see that we're not enabling bad behavior, but we're actually standing against it so that they will actually turn from it and repent and come to the love of Allah in truth. So that's exactly what Paul did to help a person. Can you read 1 Corinthians 5, verse 3 to 5, please? For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Adonai, Yahweh Christ, when ye have gathered together, and my spirit and the power of our Lord Yahweh Christ 
to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Yahweh. So by the testimonies, we can understand that the separation is for the saving of the soul by delivering that person unto Satan to be afflicted in the world by him and his spirits without you, so that they can come to repentance unto the Lord to submit themselves unto him and to seek to be at peace with you, if the Lord wills. Now, when they come to the repentance, they must be received. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 8 and 11, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should have swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. So you've seen where the enemy is going to humble and crouch himself too. So there's a difference. This is where you got to pray to Allah Hayim about whether this person is genuine or not. And when Allah Hayim shows it to you, receive the person, comfort them, forgive them for, so that they don't be swallowed up in over much sorrow. Because now Allah Hayim brought them to the place where they're actually, they're ready, their heart, you know, he talks about breaking up the fallow ground. He's he's broken up their heart and heart to help them get softened to where they're willing to see their faults, willing to make changes, willing to understand, willing to listen. Don't let the devil get you in your feelings to lift yourself up against them, not to allow them the opportunity to come unto Christ. All right. We're not ignorant of the devil's devices. All right. We know he plays in feelings, okay? <laughs> At this point. <laughs> and not forgiven. If we don't forgive the person who was doing the wrong when they repent and truly want to do right, the devil is getting an advantage in bitterness that we are harboring. All right. Now, we talked about all the, not all, but generally talked about the emotional abuse, the mental abuse, the verbal abuse. If a spouse struggles with the spirit of fornication or actually is committing fornication and you remain with them, you're partaking in their sins too. Can you read Hermas Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 4 through 10, please? I say to him, sir, permit me to ask thee a few more questions. Say on, saith he. Sir, say I, if a man who has a wife that is faithful in the Lord detect her in adultery, doeth the husband sin in living with her? So long as he is ignorant, saith he, he sinneth not. But if the husband know of her sin, and the wife repent not, but continue in her fornication, and her husband live with her, he makes himself responsible for her sin, and is a and an accomplice in her adultery. What then, sir, say I, shall the husband do if the wife continue in this case? Let him divorce her, saith he, and let the husband abide alone. But if after divorcing his wife, he shall marry another, he likewise committeth adultery. There we see. Yes, you have to separate whether they're not treating you right or they commit fornication. But you actually have to wait. Give them opportunity to repent. Okay. Continue, please. If then, sir, say I, after the wife is divorced, she repent and desire to return to her own husband, shall, shall she not be received? Certainly, saith he, if the husband receive her not, he sinneth and bringeth great sin upon himself. Nay, one who hath sinned and repented must be received. Yet not often, for there is but one repentance for the servants of Elohim. For the sake of her repentance, therefore, the husband ought not to marry. This is the manner of acting enjoined on husband and wife. Not only, saith he, is it adultery if a man pollutes his flesh, but whosoever doeth things like unto the heathen committeth adultery. If therefore in such deeds as these likewise a man continue and repent not, keep away from him 
and live not with him. Otherwise, thou also art a part of his sin. For this cause you were enjoined to remain single with a husband or wife, for in such cases repentance is possible. Well, there are some things in here. The adultery and the fornication. There's the literal act where a person pollutes their flesh. And then there's the pollution of the soul with the lust of the eyes, where they have a problem looking at others to lust after them. Or the spirit of fornication is at work wherein they carry themselves in a promiscuous manner or they dress in a promiscuous manner or adorn themselves in a promiscuous manner in order to entice others to lust after them. These are the spirits of fornication at work. And we also got confirmation of the humility it takes because if we don't receive them after they've actually come to repentance, it's showing the bitterness in us. But notice he also said, yet not often. It's not somebody, if they continue in it, that's letting you know, let that person go. Because they're not actually repenting if they're continuing in it. Okay? So in either case, if it's the spiritual fornication not to have compassion and being arrogant in pride for a spouse not to honor or respect a person's boundaries, treating them ill by contention, strife, reproaches, and doing their own will, or a spouse in the spirit of fornication beautifying themselves to draw others into fornication to lust after them, or adorning themselves for the same purpose, or carrying themselves with the harlot's mannerisms for others to lust after them, or actually commit the act of fornication to pollute their flesh against you, by sleeping with another who they aren't married to, you have to separate if they won't repent and change or show remorse and change, but rather lift themselves up and persist in what they're doing with no shame when you talk to them about whatever the problem may be according to the law and the fruits of the Spirit. If you don't, it will only get worse and you'll be accountable for partaking in the sin because you're being an enabler by notwithstanding what they're doing by remaining with them because if the person maintains their relationship with you with how they are acting, they are going to think it's okay to continue in it because you're letting them have their way. Understanding all this explains how after both Abraham's son and wife were operating in pride, it was necessary to put them out lest things would have escalated to someone's hurt. And it was for the best for all persons involved to give Hagar and Ishmael opportunities to repent of their pride, also Abraham an opportunity to grow in faith, to trust Allah Hayim, that he was doing what was best, and Sarah learned how to hold someone accountable unto Allah Hayim, instead of letting them run over you, because a prideful person is overbearing, and their deeds and how they speak to you will wear on you, and you end up bitter against them. But you actually have to cast forth the hatred and speak truth to them and hold them accountable for what they're doing to you and express that what they're doing isn't right. And if they won't repent, eventually they will leave you because they can't do what they want and get what they want with you since their desires aren't Allahim's desires as Hagar left. Or Allahim will show you when it's time to separate from them because the person isn't going to change if you stay there and be an enabler to what they're doing. These situations can be tough, okay? Even as Abraham seemed unsure of what to do with all the tension in his house, from one wife lifted up to hate another, and one being jealous, feeling like she's lesser than the other. Okay? So then we touched on those relationships. Now, parents... Relationships with parents. Can you read Ephesians 6, verse 1 and 2? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. The word honor means, G5091, to prize, that is, fix a valuation upon. By implication, revere, honor, value. 
So we have to value our parents, hold them in high regard. Yet that does not mean hold them above Allah Hayyam and what he commands to be done. Can you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, please? He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So, in regards to parents, we have to honor them. Yet, we cannot put them above Allah Hayyam and his law to do us right in his sight. It's interesting. Just came to mind. <laughs> Levi, he got the covenant of the priesthood because he honored Allah Hayyam over his father. With the Canaanites, Allah Hayyam won the Canaanites destroyed, but Jacob wanted to make peace with them. And Jacob was upset with him about it. But... Mm -hmm. He did what was right inside Allah Hayyam. And Levi didn't lift himself up against his father because he revered his father. Like he was like, Yeah, we, my father, he was upset. He didn't bless us in that thing because we did this. We sinned to him. But I saw the judgment of Allah Hayyam was for this. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, man, whatever my father's saying, da 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 da. It was still reverence, but also respect unto Allah Hayyam. You have Yache. Yes, sir. You have Yache. He obeyed Allah Hayyam first. In the, you had mentioned how um, for the feast of um, Passover, he stayed there doing his father's business when his parents had left. And they came on and like, where were you? We're looking for you. He was like, I'm about my father's business. And then he was subject to them. So he didn't dishonor them. Likewise, Jacob honored his parents like Rebecca when he was in Padana Ram Rebecca sent for him to come back home it wasn't a dishonor for her that he didn't leave at that moment he had to take care of his business first and he waited on Allah Hayyam to show him when it was time to leave and he also honored Laban his father-in-law enduring being oppressed until Allah Hayyam told him to leave and Abraham, likewise, he honored his father, Terah, but he would not partake in the sins of his father to worship the idols. And in his righteousness, he eventually converted his father, entreating him to leave that country they were in and from his idolatry. So even if a parent is struggling with pride and oppressing you, you have to entreat them as your parents to treat you better. Can you read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, please? Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, and younger as sisters with all purity. So we, even when we're being treated bad, we still have to do it in the right spirit in talking to them. And if they are shameless and deny it and persist in their ill dealings, then pray to Allah Hayyam to give guidance in what you ought to do, cast in your care upon him and wait for an answer from him. In the meantime, don't give place to the devil to grow bitter, remembering to reverence your parents, even as Jacob did. With Laban, specifically. Also, you have to be honest with yourself and who your parents are in their struggles with Allah Hayyam. Even as Abraham was honest with himself about his father being an idolater at that time and would not go in the ways of his father just because it was his father, we actually have to confess our faults, understanding ourselves, and we have to confess the sins of our parents to Allah Hayyam for Allah Hayyam to remember us. Can you read Leviticus chapter 26, verse 39 to 42, please? Mm -hmm. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespasses which they, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, 
if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. Well, notice this conversion in the world where some people have the concept that their parents can do no wrong or they don't want it to be that their parents weren't who they thought they were. But with Allah Hayyam, we have to be honest with him about everything. Our salvation isn't just coming by confessing our own sins. He said, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, we also have to acknowledge with Allah I'm not saying you go tell everybody your parents' business. We're going to get into that. He says, we're confessing to Allah I'm. We have to see what it is that we came up in. We have to see how that environment wasn't actually good for us. We have to see what our parents were doing what wasn't right and also see the good to be thankful for and be thankful for it all to understand it and know their struggles to have compassion on them because it helps to be long suffering when you actually understand like hey this is what my parents struggling with now i understand how that spirit works so i can have a better relationship with them because i know where they're at i know what's going on i'm not confused about it but you have to actually get to that place because we have to acknowledge our, their trespass, which they trespass against Allah Hayyam, and that we have also walked contrary to Allah Hayyam. That's showing our hearts actually being humbled because pride is at work in that too. Because pride also works in the glory in, in others. Like my parents are great or my parents were this and that. I'm just speaking generally. I don't know everybody's thing. We have to see what it really is. Everything has to be in truth. We cannot have any misconception or lie abiding in us. Okay. Is that good? It has to, one, the upbringing or whatever it is that your parent has taught you has to correspond with the law. It has to correspond with the fruits of the spirit and it also has to correspond with the wisdom of Allah I am. If it doesn't correlate, if it falls short in either of those areas, then you know that, hey, what I learned wasn't right. Like, for example, the scripture in Sirach, which is wisdom, when it says, not the cock of thy child. If that what was happening in your parents' household, with your father and your mother, then you have to come to terms that, that wasn't right according to scripture. That wasn't right according to the wisdom of Allah. And then you have to repent for that. Not hold fast unto it, hold fast unto their ways and say, hey, this is what my fathers were doing. This is this and being prideful and holding on to that as being right, though it goes against the word of Allah. That's where you have to actually repent for the sins of your fathers, confess their iniquity, or else it ends up becoming your iniquity. Right. He's righteous in his law because he says he, he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. So he's given us by this, he's helping us be able to, hey, get that iniquity off of you. Confess it, get it off of you so that you can move forward. It's gracious. Amen. And remember, this doesn't mean to tell the world your parents' faults for your own glory because it was commanded to confess to Allah. Hayyam. It's also not saying to go tell your parents all the things they did wrong. Right. Okay. This is to Allah. Hayyam. All right. Don't you go out trying to make your parents look bad, okay? Sirach chapter three, verse ten and eleven, please. If you wanna, if you wanna speak truth, do it according to scripture. 
It said, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and speak the fault unto them. You go and you have a conversation with your father or your mother and talk about it. Thank you. The law. Right. And you pay attention to where the conversation is going. If you see they're denying it, leave off from leave it. Leave off. There you go. <laughs> leave off from That's it. Right. Don't get into a passion. That's Just right. Understand what it is and be at peace. Okay. When you're ready, Sirach 3, verse 10 and 11, please. Glory not in the dishonor of thy father. For thy father's dishonor is no glory unto thee. For the glory of a man is from the honor of his father, and a mother in dishonor is a reproach to the children. Amen. So as you understand your parents, there's everything they did wasn't bad. It may have been that, hey, they provided food. They provided a roof over my head. I had clothes on my back. Let that be what you talk about. Hey, my parent always provided for me. You know, keep that, keep the positive things in mind and wink at the ignorance of the things that wasn't done right and let it go. My parents are pleased to dwell with me. Yeah, they took care of me. <laughs> they were there. Yeah, you right. know. And having that honor for your parents, uh, can you jump to the benefits of honoring your parents, Zakwa, please? Sirach mm -hmm. 3, verse 3 to 6, please. Whoso honoreth his father maketh an atonement for his sins. And he that honoreth his mother is as one that layeth up treasure. Whoso honoreth his father shall have joy of his own children. And when he maketh his prayer, he shall be heard. He that honors his father shall have a long life, and he that is obedient unto the Lord shall be a comfort to his mother. Amen. And you remember that commandment to honor our father and mother was the first command we're promised. So you see how it can affect us in our life today and in the life to come. You're taken away from your own sins by not holding on to the bad and remembering the good and being content with that. Being mindful not to grieve them, honor them, having that high value for them, keeping the good in mind, and not trying to make them look bad or not accepting where they are. Like if you see they're not in the faith, you have to accept that and know it's for the best, is what Allah am willed. It's just what it is. Be at peace and enjoy them as your family. And find that healthy relationship that you can have with them. And be a peace with one another. Right. Now, how we can dishonor our parents by scripture. Can you read 1 Corinthians 11 and 4, please? Every man praying and prophesying, having his head covered, dishonor of his head. That's the way a man can dishonor his father. And also, Sirach. 22 and 3. An evil nurtured man is the dishonor of his father that begat him, and a foolish daughter is born to his loss. And what does it mean, an evil nurtured man? Do you know? Mm, I don't know. Nurtured. Hold on. Care for and encourage the growth or development of. It looks like it means like your education, your training, like you were raised the wrong way. Right. Look at that. So we talked about how our youth, we learn the wrong way to operate emotionally and such. Staying in that, the bad ways we were raised, staying in it actually dishonors our parents. Right. Even if they were the one that taught it to us, it still dishonors them by doing it in the sight of Allah. Well, it dishonors them because we end up being, a, um, or what, we end up making them afraid. Right. And bring heaviness to them because we'll be doing things that will be affecting them as well. Right. That takes us away from honoring our father. <laughs> yeah. 
And of course, for a daughter not being wise, prudent in the law and testimonies. It says, if you are lost to your father, so that's to consider. Now, for men, how else, for men and women here, how else can a person dishonor their parents? Can you read Jubilees 30 and 7, please? And if there is any man who wishes in Israel to give a daughter or a sister to any man who is of the seed of the Gentiles, he shall surely die. And they shall stone him with stones, for he hath wrought shame in Israel. And they shall burn the woman with fire, because she hath dishonored the name of the house of her father, and she shall be rooted out of Israel. So giving your daughter or sister to the seed of the Gentiles is referring to giving her to an unbelieving man in Yahweh Christ. Because the Gentiles, they are counted for the seed of Abraham through faith when they believe. For anyone who is not a believer in Yahweh Christ and keeping his commandments, they are of the seed of the Gentiles. So that's a way to dishonor our parents, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by giving our daughters and sisters unto unbelievers. Um, now for daughters, how they can dishonor a parent. Specifically, Sarat 22, verse 4 and 5, please. A wise daughter shall bring an inheritance to her husband, but she that liveth dishonestly is her father's heaviness. All right. So a daughter, what she does in her life, her dishonest dealings is a disgrace. It, it causes her father shame. Continue, please. She that is bold dishonor both her father and her husband but they both shall despise her. Also, pride. If a woman is walking in pride, it dishonors her father. All right. Continue in First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, please. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonor of her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So, a woman praying or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonors her father. And also, if she shaves her head bald, she dishonors her father. Because it's all the same. And you can check the lesson on head coverings to understand going about in the world uncovered is also a shameless act. The sisters. Now, how to honor parents. Those are examples we have in scriptures. Sirach 3, verse 7 and 8, please. He that feareth the Lord will honor his father and will do service unto his parents as to his masters. Honor thy father and mother both in word and deed that a blessing may come upon thee from them. Let's get an example. Now that's you honor your father both in word and deed by adhering to the law and the fruits of the spirit from Allah Hayim. Because by pleasing Allah Hayim, you're going to please them even when they may not understand it because you're actually just doing what's best for them in the sight of Allah Hayim. Okay. Even as Abraham did with Terah, his father. It doesn't mean do whatever they say if they're not actually in the Lord. Okay. Because they may be leading you to sin and you don't want to do that. Jubilees, let's get an example of somebody honoring their parents. Jubilees, chapter 29, verse 15, please. And he sent to his father Isaac of all his substance, clothing and food and meat and drink and milk and butter and cheese and some dates of the valley. And to his mother Rebekah also four times a year, between the times of the months, between plowing and reaping and between autumn and the rain season, and between winter and spring to the tower of Abraham. So Jacob helped his parents according to his ability after taking care of his own family and responsibilities. Sirach 29 and 20, please. Help thy neighbor according to thy power, and beware that thou thyself fall and not into the same. So you have to be mindful to take care of yourself and your household and don't go into poverty yourself, okay? Jubilees 29 and 19, please. And Isaac went up from the well of the oath and dwelt in the tower of Abraham, his father, on the mountains of Hebron. 
And thither Jacob sent all that he did send to his father and his mother from time to time, all they needed. And they blessed Jacob with all their heart and with all their soul. Right. So you see, he was helpful to his parents, yet he didn't neglect his own family to go into poverty for his parents. Because believers like Jacob take care of their family first because they come first once he's married, then he helps his parents. Can you read 1 Timothy 5 and 8, please? But if any provide not for his own, and specifically for those of his own house, he have denied the faith, and it's worse than an infidel. Right, so hopefully that's good for understanding parents. All right. Now, coming, getting to the conclusion of it all. The devil lied to us in the beginning and led to all this pride and lust and emotions and mental health struggles that we face in the world. Let's find out the truth of what Allah actually wanted for us as opposed to what the devil said. Can you read the lives of Adam and Eve chapter 18, please? Then the serpent saith to me, May Allah live, but I am grieved on your account. For I would not have you ignorant, but arise, come hither, Hearken to me and eat and mind the value of the tree. But I said to him, I fear least Elohim be wroth with me as he told us. And he saith to me, Fear not, for as soon as thou eatest of it, ye too shall be as Elohim, and that ye shall know good and evil. But Elohim perceived this, that ye would be like him. So he envied you and said, Ye shall not eat of it. Now let's see the truth. The truth is that Allah not only perceived that we would be like him, he actually created us to be like him and wanted us to keep the command because his word is the doctrine of life so that we could fulfill his purpose for our creation by giving us to eat of the tree of immortality once our obedience was fulfilled. Can you read Wisdom of Solomon chapter 2, verse 23, please? For Allah created man to be immortal, and made him to be an image of his own eternity. That was his purpose of making us. Okay. So the rock 19 and 19. The knowledge of the commandments of the Lord is the doctrine of life. And they that do things that please him shall receive the fruit of the tree of immortality. He's righteous. He wanted us to do it so we could become immortal as he intended us to be. Unfortunately, the devil envied Allah and envied us. So he taught us differently and had rulership in this world, binding the minds from seeing the power and the humility of obeying the voice of the Lord to do things that please him to get to eat from the tree of life. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, please. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the Allah of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of Allah, should shine unto them. At this point, we understand how we were blinded. Emotions, vexations, anger, the wrath, the pride, the lust, all this spiritual fornication, blinding our inclination and our ability to see and hear. So take courage if you also happen to have been blinded by the adversary, because we still have an opportunity while it is called today. Can you read Titus chapter 3, verse 3, Ephesians 2 and 2 to 3, and continue, please. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Continue. 
to Titus 3 and 4, please. But after that, the kindness and love of Elohim, our Savior, toward man appeared. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of Elohim that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying unholiness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and holy in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great Elohim and our Savior, Yahweh Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. 2 Timothy 2 and 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of Elohim standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Titus 3 and 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in Elohim might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So what we just went over, that's faithful and good and profitable to us all. If we do it, we will get to be among those who become what Elohim created us to be by eating of the tree of life. Can you read Revelations 22 and 14, please? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So let's be strong to work out our salvation and confessing our sins unto the Lord, learning his commandments in humility and staying the course in temperance, controlling our spirits to stay tranquil through it all. Let's get some exhortation on what we ought to do to attain. Acts of Thomas chapter 85, please. But ye must do good things, which are pleasing to Elohim. Do them in humbleness and peace unto Elohim, and he will spare and grant you eternal life, and will disregard death for you. For gentleness will follow you on all good things, and gentleness will overcome all your enemies and it will allow you to receive the crown, crown of victory. All right. So we got humbleness and gentleness. We need that. That's going to help us overcome. And that's going to help us know when we're in the right spirit, because it takes being in the right spirit to be gentle. Acts of Thomas 86, please. But humbleness had overcome death and brought him under authority. Humbleness had enslaved the enemy. Meekness is the good burden. Meekness doesn't fear or oppose the many. Humbleness is peace, joy, and exaltation of the rest. Stand for holiness and receive freedom from me. And be near to humbleness, for in these three Elohim is portrayed the Christ whom I proclaim to you. Gentleness, humbleness, and holiness. Christ is betrayed unto us. And that's how we can portray him unto the world. There's a thing we need. You have to find the reasoning. Some reasoning that is worth it to you to go after this with your whole heart. And you have to find out what that is and set it to your mind so that you can fulfill the purpose. Reasoning is key. Can we read 4th Maccabees chapter 2? Please, to get an understanding of how reason. We need the right reasoning because reasoning is an antagonist or is a defense against the passions, knowing that the devil dwells in the passions and the desires and the loss. When you ready, please. 4th Maccabees chapter 2, verse 5. For the law says, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Verily, when the law orders us not to covet, it should, I think, confirm strongly the argument that the reason is capable of controlling covetous desires, even as it does the passion that militate against justice. 
for the law ranks above affection for parents so that a man may not for their sake surrender his virtue and the override love for a wife so that if she transgress, a man should rebuke her and it governs love for children so that if they are naughty, a man should punish them and it controls the claims of friendship so that a man should reprove his friends if they do evil. And do not think it a paradoxical thing when reason through the law is able to overcome even hatred. We get to see, and that's essentially what all we talked about. <laughs> Our reason can overcome it to do what's right with the best interests of everyone at heart, no matter who it is. Okay. And the rule of reason is likewise proved to extend through the more aggressive passions or vices, ambition, vanity, ostentation, pride, and backbiting. For the temperate mind repels all these debased passions, even as it does anger, for it conquers even this. You said the temperate mind repels all these debased passions confirming what we've been talking about in order to overcome the pride we have to be temperate and pride is an aggressive passion so that self-control is essential continue please yea moses when he was angered against dathan and abram excuse me did not give free course to his wrath but governed his anger by his reason For the temperate mind is able, as I said, to win the victory over the passions, modifying some while crushing others absolutely. Why else did our wise father Jacob blame the houses of Simeon and Levi for the unreasoning slaughter of the tribe of the Shechemite, saying, A curse be their anger? If I had not reason possessed the power to restrain their anger, he would have not spoken this. For in the day when Elohim created man, he implanted in him his passions and inclinations, and also, at the very same time, set the mind on a throne amidst the senses to be his sacred guide in all things. That's what she talked about. It starts in the mind. Last lesson in the anger lesson. The mind the way it all starts. Continue. And, and to the mind he gave the law. By the which, if a man order himself, he shall reign over a kingdom that is temperate and just and virtuous and brave. For reason is not shown to be master over passions or defects in itself, but over those of the body. For example, none of you is able to extirpate our natural desire, but the reason can enable him to escape being made a slave by desire. Yeah, you want to explain that so they know what that meant? <laughs> um, it's saying that we're not able to um, completely cut off a natural desire. Say that you have a desire of union between a man and a woman. That's a natural desire. But the reason can enable you to escape being a slave to the desire where you go and you commit adultery or you commit fornication. Instead, the reason will allow you to put that energy towards your wife. So you can understand exactly what he's saying. Thank you. None of you is able to extirpate anger from the soul, but it is possible for the reason to come to its aid against anger. So be ye angry and sin not. Mm -hmm. right. like it's not a sin to get angry. 
because you're going to get vexed about something. It's the sin by operating in the anger. So, you know. Not taking the time to reason to get out of it. Right. So that you don't stay there. Hmm? None of you can extirpate a manipulate disposition but reason can by his powerful ally against being swayed by malevolence. Reason is not the extirpate of the passions, but their antagonist. For the temperate mind is able to conquer the dictates of the passions and to quench the fires of desire and to wrestle victoriously with the pangs of our bodies, though they be exceeding strong, and by the moral beauty and goodness of reason to defy with scorn all the domination of the passions. So, in layman's terms, the lusts of the flesh are going to be there, but with the right reasoning and purpose of mind, we can actually overcome them by not giving them place you'll find you'll grow where a thing that really bothered you, you'll see growth where it's not something you have to go through a lot anymore to eventually where it doesn't have place where when it comes, it's easy to just cast it off like that's not right and you keep moving. But to understand that the passions are there, they're in the body. It's a part of our battle throughout our life to be constant in overcoming them and subduing them. As Paul said himself, he's aware lest he preach the gospel, he also keeps his own body in subjection lest he be cast away himself. Okay? So it doesn't mean just because the passion is there, give to him because I'm a man. It's my flesh. It's with me. No, it means no is there. Find a reasoning for you that that is more important to you than fulfilling your desires and mingle that with the law in your mind and fight, withstand the devil and be temperate, stay out of the emotions. Anything else, Zachwa? Mm -mm. Okay. All right, solutions. We got a good understanding of pride, all it does, how it affects everything and how bad it is. What do we do? What do we do from here? Desire and change wholeheartedly. If you don't believe who you truly are to see it for yourself and want to change from the heart, the lust of pride will keep its hold. To change from the heart, it takes faith in Yache's name. Humility to destroy the envy of the devil in us against Allah Hayyam to be as our own Allah Hayyam. Submit to Allah Hayyam's will. Also, a sound mind to stay out of the passions of pride and the emotions of the sins operating in us. It takes focus and temperance to regain control of our emotions if and when they do come to return to a gentle and tranquil state. Guarding our hearts from being stirred up by pride to remain meek and lowly of heart and put into practice working all righteousness in the law and the fruits to overcome the hatred of pride so that it may be cast out. Now, practicality. What does that look like? First, see it. Identify when pride is at work, seeking to make you feel superior or better than others or look down on others or be inconsiderate of others, whether in thought, manner of speech or actions or even being unwilling to see our own faults or unwilling to admit we're doing something that we see we're doing. We talked about how the conscience, the spirit of truth accuses the conscience and burns up our heart. So if after you've done something, you feel your heart don't feel right, take the time to examine that. Don't look for justification, but calm down, be temperate and examine it in truth and confess what needs to be confessed if there was an error. Next, after you see it, see things for what it is, stop, calm down. Get out of the vexation of it. 
when you catch it. Slow down and don't let it pass by unchecked. Take the time. Reason it. Get to the truth of it and come out of the emotions. Yeah, this is this is for a person that's actually getting a little bit further and actually able to catch and actually identify when they are doing something wrong. Um, the other case would be somebody that is um, struggling with admitting or seeing it in the first place. That's a whole different topic that we can talk about after Casa goes through this. Um, this is a, this again, this is a person that is striving to see and they're more aware of things that they do wrong. They just have to catch it. They're trying to catch what they do wrong before they actually do it. Um, whether it be a thought, whether it be a, a feeling, whether it be an action to even catch themselves. And that's what Kyle says actually referring to. So he's giving you understanding of how that process works and what is essential for us in overcoming it in a practical sense. Kasa, if you don't mind just going back over and saying like, see it, st uh, stop and calm down and then continue explaining. Okay. So you see it, identify it for what it is and catch it. When you see it, you stop and calm down and get out of the emotions, get out of the vexation that is has you in it and also get out of the vexation that comes when you see that you're in it because you may not have wanted to be in it. Okay. Slow down. Don't let it pass by unchecked. Deal with what just transpired or what is transpiring so you can come out of it and be honest. Be honest with Allah Hayyam and be honest with yourself. This is, we mentioned how you have to be wholehearted to see yourself for who you really are. If you don't want to be who you are, as in there's a difference in I don't want to be the man that I am because it's not right, as opposed to through the pride of wishing I was somebody else. I don't want to be who I am, so I'm unable to accept when I make mistakes. I struggle with the fact that, yes, that's the real me right there. You have to be honest about that. It's going to help you be able to see the faults and confess them to be able to overcome them because you're real with Allah. I am like, that is me. I did that. I gave into that spirit right there. That's the person you showed me I am. And that's why I want to overcome. Thanks for showing me that so I can put this work in and see it for what it is. So you're honest with Allah. I am after seeing it calming down. You're telling them the truth. Now you have to confess. Confess to Allah, I am a fault. Taking accountability without downplaying it or minimizing the act or justifying your action based on the circumstances. Don't give yourself any excuse for the sin. You have to, it's like you we have to actually put ourselves in a box because remember, pride is as a partridge in a cage. That's the heart of the proud. It wants to get free. It doesn't like any restrictions. So if you're downplaying it or trying to justify it, you're helping it stay right where it is. But if confessing, you're putting... Confessing is big for a person with pride. That's a big one. Yes. But if you're confessing it and you're holding yourself accountable, because remember, Gad, he had to struggle with pride, the hatred. He got to the place where he was seeing Allah Hayyam looking at his inclination. He would not do wrong to a person in thought or action of his own feelings. It's just he wanted to do it himself. He binded the pride up. That's why righteousness casts out the hatred. You keep putting that pride in a box. Like if your heart, you're binding your heart in the box of the law. You're caging it by the law that it can't do anything besides the law. Pride hates that it's leaving. This is not a place where it wants to dwell. <laughs> Just as a bad relationship. Like, you ain't doing what I want anymore. I'm out of here. You got to actually do that to yourself. You got to keep coming to the light of the law. Keep confessing so that your deeds may be reproved. Because if you don't reprove your own deeds, 
You're just giving place to the devil to stay, to the lust to have its place, for the motions of sin to continue. So that confession is essential, shedding the light on whatever these spirits are leading to do and taking accountability that it's through my desire that these spirits are getting me to do it. Okay. Now also be enthusiastic. You see it, you stopped, you calmed down, you are honest, you confessed Allah I am. Be enthusiastic to keep working at humility and find the law against the desires and speak it during the time of the vexation and cleave to it. Don't go into sorrow because it's the daughter of the devil at work to keep you from growing out of the pride, either by the woe is me, like, man, I can't get it right, geez, I'm always messing up, or being vexed because the desire can't be fulfilled where you actually want it, but you're going through that lull where it's like, man, that ain't right, but the thought's still playing because well, that's where sorrow, it's your lust. It's a lust working against the body to bring us down so that the lust can actually be fulfilled because this Holy Spirit is cheerful, joyful, free from care, glorified. Allah, I am. It's enthusiastic, but lust needs us to be down so that it can continue. Hence, if you find you're getting in that lull where you're like, no, nah, that ain't right, man, geez. But the thought's still running, it's lust at work. You got to stay out of that vexation too. Right, that's the vexation. It's literally still working. Right. It's overwhelming. Or you have the thoughts running. You're still talking it out in your mind instead of just talking the law and standing in it. Mm -hmm. It's the vexation. Also, you can get vexed because you don't like seeing who you truly are by your faults. And it vexes you because you really didn't want it to be true. That's so why after you've confessed the fault, if you go into anxiety about it, that's the pride at work. Whereas in long suffering, pure long suffering, rejoice. Like, all right, I see it. Thank you. Thank you for strengthening me to confess that. I got an opportunity to overcome this thing. That's exactly who the man I am. That's the man I want to change from being. I got to see this man that I am in order to overcome and become a new man. All the apostles who, in the testimonies, you see their growth. You see Peter come from the emotional person he was to where he walked in faith, going to go die for Yache, like as Paul. You hear Thomas speaking about how Yache made him to know himself. We're all in this journey. The light of Yache helps us see who we actually are. And when we can actually see it, then we can work to overcome it because we know what we're fighting against. We know who our enemy is. Okay. And that leads you to. Instead, take the experiences enthusiastically as good. Like, hey, I have another opportunity to see this truly for who I am and work at overcoming since I got more insight of how this spirit works in me to avoid that tactic as well. Okay. And with all that, you've seen it. You stopped and calmed down. You are honest. You confess. You not lose your enthusiasm, but you stay cheerful for the understanding, the insight, and the opportunity to grow, focus on your self-awareness. Focus on learning yourself, learning your facial expressions, learning your energy, learning your energy in your heart, not to be sped up or boiling up or disturbed, as these are indicators to show that some spirit may be at work to catch it before it turns into an overtaking unto sin. Yeah, for the add on to what you're saying, a lot of times um, there is a, a build up. So like you'll start seeing your voice maybe escalating over a time, like you'll start off and then your voice will just build up and you'll get louder and louder and louder. That's the point we really need to work on that self-awareness to see, OK, I'm literally getting vexed. I'm in the vexation stage and I'm escalating. Like, so that you can actually catch it. Right. 
And you have, remember, anger works in vexation and delight. I myself, I have to be mindful, like the laughing and playing, it doesn't help me. I have to actually stay calm no matter what or else I'm in trouble. So everybody, you assess for yourself to see. You know, you're paying so much attention to yourself. You're eventually you'll get to where you're like, you're seeing like, ah, oh, that's how I got there. Okay. Also focus in your mind to beware of the thoughts that cause disturbance to your peace of mind, like racing thoughts, guilt tripping, any strife or contention or debate that come up, avoid doting off into thoughts. Like if you find it, you find yourself doting or like, it's kind of like you get off in a lull. Got to catch it. See where it's taking you by paying attention to everything. Because pride, as I mentioned, is as a bird trying to find its way out. And the heart of the proud seeks after strife. So pride is looking for opportunity to get us vexed when it sees us in prosperity, in peace. Okay. Also, safe spaces. Put yourself in environments that do not tempt you. It's just how we talked about putting ourselves in a box. This scripture talks about prove what's good in your life. And when you see what's evil, don't give that unto yourself. You know who you are or you're learning who you are. As you learn something that's good for you or not good for you, follow the proper suit. Like for me, getting on YouTube and watching a bunch of basketball highlights, though I played basketball, is not good for me. I've learned it. The spirit of it, the, the arrogance, the pride, the glory and the chest beating all that energy it affects me negatively. So that's out of my playbook. No more of that. And I had to be honest with myself that like, that's not something I can watch and just be fine. It affects me. You have to find what actually affects you to know it and not give it to yourself. Okay. Um. And so pay attention what is helpful and not helpful for you to be able to keep the law and don't give the bad stuff to yourself or put yourself in that environment that you know you can't handle. Don't let pride get you wanting to be able to handle something you know you can't. Like forcing yourself to be able to do it when the truth is you know you can't do it. Okay? Trust in the law. All right? Diligence. If you happen to be in a tempted environment, you have to stay focused and pray with your whole heart to be focused so as not to give yourself an out to go after a desire of your own and keep your mind tranquil and quiet so you can hear righteous thoughts and your patience and be delivered or else you will get lax and or eager feeling anxious and give in to the desire and fall. And also, be honest with yourself. If you're in an environment that you know isn't good for you, leave the environment if possible. In that focus, if you find you may start off where you're praying, you're paying attention to everything, but eventually you stop or you get lax or you get anxious and start wanting, start feeling nervous, like, oh, what am I going to do? Da, da, da. That vexation has got you. You got to come back to. Go sit down. Go ahead. Or if you start entertaining thoughts that you know that aren't right, that's the vexation. Yeah. It's playing on that desire and seeing it for what it is to know, hey, this is showing this thing still has place in me. I need to work harder in this. This isn't something light for me. Okay. Being entirely honest with ourselves. <sighs> Your experiences, you're going to have experiences. Get to know yourself by learning your energy and what energy level you can be best tranquil at. Also learn to know when you're honestly at peace and when you're disturbed in spirit, even in the slightest, 
So you can be self-aware at all times, knowing whenever something is trying to trip you up by unhealthy emotions. The evil spirits know us, but the world is so much going on that we don't know ourselves, and they play on that. But through Yache, his law, he helps us understand ourselves, and that way we can actually stand against them, okay? Lastly, but not the least, emotional stability. Keep out of emotions to be tranquil in all things and pay attention to yourself, to knowing you're not tranquil and take the time to settle back down, praying and encouraging yourself, casting off the vexation of sorrow, lest you continue giving place to the devil through being disturbed in spirit and add sin unto sin in sorrow. Zachwa like mentioned in the anger lesson is nothing more important than your soul. Take the time you need to get out of the anxiety or the disturbance of spirit. You take a moment, pause, go, read what you need to read, find the law, read it, get it into your soul until you're actually at peace. Reason with yourself like, hey, is this, this isn't actually, go ahead. That's what David said, meditate on the law. Yeah, it's my meditation all the day. And like that reasoning with yourself, like get to the truth. Like, hey, this feeling isn't right. This isn't actually true. Allah Hayyam is doing this for me. He's doing that. I have my food. I have my raiment. I have everything. Like he's with me. He's given me the opportunity to repent. He's given me the opportunity to grow. He's providing for me. He wants the best for me. He wants to see me succeed at this. You, whatever you have going on within you, you have to be honest with yourself and if you need, reach out to the counselor that keeps the law. If you don't know who that counselor is, pray to Allah Hayim to show you to reach out to that counselor and get the help you need so that you actually can get stable and stand against the devil. And Zach, while you were saying for now for someone who's maybe not at that chapter in life yet, in the journey. Right. For someone who's, this is more like a babe, um, who's not very aware of themselves, that's not not has not really seen their iniquities. Um, the the first thing, the first step for you is to actually start learning the law and start applying the law to your life, either one by one, take a piece, take a couple of laws, start applying a couple of laws and and work on building to understand and, and know the law and also um, starting to apply it. It's better to apply a little than to know a lot and not apply it. So if you learn in a little, apply the little that you know and keep building and working on that. And eventually the things that you struggle with are going to be discovered through the law. So eventually you are going to get to a place that you are going to come with something that is contradictive to your own behavior and you actually get to get to that point to actually see it and actually go ahead and take the steps that we're talking about so that you can actually work through it so it's just a little different it's a little slower a little more baby steps but all in all it, it ends up being the same thing that we're talking about here today Amen. Amen. Now we talked about what we have to do, right? Let's see what the scripture admonishes us about how to interact in the world. As we know, the pride of life is in it. Can you read Ignatius to the Ephesians chapter 10, verse 1 to 3, please? And pray ye also without ceasing for the rest of mankind. For there is in them a hope of repentance, that they may find Allah Therefore, permit them to take lessons at least from your works. Against their outbursts of wrath, be ye meek. Against their proud words, be ye humble. Against their railings, set ye your prayers. Against their errors, be ye steadfast in faith. Against their fierceness, be ye gentle. And be not zealous to imitate them by requital. 
I thought that was interesting. All of it's good. It said, against the errors, be ye steadfast in the faith. So not only do we pray for a person, we see them struggling. No, only are we meek and humble in response to what a person may say or how they may react to us. But also, it's encouragement to be steadfast. Like, I see this person struggling. Let me focus. Let me hold on to the faith so that they can get a lesson of Allah I am in what I'm doing. All right. Uh, continue and speak, if you will. Let us show ourselves the brothers by our forbearance. But let us be zealous to be imitators of the Lord, vying with each other. Who shall suffer the greater wrong? Who shall be defrauded? Who shall be set at naught? That no herb of the devil be found in you. But in all purity and temperance, abide ye in Christ Yache with your flesh and with your spirit. So all in all, be pure and temperate in flesh and spirit. Keep our bodies in subjection. Keep our spirits tranquil and gentle and meek so that we can overcome. Anything else, Zakwa? We hope everybody enjoyed the lesson. If anybody wants to join Hebrew Readers to make Hebrew Readers your church home and family, please send us an email at HebrewReaders at gmail.com. If you have any questions, please send us an email the same. We thank you. We praise the higher for you. And we really hope these lessons and everything glorifies Allah Hayam, glorifies the higher and Yache and the Holy Spirit, Ruach Kodoshi, and that you are blessed by it and that you are increased in fruit by your walk. Uh, we thank you and we praise you. Brother Kasi, you got anything? We just need to pray. All right. Would you like to pray? Sure. Okay. Hold on, let me get my window. Okay, go ahead. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Haya. Heavenly Father, Haya, Asherah, Haya, we glorify you. We give glory unto our our Lord, Yache, Yache Christ, and the Holy Spirit, Ruach Kodoshi, the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for all things, Father. We thank you, Father, for wisdom. We thank you, Father, for thy grace and thy mercies that thou hast bestowed upon us. And even sending thy love toward us to help us and to help us overcome the spirits that are against us so that we may be valiant in the spirit, that we may be strengthened to be servants of our Adonai, our Lord and our Savior, Yache, and that nothing may weigh us down nor constrain us from serving you, but that we may be true dwellers with Allah Hayyam, that we may be sons and daughters of Allah Hayyam, and that he may be pleased with us in our works. I pray, Father, that you may deliver us from all things and that thy grace and mercy may suffice us, and that we may be content in thy will, and that we may allow thy will to dwell over us, and that we may depart from our own desires and cleave unto the desires of Allah Hayyam, that we may be perfect in mind, body, and spirit, and not of a double mind, but of a single eye, only seeing one way, which is the way of Allah Hayyam, and not making our own way. Let thy face shine upon us, Allah Hayyam. Be gracious unto us and give us peace. And as we thank you for all things and we glorify you, may the holy name be exalted. And may you keep thy hand over thy people in the church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hayyam. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. All right. Shout out to Chalam, everybody. 
Hope everybody enjoyed the lesson. HRC, 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 HRC,